The Audio Boy Project. A decentralized anti-authoritarian based initiative focused on creating a library of audiobooks for truth seekers and free speech advocates. All content on this channel is free to download, share, and repost. Your support is much appreciated. Truth, audiobooks, for the people. Double Cross, the explosive inside story of the mobster who controlled America. By Sam Giancana and Chuck Giancana with Bettina Giancana. Forward by Tim Newark. Narrated by Joe Barrett. Until 1969, our family was held captive by the legacy of Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana. At that time, we mistakenly thought that by changing our last name, we could escape the very real stigma attached to being related to a notorious gangster. It was an act whose logic ultimately proved faulty, for it succeeded in stripping us of our rich Italian heritage, to say nothing of our friends and family. Hiding behind a mask, we denied our very existence, creating merely the illusion of normalcy. It was an illusion only we could dispel. This book is dedicated to the person who showed us that only by removing the mask can we ever truly hope to see ourselves. Forward When Double Cross came out in 1992, it became an instant New York Times bestseller. Published in 12 countries, it created a firestorm of controversy and an avalanche of questions. First and foremost of these questions was, can this really be true? Our answer then and now is that Double Cross presents an accurate portrait of Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana and his involvement in some of the most dramatic events of the 20th century, events that changed the course of history. Today, over 20 years later, we can unequivocally state that not only is the book accurate, but many of its shocking revelations have now been confirmed by academics, politicians, and members of investigative government agencies as well as those personally involved. Indeed, Robert Kennedy Jr. recently told interviewer Charlie Rose that he had reason to believe that his uncle, President John F. Kennedy, was the victim of a murderous conspiracy that included organized criminals. He further stated that his own father, Robert Kennedy, also believed this to be true. For those naysayers who attempt to refute Double Cross, we can only say that as of this date, no one has been able to disprove its claims. But the purpose for this new forward is not to tout the book's credibility, but rather to add to the current record. Since 1992, much has come to light regarding the life and times of Sam John Cana, in particular his mysterious absence from the Chicago scene while living in Mexico between 1966 and 1974. With the wealth of new information we have obtained, we have concluded that Giancana's murder was largely the consequence of his actions during this eight-year period in combination with his involvement with rogue elements of the CIA. To fully understand the circumstances surrounding Giancana's death, we must revisit his younger days with Chicago's notorious 42 Gang. There he rose among the ranks thanks to his sociopathic ruthlessness and amazing talent for bringing in the cash through illegal gambling operations. Throughout John Connor's criminal career, gambling continued to be his fort. Once fully ensconced in the Chicago syndicate, John Connor broadened his financial interests, growing a small empire based on policy and numbers rackets. It is at this juncture that he likely met the criminally gifted King of Slots, Eddie Dutch Vogel, who controlled illegal slot machines, pinball, and vending rackets throughout the region. It is also at this time that he crossed paths with a brilliant and highly ambitious student of Vogel's, Hyman Red Larner. Dubbed by the press the Outfit's Mystery Man and the Ivy League Mobster, Larner struck up a relationship with John Connor, a relationship that, some thirty years later, would lead directly to the mob boss's demise. Appearing publicly only once, during the McClellan Committee investigation in 1959, Larner was a low-profile mobster who counted Meyer Lansky among his close associates. Working under John Connor, Larner expanded the old Vogel rackets, which now exploded across the nation. In the 1960s, he began acting as one of John Connor's international frontmen, 
making high-level contacts that would enable John Kana to further his illegal gambling empire throughout the world. In 1966, when John Kana moved to Cuernavaca, Mexico, he was not in exile, as some have claimed. The information that we have obtained tells us that he was putting together, with Hyman Larner, what many believe would become the most lucrative gambling enterprise in history. From Mexico, this venture moved into the Caribbean and Central and South America, where the two men set up gambling on cruise ships and in ports of call. Through payoffs, they bought protection from dictators and presidents south of the border, in particular Panama's infamous Manuel Noriega. They also ingratiated themselves with what would become Colombia's Medellin cartel, engaging early members as part of their operation. It was thanks to this revenue stream that the first Colombian cartel was born. By the 1970s, John Connor's international gambling ventures were bringing in millions, with a share of its profits dutifully delivered to the Chicago outfit. When the operation began flying gambling supplies from Miami to Panama and flying back with a load of cocaine, Florida mob boss Santo Traficante also received a cut. Although cocaine trafficking was still in its infancy, the money was good. Perhaps too good. Across the border, the FBI had been taking notice of John Connett's activities. In 1974, pressure was placed on the Mexican government, and he was deported to the United States and served a subpoena to testify before a Chicago grand jury. Back in Chicago, John Connett gave up nothing to the grand jury and, with Larner at the helm south of the border, continued to oversee his empire. The enormous wealth it was now generating did not go unnoticed by his cronies Tony Accardo, Joey Ayupa, and Florida's Traficanti, who let it be known that they were not receiving a fair share of the profits. Larner was also unhappy. He'd been watching John Kana line his own pockets long enough and was pushing for a change in leadership, a change that would place him in control of the international gambling enterprises. In 1975, when Giancana was subpoenaed to testify at the House Select Committee on Assassinations, he had a number of other detractors, men within the CIA, who also wanted him out of the way. With his testimony to the committee on the horizon, all parties agreed Sam Giancana had to go. Ignoring the fact that Giancana had always been a supporter of the Fifth Amendment, these men focused instead on what would happen if he did talk, John Connor had intimate knowledge of the CIA attempted hit on Fidel Castro, as well as the assassination of a president. He also knew that ammunition and guns were slowly replacing slot machines as the cargo of choice into Panama, and that the Colombian cocaine trade was destined to boom, thanks to the cartel's covert relationship with the CIA. Given the current political climate, John Connor could also have been able to conjecture where this relationship was headed, straight to what would later be called the Iran-Contra affair. In short, Sam John Connor knew far too much. On the very evening that federal agents arrived in Chicago to escort him to Washington to testify before the committee, John Connor was murdered. Without question, a number of individuals breathed a sigh of relief and, as a side benefit, became instantly wealthier. In the aftermath of John Connor's death, what began as a gambling empire morphed into a cancerous drug and arms smuggling venture with the CIA. Larner continued to fly cocaine shipments into Miami and weapons into Panama, opening the door for more vicious criminal elements, the Colombian and Mexican cartels, and the Russian mafia. Returning to the questions asked when Double Cross was first published, another one stands out. Who actually pulled the trigger and murdered Sam Chancana? Perhaps this is irrelevant in light of the bigger picture. The truly important story, still to be fully revealed, is exactly what happened to Giancana's empire after his death. How has U.S. organized crime, along with the CIA and international criminals, shaped our world today? How many wars have been funded with illicit dollars? How many governments compromised? How many world leaders corrupted, imprisoned, or assassinated? And the biggest question of all, how many U.S. presidents have benefited from covert CIA operations, billions of dollars in illegal drugs, and the 1966 brainchild of Sam John Connor? Bettina John Connor, Sam John Connor, September 2013. Author's Note In writing Double Cross, 
we've attempted to impart the essence of an enigmatic man, as well as to portray, as accurately as possible, his involvement in national and global affairs, as he himself related it. However, what follows is not an investigative treatise on the life and times of Sam John Connor, nor do we believe should it be. Too many important political revelations have gone unnoticed by U.S. audiences due to tedious journalistic research, which results, unfortunately, in tedious listening. Instead, the subject of Sam John Connor's life has been approached with every attempt to engage the audience, to tell a good story, while maintaining historical accuracy. Most of the information contained here is the result of conversations held over five decades between Sam John Connor and his brother. The balance is the natural byproduct of being on the inside of Chicago's outfit, information gleaned from personal experience as younger brother to Chicago's most powerful mob leader, and contemporaneous conversations with various outfit members. We've made every attempt to relate these conversations and events, as unerringly as recollection will allow, over the span of more than five decades. What has emerged from this endeavor is something that is far greater than the sum of its parts. Double Cross is, in the end, more than a biography of a mobster, more than an expose of organized crime, more than a steamy report featuring all the right players, more than a true crime narrative, and certainly more than a gripping political drama filled with presidents, spies, and secret agents. But despite these acknowledged assets, Double Cross may still be criticized for its lively approach. Bringing Sam Giancana in his times to life in a fashion more common to the novel than the expose, all the while presenting the mob leader's own point of view, has made Double Cross a disturbingly entertaining story and a subject such as this should not, by most accounts, be entertaining. Because of this approach, however, far more people can be expected to pick up Double Cross, and the historical purist will be forced to concede that no amount of journalistic research could ever replace the personal perspective offered by Sam Giancana himself. Although most Americans have known little up until now about Sam Giancana's impact on the nation, it's precisely this lack of knowledge that has made writing Double Cross so necessary. Tired of the blatant misinformation and inaccuracies that have continued to be reported on topics ranging from the St. Valentine's Day massacre to the death of Marilyn Monroe and the assassination of John F. Kennedy, we decided it was time, once and for all, to tell the story of these events as Sam John Connor related it. The resulting revelations contained in Double Cross, although shocking, speak for themselves. Thus we now present what was confided to Chuck John Connor by his brother Sam John Connor as the truth of the times. It should be added that we do so with much sadness and no small measure of fear. This is a sordid and difficult legacy, and one we did not choose. It's therefore our desire that, after completing the book, the listener will not find those bearing the John Connor name guilty by association with a man who so destructively changed the course of history. We do believe there may yet be a positive outcome to the saga told here. Once armed with a truer account of our nation's past, the listener, no longer enslaved by an apathy born of falsehood, may possess a renewed ability to affect America's future. And in the final analysis, that may be what Double Cross is all about. Perhaps the listener, like these authors, will conclude that the ultimate Double Cross was not perpetrated against one individual, but was, more significantly, committed against the people of this nation and the citizens of the world. Samuel M. Giancana, Chuck Giancana, August 1991 Chapter 1 Everything was right. It was a beautiful night for a murder— Above the rustling treetops lining the quiet Oak Park, Chicago suburb, occasional streaks of heat lightning flashed in the night sky. Although it was after ten o'clock, the sweltering humidity hadn't lifted. The air was thick and hot and still. A dog barked in the distance. The sounds of crickets and humming air conditioners muffled the killer's heavy, measured footfalls as he stealthily made his way along one side of the modest bungalow and down the concrete stairs to the basement below. He felt the twenty-two target pistol against his waist, hidden beneath his belt, reminding him of the task at hand. He had nothing to fear, nothing to hide. He and his intended victim were friends. When he reached the bottom of the stairs, 
The heavy steel door swung open, as it had a thousand times before, and the familiar smell of cigar smoke, mingled with sausage and garlic, slapped him with countless memories spanning a lifetime of trust and loyalty. He looked Mooney Giancana squarely in the eye and smiled. If he knew what was coming, Mooney showed no fear, not the slightest inkling. Instead, he turned his back to continue nursing the fat sausages that sizzled in the pan. Hunched over the stove, he looked old from the back, like a graying hound past his prime. The metal of the gun had grown warmer against the killer's spine. The six-inch tube placed over the barrel's nose pressed insistently. Mooney had always told him timing was everything, and the killer knew it was time now. He stepped up behind his friend and in one swift motion pulled the gun from its hiding place. Pressing it against the base of Mooney's skull, he pulled the trigger. A sharp crack rang out and his victim lurched forward and then back again, falling face up on the floor. The killer stood over Mooney, a man he'd known for thirty years, and watched as he fought for air, gurgling in his own blood. And then he placed the gun into the gaping blue-lipped mouth and fired again. The bloody face shuddered. Its vacant eyes fluttered and rolled. He shoved the gun under Mooney's chin and lodged five more bullets in what was left of a brain. His job accomplished, the killer calmly glanced from his watch to the sausages browning nicely on the stove. Then he walked back out the door into the summer night air and vanished. Mooney's dead. The words echoed through the night, shaking Chuck Giancana into consciousness. He felt the phone go cold in his hand. He wanted to ask how and why and a million other questions, but the voice on the line continued. It sounds like a hit. He was shot in the head. There was no emotion in the telling, just a strange formality. True to form, even his brother's death was a sort of business, to be reported from a safe distance, like everything else connected to the outfit. For a while, Chuck just sat on the side of the bed, listening to the dial tone. He wanted it to sink in, to really feel it. It was June 19, 1975, and his childhood hero, Chicago's great and powerful underworld boss, Sam Mooney Giancana, was dead. It was finally over, once and for all. Two days later, Chuck attended his brother's wake. Hundreds of reporters, curious onlookers, FBI agents, and police officers crowded the chapel parking lot, lending a carnival-like atmosphere to an otherwise somber affair. "'Where's their respect?' Chuck mumbled angrily to his wife as they rushed past the photographers and through the heavy double doors. Inside, two bull-necked outfit guys were posted at the doorway. Guarding this entry was an honor, and one they weren't taking lightly. Chuck watched as the men skillfully assessed him from a distance, and then, recognition in their eyes, nodded in deference and stepped aside. Chuck Giancana had been to Chicago's Montclair Chapel countless times over the years. It was popular with the Italians. Plenty of unlucky outfit soldiers had been laid out within the grim silence of its elegantly decorated walls, but nothing prepared him for the magnitude of Mooney's wake. He suddenly felt awkward, out of place, like a whore in church, he later recall, as he moved past the men and through the arched door into the chapel. A hush enveloped the red-carpeted room, and the heavy scent of flowers took his breath away. He'd never seen so many at Montclair before. But this wasn't just any outfit wake, he reminded himself. This was Sam Giancana's. Lining the chapel walls were wreaths piled on wreaths, and buried beneath them was his brother's bronze casket. It was the most beautiful Chuck had ever seen. Torch lamps guarded each end, and cast a golden glow across red roses cascading from two stately brass urns. Confronted with such opulence, Chuck thought a person could almost forget Mooney had been murdered. No one, it seemed, wanted to dwell on the truth, the cruelty, the brutality of his brother's life, or the double dealing that had ended it. There were a lot of things about his brother's life and death that bothered Chuck, but the questions that burned within him most were who and why. Chuck knew it had to be somebody Mooney trusted, 
although in the outfit who pulled the trigger and who ordered the hit were two very different things. The press said it was just another gangland slang aimed at silencing a fellow mobster. But that didn't make sense. Mooney might have been scheduled to go up before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, but he never would have talked, nor had Mooney been moving in on anybody's territory. Mooney's territory was the world. The very idea his brother had overstepped his bounds in Chicago was the craziest thing Chuck had ever heard. It wasn't that Mooney wouldn't share the spoils of his international victories, either, as some people speculated. Mooney always took care of the guys in the outfit. He wasn't greedy, and he sure as hell wasn't stupid. No, none of those explanations made sense to Chuck, so he guessed it had to be another angle, one he and everybody else just hadn't thought of yet. Truett looked like a mob hit, and Truett had to have been carried out by a trusted lieutenant, which meant only a handful of outfit guys. But something was wrong with the story, and that something was lack of a motive. The outfit just didn't have one. Shit, things sure can change. He'd loved Mooney more than he'd ever loved anybody in the world. And he'd hated him, too. But in spite of that, he'd always thought he was untouchable. Never thought Mooney would be double-crossed like this. But who? And why? That was all he wanted to know. He also wished he knew what it was about the past that made it seem so goddamned good. How could anybody in their right mind call those days the good ones? It sounded crazy. But crazy or not, here he was a half-century later, in 1975, wishing he could have them back wishing he could see his big brother walk through the door of their crumbling little flat, cussing and raising hell as he stepped over sheets of newspaper carefully placed by their sisters on the freshly scrubbed floor. That was before Mooney really hit it. It had all seemed like a game to Chuck back then. All he'd really known was that his brother was important, a big guy in something people called the Syndicate. Chuck laughed bitterly to himself. Had he known as a punk kid what he knew now, he would have run so far, so fast, he never would have stopped. But how, as a kid, you think you're immortal? There aren't any stakes too high, because nobody ever calls their marker, and there aren't any consequences too great, because you're too smart or too tough or too good to get caught. That's the irony of living, he guessed. You never realize the truth until it's too late and a lot of good the truth does when you're an old man and the game is over. For some reason, the New Year's party Mooney threw back in 1955 came to him now. It seemed like years ago. Mooney was riding high that night, and everybody who was anybody in the outfit was there. It was a big formal blowout. Chuck grinned to himself. Damn, Mooney was an elegant bastard, and he'd gotten pretty high that night, all right. Chuck could still see him with that can of shaving cream. What the hell had possessed Mooney to start a shaving cream fight? The feds would never believe a story like that. Mooney John Connor, all-round fun guy. It was more like a fraternity party than a mob celebration. Before it was over, Mooney had shaving cream all over his face and tux. Then the other men had found more. Pretty soon everybody was throwing champagne. It was wild, really wild and it was probably the first time he'd seen Mooney laugh since his brother's wife, Ange, had died. He'd laughed until Chuck thought he'd die laughing, right there in front of God and everybody. Well, Mooney hadn't died laughing, goddammit. No, some fucking bastard had gone and killed him instead. Chuck took a deep breath, stepped up to the casket, and looked down at the waxen face. He suddenly realized he'd never seen his brother sleeping, at least... Not in a long, long time. Mooney, his childhood hero. He couldn't help staring at Mooney's body. What had been a tall, robust man now seemed shrunken and gnarled, reminding Chuck of the old tree he'd cut down in his backyard almost a decade before. That was the very day he decided to change his name. And he'd never spoken to Mooney again, never seen him again. Not until now. Chuck stood before the casket, looking down at his brother, thinking about that old tree. Had the tree felt something? Had it understood in some strange way that its days were numbered? It was a silly idea, of course. 
He'd stood by that day as the landscaper's axe tore through the rotted bark. Once down, the old tree lost its former majesty. It looked like any other broken pile of sticks. He never would have imagined it had been so big and strong and proud. It was the same with Mooney, lying in front of him now. A flash of metal caught his eye. It was the silver cross of a rosary placed across Mooney's hands. Chuck looked up from the casket, and suddenly he knew. It wasn't the outfit that had wanted Mooney dead, but he knew who had. He might not be able to prove it. That didn't even matter. All that really mattered was that he knew. The sound of the tree as it fell to the ground, the terrible cracking noise of bone when a bullet finds its mark, filled Chuck now with a pulsing fear. He felt his heart leap in his chest, could hear it pounding in his ears. It hadn't been the outfit that wanted his brother dead. Mooney had another, far more powerful ally that would have feared his testimony before the Senate committee. Over the years, its commitment to secrecy had hung over Mooney's head like the sword of Damocles, waiting, just like the woodsman's axe for the tree, waiting until it dealt its fatal blow. Chuck turned from the casket. He had his answer. Chapter Two For most children, a tree stands as a sentinel, a rite of passage, a gauge by which to judge time and the changing seasons, one's height in relation to its knotted trunk, one's strength and agility in climbing its perilous branches. Over time, it becomes a haven for games of hide-and-seek, a permanent carving board displaying life's accomplishments and passions. But for six-year-old Mo Giancana, the big oak tree behind the family's two-story flat in West Van Buren stood as a different symbol. Antonio Giancana's dark eyes focused glaringly on the small child cowering in front of him. The boy plainly required more discipline. The beatings Antonio had meted out daily had had no effect on him. He was more rebellious than ever. Like the old mare that dumbly pulled Antonio's cart, loaded down with fruits and vegetables, along the streets of Chicago's Little Italy, Little Mo could also be broken, beaten into passive submission. A man's will was stronger than a mere child's, Antonio had declared to his wife, and he was determined to teach his son this fundamental truth. Without another word, he gathered up the struggling boy, carried him into the twilight, and chained him to the towering oak that stood behind their sagging tenement. There he proceeded to beat his tethered prisoner with a razor strap until Mo turned bloody and knelt on the ground, begging him to stop. Then Antonio went inside to his dinner of pasta and vegetables, leaving the whimpering child to face his pain and the encroaching nightfall alone. The moon was up and full in the sky before Antonio unchained Mo and dragged him inside. From that night forward, the skinny little six-year-old slept on the floor in the corner of the kitchen and would come to know the oak tree well. Faced with such brutality, there are some children whose character will slip into oblivion to be lost forever. But others reach inside themselves and find an anger so deep, a rage so violent and strong, that it never subsides. And instead, with each fresh inequity, a sense of self is fanned that can't be extinguished. That fire blazed within Mojankana. Although he celebrated his birthday on June 15th, records show he was born on May 24, 1908, to Antonio and Antonia Giancana in Chicago's Little Italy, a neighborhood known as The Patch, and christened Momo Jimmy Salvatore Giancana. Antonio called the little boy Mo, and, if nothing else, was proud to have a son. The Giancana family was little different from the other Italian families who squeezed between Taylor and Mather streets. It was a neighborhood once the sole domain of the immigrant Chinese that bordered row after row of thriving, glittering brothels lining the riverfront district, known as the Levy. Those who settled there were largely from the southern provinces of Italy or the island of Sicily. Antonio and his wife were natives of the Sicilian village of Castelvetrano. Between 1890 and 1910, the Italian population in Chicago swelled to more than 40,000, 
and their numbers continued to grow until the olive-skinned strangers spilled over into streets and ghettos, once occupied mostly by Irish and Jews. Resentment and prejudice soon followed. For an Italian, a dago, a greaseball, as the Irish called the Sicilians, to cross over the imaginary line that separated the patch from the Irish neighborhood on Halsted Street meant certain retribution from the burly, ruddy-faced Mick immigrants settled there. Consequently, sidewalk brawls and bloody battles broke out in the streets bordering the patch almost daily. It was an easy transition for these frightened immigrants to view the Irish coppers, who did nothing to intervene in the ethnically inspired skirmishes and showed little, if any, sympathy for a battered dago, as the enemy. They'd brought little else with them from the old country, save their culture, a peculiar assortment of odd customs and habits, which had at its heart an enduring mistrust and fear of those in power and the laws they made. In Sicily, their ancestors had borne the hardships imposed by a system of government that hailed back to the days of feudalism, one in which roaming bands of armed men both protected and punished at will. To Italian immigrants, Chicago police hearkened back to those times, serving only to punish— and without the authorities for protection, the Italians turned to each other for support and safety in the New World, clinging to their heritage with all the tenacity of a drowning man to his ship. The hills and valleys of Sicily may have held little more than rocky, barren soil, hardly an opportunity for future agrarian wealth, but the factories of the Industrial Revolution that regurgitated soot and fumes over the patch presented even less attraction for Antonio and his friends and neighbors. Had the fat-cat Anglo-industrialists welcomed the cheap labor the Italians represented, which most did not, it was still unlikely that men like Antonio Giancana would have been drawn to heavy industry's dark and stinking confines. A people accustomed to making their living under the sun and at the mercy of the elements, they were slow to abandon their culture— Many had been peddlers in the old country, and once in the patch, they quickly purchased carts and set off into the squalid streets to hawk a variety of old country favorites, popcorn, fruits and vegetables, lemon ice, and corn on the cob. For pleasure, Antonio Giancana and his neighbors gathered in the evenings with their wives and children to play bocce and laugh and tell jokes and sip homemade wine as their ancestors had done for centuries in some distant yet still beloved village. As more immigrants came, the patch became a riot of smells and sounds and colors, a place where garbage, vegetables, and spoiled meats rotted beneath teeming flies on the wooden sidewalks, and packs of stray yellow dogs fought for a taste of the bloated horses and manure that steamed and stank for days in the mud-filled streets. Disease was quick to spread. Few children lived, and fewer thrived. The two John Connor children somehow managed to survive in the neighborhood's harsh environment, but Antonio considered his son, unlike frail, unassuming Lena, Mo's older sister, whom Antonio adored, a curious and troublesome child. Mo's stubborn independence and inquisitive nature were viewed by his father not as redeeming qualities, but rather as confirmation that Mo was rebellious and meddlesome. When Mo's mother, Antonia, died, as had so many other women in the patch, from a miscarriage on March 14, 1910, the boy was not yet two. Precocious, he seemed to understand that he'd lost his only human ally, and any childhood spark he possessed was quickly buried with her. Little Mo became sullen and quiet, Antonio, a traditional Italian male, didn't waste any time seeking out another wife, one who could bear more children and care for the two he already had. He expected no more or less than any other man in the patch, a clean house, proper meals on the table, and a child every two years. And with those expectations, he married Mary Leonardi. After Mary joined the Giancana household, Mo fell asleep to the nightly sounds of Antonio's violent outbursts, and the piteous cries of his battered stepmother. What the woman did to incur his father's wrath, he never really knew. She wasn't a beauty, but rather a solemn-faced woman, resigned to her lot in life. Mary became a stoic and dutiful wife, giving birth to her first child, Antoinette, in 1912, then to another, Mary, in 1914, 
when six-year-old Mo was just entering first grade at Reese Elementary. Antonio turned to the oak tree with regularity over the next four years, believing in his ignorance that the chain and beatings he delivered would eventually tame his unruly son. He also looked to the stern disciplinarians at Reese Elementary for added support, making sure new teachers were fully aware that Mo was a troublemaker and sadly in need of reform. The legacy his father bestowed on him became a self-fulfilling prophecy. By the time he was ten years old and in fifth grade in 1918, Mo's teachers pronounced him a hopeless delinquent. He was sent to St. Charles Reformatory for six months, where, Antonio believed, the boy would learn his lesson. If not, he warned him, he'd take care of him when he returned. In the late spring of 1918, Mo did come back, but not to his father's household, now laboring under the strain brought on by the births of two more children, Josephine and Vicky, nor to the grim halls of Reese Elementary. Instead, Mo slept mostly in abandoned cars or beneath back porches. He wandered the streets and stole food from vendors. Thus it was inevitable, as he skulked up and down the streets of Chicago throughout 1919 and 1920, that little Mo John Kana would finally find a home within a gang. They were a band of crazy dago punks from the patch, a gang called the 42s. They'd started out with Joey Calaro, a smooth-talking tough guy they nicknamed Babe Ruth, as their leader. At first, Calaro, along with Fido Pelletieri, Mibs Galicchio, Pete Nicastro, and Louis Pargoni, stole clothes from lines around the patch and made money selling them on street corners. When petty crime lost its luster, the boys turned to stealing shorts, cars left unattended, which they could either strip for parts or sell outright. But they soon graduated from stolen goods to bombings and murder, developing a reputation as the meanest, most vicious dagos anywhere around. Historians would later suggest that the gang came to the name 42 one day when one of the more literate of their group recounted the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves. And although there probably were never more than twenty members of the gang at any given time, someone was always getting killed or being sent to the reformatory in St. Charles, the name 42 stuck. The people of the patch called gang members smartheads and spoke of them in a manner that conveyed a strange mixture of awe, respect, and fear. They frankly admired the gang for its ability to outwit the Mick Coppers, who they believed interfered in the affairs of Italians. Like the 42s, the immigrants neither trusted nor revered outside authorities, but felt mostly resentment and contempt for their presence in the patch. The young gang members might break the American laws, might even settle disputes with murder and violence, but to the people in their neighborhood, they were a welcome reminder of the type of law and order they were accustomed to in the old country. Hence, the 42 gang was more often extolled by Italians than railed against. Much to their glee, the 42s were also notorious outside the neighborhood, making newspaper headlines by terrorizing the streets in souped-up cars. They became well-known for their ability to whip corners, a getaway method in which a driver took a corner as fast as possible on two wheels. Mo, a homeless and starving boy with little else to occupy his time, joined up with this unsavory cast of characters. He quickly decided to win a place of leadership and respect among his fellow gang members and practice his skill at whipping corners at every opportunity, using barrels set up in alleys as a makeshift obstacle course. It wasn't long before skinny little Mo had earned a well-deserved reputation as the 42's best wheelman. Skills like Mo's often came in handy. There could be no doubt that a hair-raising getaway was preferable to being pinched. If that happened, they had to come up with enough money to pay off, or fix, the coppers. Gang leader Joey Calaro was considered king of the fixers and took monthly collections of ten dollars from each gang member to cover such inevitabilities. It didn't take Mo long to realize that the coppers represented not the fair hand of justice, but rather a hand outstretched looking for a payoff. If there was a copper or a judge who couldn't be bought for the right amount of money, he and his friends hadn't found one. The going rate to have charges dropped by a judge or police captain was $500, more than most of them could muster. This forced the boys to turn to their parents, who barely had enough money to survive as it was. 
But no decent Italian family could completely turn its back on a son in trouble, no matter how heinous the crime, and consequently, if they were arrested, most 42s found themselves out in the streets again in no time at all, thanks to a payoff made by their debt-ridden parents. Common people might believe the police were on the side of good and right, but not Mo and his friends in the 42. They knew better. All that separated cops from robbers were a few dollar bills. It was that simple. There was no honor, no virtue. Those ideals were the stuff of fairy tales. Reality in the patch dictated a different code of survival, and Mo, already calloused by life at the tender age of twelve, embraced that code as his own. His friends were a Mad Hatter's assortment of screwed-up kids and sociopaths, whose limited choice of role models consisted of either hardened criminals, celibate priests, or poverty-stricken parents who couldn't speak English and knew little, if anything, of the new American laws and mores. It wasn't a hard choice for members of the 42, for as Mo Giancana said, we're not a bunch of fucking rum-dums. They fashioned themselves after the more visible gangsters, such as whoremaster Big Jim Colosimo, or his nephew Johnny Torrio, the young Al Capone and his cronies, or the black hand Sugar Baron, Diamond Joe Esposito. These were men who had money and power and women, men to whom even their uneducated parents bowed with respect. With that in mind, forty-two gang members became gross caricatures of their heroes, and did their best to go them one better, dreaming up outrageous schemes for burglaries, sexual assaults, and, should they deem it appropriate, murder. If parents were aware of their son's bizarre activities, they gave no indication, but went stoically about the business of survival. When bored, Mo and the rest of the gang hung out at Goldstein's Delicatessen, Mary's Restaurant, or Bonfiglio's Pool Hall. For fun, they turned to the sport and refinement of exquisite torture, Mo was particularly good at entertaining fellow members with new methods of bludgeoning the numerous cats that slinked along the neighborhood's alleys. For sexual release, gang members excelled in gang shags, gang rapes, or engaged in elaborate public pulling contests, masturbatory challenges to determine who could ejaculate first or the farthest. By the time he was thirteen in 1921, Mo had become known as the craziest, the mooniest of them all, earning him the nickname Mooney. They said the hollow-eyed boy would do anything on a dare, anything for two bits, a beer, or a cigarette. Nothing mattered, nothing except this newfound family, and winning its esteem. Street gangs had been a fact of life in the United States long before the turn of the century. Ethnic lines were typically drawn between neighborhoods, and in response, gangs of brawling young men formed for protection. The oldest gangs in Chicago, the Black Hand, dated back to 1890, when the Italians were congregated between Oak and Taylor Streets and Grand and Wentworth Avenues. They had mystically inspired names, such as the Camara, the Mysterious Hand, and the Secret Hand, but unquestionably the most ferocious were the Sicilian Black Hands. They were not a secret society or sect, whose rights were closely guarded by the Italian people, but instead a loosely organized means of inciting terror for profit. The Black Hand traditions were brought over from the feudalistic old country and featured as core elements kidnapping and extortion. The Black Hand protected its loyalists and severely punished its rebellious detractors. Innocent fellow immigrants became its chief prey and provided the fodder necessary for expansion. Local police authorities, paid off by wealthy Black Hand Dons, turned a deaf ear to any cries for justice from the Italian citizenry. By 1900 in Chicago, several other gangs of differing ethnic persuasions emerged. The Irish Market Street Gang had become a strong force by 1902, and even had a juvenile division, the Little Hellions, with an up-and-coming young choir boy named Charles Dion O'Banion as its leader. Another Irish band of toughs, the Valley Gang, controlled the bloody Maxwell Street section, and concentrated on burglaries, pickpocketing, and eventually contract murder. But the most formidable Chicago Black Hand gang centered around two Italians, Diamond Joe Esposito and Big Jim Colosimo. Diamond Joe had established himself as padrone, or boss, as early as 1905, by utilizing the familiar old country tactics of extortion and payoffs to gain political and union ties. 
Big Jim Colosimo took a different and wisely non-competitive road to fortune through high-class prostitution, establishing a widespread enterprise of gilded red velvet brothels that generated millions of dollars and considerable influence. Both Italians operated cafes. Colosimo's became a hangout for fast-living celebrity idols of the day, such as Enrico Caruso, George M. Cohan, Al Jolson, and Sophie Tucker. Esposito's Bella Napoli was a meeting place for up-and-coming gang leaders. Gang expansion also occurred in New York during the early 1900s, and as in Chicago, the most important of the gangs, the Morello Gang, had as its heritage the Black Hand. Other New York gangs formed rapidly, among them the James Street Gang and Five Points Gang, the latter led by Chicago's Big Jim Colosimo's nephew, Johnny Torrio. In 1909, Big Jim found himself in need of additional services. Continued extortion by opposing gangs, rivals of Diamond Joe Esposito's as well, had begun to nibble at his profits. Colosimo appealed to Diamond Joe to intervene on his behalf. It was a request that required additional organizational muscle and inspired Diamond Joe to bring in Colosimo's nephew from New York. Johnny Torrio was a hard-working hustler who had already proven with the New York Five Points gang that he possessed the tough leadership necessary. Once settled in Chicago, he soon had his uncle's brothels running more profitably than ever before. To further control his own burgeoning territories, Diamond Joe Esposito sponsored the six Jenna brothers from Sicily in 1910. With assistance from Esposito's right-hand man, Joe Fusco, the enterprising and ruthless Genoas launched their criminal careers as black-hand enforcers, extortionists, and brothel operators. Smaller, loosely organized neighborhood gangs like the 42 provided the fresh recruits sorely needed by gang leaders such as Esposito. Profiteering businessmen of the time also took note of the street gang tactics, viewing them as a resourceful means to further their own legitimate enterprises. Thus, it wasn't uncommon for young gang members to be employed to protect a legitimate company's interests or influence potential consumers. In 1919, Johnny Torrio, who was looking for additional muscle, brought in Five Points gang member Al Capone from New York to help run the Colosimo Empire. Capone had witnessed the bootlegging successes of fellow Five Points gang members Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, and Bugsy Siegel, and Torrio hoped that, together, he and Capone could convince Big Jim to shift his operations from prostitution to a more lucrative liquor enterprise. Their pleas fell on deaf ears. Big Jim wasn't interested in amassing greater fortune, and neither man could convince him to move into bootlegging. Frustrated, Torrio ordered his uncle's execution— and Colosimo was gunned down in May of 1920. During the following years, Chicago's gangs made feeble, half-hearted attempts to work together, but with so much money to be made, double-dealing and strong ethnic hatred ultimately won out. An all-out fight for territory ensued. Amazingly, during this turbulent period, Diamond Joe Esposito went unchallenged and managed to retain ultimate gangland power. Because he controlled the sugar distribution from Cuba, a license he claimed was granted as a personal favor by President Calvin Coolidge in 1923, Esposito remained in a somewhat neutral position. Since sugar was an ingredient critical to the distillation of alcohol and Cuba was the major supplier to the United States, Esposito could rise above the day-to-day -day gangland battles. Not only was he secure in controlling a commodity everyone needed, but he was also able to influence gang operations and legitimate politics throughout the country. By the time 15-year-old Mooney started working for Diamond Joe, running Sugar and Elkie in 1923, many Black Hand leaders across the country had disappeared, victims of prison or rival gang slang. Those like Esposito were a new breed, using bombs called pineapples as their chief terrorist tactic. Esposito utilized the muscle of the West Side Jenna brothers to patrol his illicit moonshining activities in the patch. The immigrants called them the Terrible Genoas, and under the Padron's direction, they ran Elke from the hundreds of stills that bubbled and cooked in as many Italian households. Both murderous and devoutly religious, the Jennas strutted menacingly from flat to flat, carrying a crucifix in one pocket and a gun in the other. There were a few coppers patrolling Maxwell Street who were not on their payroll. On the day payoffs were made, 
Over 400 officers came and went from the Genoa's Taylor Street Alki plant. Should the Genas discover a still not controlled by them in the patch, they'd send the coppers over to smash it up and make headlines in the process. Business boomed for the Genoas. Each week on Taylor Street, bands of young Sicilian muscle, Mooney now among them, collected over 300 gallons of the prize liquid from each of the homes. From the Genoa's operation alone, Esposito collected over a million dollars a year. In exchange for their trouble, the Italians in the patch were paid handsomely, a half dollar for each gallon of Alki, an average of $150 per still. It was more than they could make in six months of honest menial labor, and most were grateful. Those who weren't kept quiet. There wasn't an Italian in Chicago who wouldn't bow to Esposito. If he required it, he even had their women. Particularly fond of young brides, Esposito was apprised of all upcoming Italian nuptials, demanding to bed the more desirable women on their wedding night, before they were soiled by their husbands. Although many men longed to kill him, Esposito's lascivious humiliations were never denied during his twenty-year reign. By the close of 1924, Diamond Joe Esposito was undeniably the most powerful man in Chicago, perhaps in North America. All of the day's hoodlums, in one way or another, were in his debt. Men such as Al Capone, Johnny Torrio, Jack Guzik, Paul Rica, Murray Humphreys, Frank Nitti, Jack McGurn, and Tony Accardo had all either been sponsored from New York through Esposito's political connections or handpicked for their guts and daring off the streets of Chicago. Esposito's black hand touched enterprises far beyond the confines of Chicago's patch. The Padron routinely boasted of meeting with Calvin Coolidge and dispensing votes and favors at the President's request. According to Esposito, in the early fall of 1924, when asked once again by Coolidge how he could be repaid for his recent political assistance, he requested a promise that the President not interfere with the Chicago takeover of all Union operations, coast to coast. Under the guise of generosity, he also asked that the men he supplied with sugar, Joe Kennedy in Boston, Sam and Harry Bronfman of Canada, Louis Rosensteel of Cincinnati, and Joe Reinfeld of New Jersey, receive special protection and all rights to bootlegging. Esposito insisted he got exactly what he wanted from Coolidge, and given the national power he wielded, there wasn't a soldier in Chicago who doubted him. Just as Esposito had promised, Capone and his boys went after unions totally unimpeded by law enforcement, while Esposito's sugar customers remained protected. It was a smart move, and it made Esposito filthy rich. Although Diamond Joe Esposito preferred neutrality, this traditional Italian, ethnic heritage, was a tie that couldn't be broken. He was unswerving in his support of Torrio and Capone, forming an alliance that would prove formidable to the Northside O'Banion gang. Together the Italians had at their disposal an enormous thousand-man multi-ethnic force that was well-structured and organized for any effort. The Torrio Capone gang had a Jew, Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, as its financial whiz, while Italian Paul Rica and Welshman Murray Humphreys served as lieutenants. Frank Nitti, William Klondike O'Donnell, William Three-Finger Jack White, Machine Gun Jack McGurn, and Charles Fischetti were the gang's chief enforcers. Chicago gangs often formed loose alliances to gain dominance and strength over their adversaries. Torrio and Capone could rely on the unswerving support of several. Although always double-dealing, the Jenner brothers were at their fellow Italians' disposal when it came to a dispute with Northsiders. They had carved out an Alki empire in the west and south sides of the city under the sponsorship of Diamond Joe Esposito. Ironically, cooperation with the Italian gang leaders was based more on geography than ethnic heritage. The Irish Valley Gang, led by Frankie Lake and Terry Drugan, was a solid supporter in the battle against Northside domination, as were the Sheldon Gang, the Saltus Gang, and John Dingbat Oberta's Gang. They referred to their principal opponents as those Irish bastards, under the leadership of Dion O'Banion. O'Banion held complete control of the North Side and used his right-hand man and enforcer, Jaime Weiss, along with George Bugs Moran and Vincent the Schemer, Drucci, as his primary weapons. For added strength against Capone and the Italian gangs, O'Banion brought in the South Side and West Side O'Donnells. It was O'Banion's superior bootlegging product and his fanatical Catholic aversion to allowing prostitution on the North Side 
that led to a confrontation with Torrio and Capone. The war that followed resulted in more than a thousand gangland slayings, and in November of 1924, O'Banion's murder as well. But despite fierce fighting, the gangs and many of those who worked with them managed to amass considerable fortunes by the mid-twenties. Smaller operators such as the Jenner brothers were netting over $100,000 a month, while men at the top such as Al Capone brought in $5 million a year. Such a large sum was evidently not enough for Capone, who, Mooney would later say, tired of Johnny Torrio's unwillingness to share the wealth. In any case, with the encouragement of Paul Rica and Murray Humphreys, Al decided his partner should step aside. With that in mind, he enlisted two of Esposito's young toughs for the job, rather than the gang's own enforcers, who might be unduly loyal to Torrio. One was Mooney, now a cold-hearted seventeen-year-old, who was becoming well-known in the patch for his abilities both behind the wheel and the barrel of a gun. Mooney took his sidekick and friend Leonard Needles Gianola along, just as he'd done countless times before, to give Torrio the signal to retire in January of 1925. Although the press conveniently gave credit for the ambush to the North Side O'Banion gang, Torrio knew better. He knew who fired the shotgun blasts that nearly gutted him on the spot, and for whom his attackers worked. After a touch-and-go recovery, Torrio took the forty million dollars he'd accumulated during his brief but profitable reign and got out of town. Mooney's work evidently pleased the Capone forces because just five months later, in May of 1925, they enlisted his skills again as part of a gang that would remove another obstacle to Big Al's power. This time, they were six men Mooney knew well, the Jenna brothers. The first to go was Angelo Jenna, helplessly pinned behind the wheel of his car after a cat-and-mouse chase through Chicago streets. He could do nothing to save himself when his attackers pulled alongside and shotgunned him to death. Believing wrongly, as did the police, that Angelo's death was the work of the North Side gang, Mike Jenna immediately set out for revenge with two enforcers at his side, Alberto Anselmi and John Scalise. Unknown to Jenna, the two had switched their allegiance to Capone. Before Scalise and Anselmi could carry out Capone's orders to murder Jenna, the three were engaged in a gun battle with police, and a critically wounded Mike Jenna was captured. Anselmi and Scalise fled. Jenna was hospitalized and died just hours later. That left Tony the Gentleman, Jenna, as Capone's last real stumbling block. Fearful for his life, Tony Jenna made plans to go into hiding and set a meeting with one of the few men he thought he could trust, Giuseppe Nerone. When Jenna and Nerone met later in an alley, Mooney and Needles stepped out of the shadows and cut Jenna down in a blaze of gunfire. Not long after Tony's death, the three remaining Jenna brothers escaped the city with their lives and little else. Years later, after promising they'd stay clear of syndicate activities, the Jennas would return to Chicago to run a legitimate cheese and olive oil business. With Torrio and the Jennas out of the way, Capone filled his time by systematically eliminating any remaining rivals for his empire and by gradually consolidating smaller gangs under his rule. Contact with the big gang leaders elevated Mooney's stature among other 42s to near idolatry. He reveled in it, swaggering down Taylor or Maxwell Street in classy suits with a revolver in his pocket and a loose girl on his arm. Unfortunately, neither his gangland connections nor his 42 cronies could get him out of a jam with the coppers that September of 1925. At 17, he received his first arrest and conviction for auto theft and was sentenced to 30 days in the Joliet State Pen. It was a turning point for Mooney. Sitting in the cell in Joliet gave him time to consider just how far he'd come since those days as a child when he'd been chained and beaten beneath a tree on West Van Buren, He'd learned to rely on his own wits and cunning to get by in the world, and up until now they'd served him well. He knew the power of the bullet and the baseball bat, and he knew he was different, different from the other greaseball smartheads, different from men like his ignorant father, different from the other convicts who lined the cell block in Joliet. Those men were hindered by their own stupidity and victimized by emotions such as love and suffering. He'd left those fetters behind long ago. The realization that he could kill, do whatever was necessary to reach his ends, without the ponderous moral questions that might plague others, opened his eyes. 
he counted the days until his release from prison. He would return to Taylor Street and face the only man who'd ever humbled him. His father. Antonio had seen Mooney from time to time, had caught him when he was younger, sneaking into the house late at night to steal a loaf of bread, or, if it was cold outside, looking for a place to sleep, and he'd always beaten him and kicked him out the door. In later years, he'd tried to erase Mo from his mind altogether. He knew what his son had done on the streets of the patch with hoodlums like the Jennas, Esposito, and Capone, and he wanted no part of it. His business was beginning to prosper. He had a partner in a small store where they sold lemon ice, along with the obligatory fruits and vegetables. His wife Mary had served him well, and he had a new brood of children now. Two boys, Joseph, Pepe, and Charles, Chuck, had been added to his family, bringing their number to seven, four girls and two boys, plus Lena. The dreams he'd had before coming to the new world were beginning to come to fruition. Then his son walked back into his life. It surprised and angered Antonio to see Mooney walk right into the flat so boldly one night. The family was asleep, and he'd been sitting at the table nursing a glass of wine when the door opened. You should know better than to come around here, he yelled in Italian at the thin, sunken-eyed seventeen-year-old who stood staring at him from within the shadows of the doorway. Mooney said nothing, but stepped out into the lamplight. What the hell do you want? Antonio asked. Come one more step and I'll beat the hell out of you he threatened, shaking his fist. There was something about the way the boy just stared at him that was unnerving, as if he was looking right through him. Get out, he yelled again. Mooney smiled a distant smile and wordlessly edged closer. Well, what do you want then? What? Tell me now, and then just get out. Mooney took another step and, without raising his voice, said evenly, What I want is what you took away. A look of puzzlement crossed Antonio's face, and then was quickly replaced with red-faced rage. He got up from his chair and stood to face the boy, now taller than he, before replying. And what is that? I have nothing of yours. You don't belong here. Mooney came right up to his father's face and looked him in the eye. Finally, the boy began to laugh, an odd, high-pitched cackle. It's over, old man, he said softly and turned his back to walk across the room. Nonchalantly, as if he'd lived there all his life, he leaned against the sink and began to light a cigarette. Through the glare of the orange sulfured flame, he glanced up and said, You can't push me around any more, old man, and you can't hurt me. It's over. He blew out the match. The words left Antonio momentarily speechless. Why, you, you little bastard! he cried at last. You lousy little son of a bitch! You might scare old women, but it won't work here. No with me. Now get the hell out of my house before I kick your ass out. Mooney took a long, deep drag and exhaled before he uttered a barely audible reply. No, he said, and dropped the cigarette in the sink. It hissed in the momentary silence. Why, I'll kill you, Antonio screamed and he lunged across the room. He was no match for his son. With one quick gesture, Mooney rammed Antonio against the wall and reached into the sink, his hand emerging with a large butcher knife. Placing its cold steel edge against Antonio's throat, he whispered, Listen, and listen good. Don't ever touch me again, or I'll cut you open like a slaughterhouse pig. You hear me, old man? I'll kill you. From now on, You'll do as I say. Capiche? I'll come here when I want, and I'll go when I want. From now on, things will be different. You'll do what I say. And never forget that I let you live tonight. I could have slit your throat, but I didn't. Remember that. Because if you ever forget it, I promise I'll kill you. He loosened his grip. You'd kill your own father? Mooney laughed as he dropped the knife into the sink with a clatter. Don't try me, he said over his shoulder as he swaggered out the door. No one in the family knew what had come over Antonio, but when Mooney came to the Giancana household on Sunday, it was with a new air of authority. Antonio seemed to welcome him with open arms. Nor did he speak up when Mooney defiantly took his father's own place at the head of the table. 
It looked as if Mooney was home for good. From then on, if he felt like it, he stopped by his father's house for a nap or a good meal, or simply to keep the kids in line. He quickly usurped Antonio's role as father and household disciplinarian, but largely his days and nights were filled with crazy forty-two stunts and robberies. His brief stay in Joliet had done little to dampen his enthusiasm for the outrageous. Unlike the older Capone man whom Mooney needed to impress, the forty-two smartheads were his friends, and he could let his hair down with them. When he wasn't on a job for Esposito running sugar shipments in Alki, or breaking a few union or political legs for Capone under Murray Humphrey's direction, he was hanging out at Bonfiglio's pool hall with other forty-twos. His expertise at wheeling had also begun to pay off. He now frequently chauffeured machine gun Jack McGurn, the flashy Capone enforcer. Though 1925 had been, in many respects, a good year for Mooney, it turned out to be a very bad year for his fellow gang members. Newspapers began a feverish attempt to paint the 42s as a blight upon the land, and sprang on the smallest incident for their headlines. Even non-members received publicity if they were young, Italian, and lived in the patch. Carl Torsiello's brawl with the neighborhood bully and one night stay in jail became a 42 gang war with felony conviction when the press made its splashy reports. In reaction to public outcry, the coppers turned up the heat. First, there were the raids on 42 warehouses, filled to overflowing with stolen goods. Next, a two-mile car chase in March, led by Pete Nicostro and another 42, with the police cars screaming in hot pursuit, their bullets flying. Then, two days after curbing Nicostro and throwing him in jail, 17 other gang members were arrested for attempted robbery. Throughout it all, Mooney remained unscathed although the detectives hauled him in for questioning almost daily. The John Connor family's lives changed dramatically in response to Mooney's presence. Forty-two smartheads such as Tumpa Russo and Fat Leonard Caifano started to come around to visit over a plate of pasta. Most of the time the children lived on a tightrope, captive to Mooney's new role as head of the household, his radical mood swings and seesaw outbursts. And whenever there was a robbery or shootout in the news, they came to anticipate the inevitable knock at their door. Their father maintained a low profile. When Mooney set up a still in the basement of their home, Antonio, without the merest hint of agitation, ran it. There was little the older man could do. Like the other immigrants dominated by gangland rule, he resigned himself to the steamy odor of sour mash that hung throughout their flat and gladly took the few dollars Mooney threw his way as token payment. In some strange way, he even began to admire Mooney. His neighbors praised his son for his guts and street smarts, his cat-like way of always landing on his feet, and Antonio found himself feeling a surge of pride at the mention of Mooney's name. Things were going along smoothly from Mooney's point of view until July, when he and two other 42s, Joey Cipher and Dominic Caruso, came up with the idea of burglarizing an expensive north side dress shop. In the dead of night, they broke in and got away with over fifty dresses. Pulling out into the street, they were spotted by coppers patrolling the area. The chase was what Mooney lived for, what he loved more than anything he could think of. More than banging Mick girls in the backseat of a car or horrors up on Michigan, he loved the opportunity it provided to prove his prowess as a wheelman. With Mooney at the wheel, the trio sped off with a police car in hot pursuit. He finally lost control of the car. The only time in my life, he would tell friends. Mooney managed to get away on foot. Caruso and Cipher, however, were nabbed and, under questioning, broke down. The next morning, while the eight John Connor children were gathered for breakfast, hungrily eating their bread and coffee, the knock on the door came. Mooney was sitting bleary-eyed at the head of the table, holding the smallest child, three-year-old Chuck, in his lap, while drinking a cup of coffee. At the sight of the officers, he stood up, handed the little boy to his stepmother, and gave Antonio a hard look. Without saying a word, he let the detectives make their arrest and lead him off to jail. Down at the station house, he was charged with burglary. Bond was set at five hundred dollars. Antonio had understood what Mooney's look meant. He was to get the money from Diamond Joe Esposito to post Bond and pay off the coppers. He did exactly that, and soon his son was back home and ready to hit the streets again. As repayment to Esposito, Mooney gratefully drove a sugar shipment to Louisville. 
Once there, he cooled his heels in seedy bars and on the riverboat city sidewalks while waiting for a return shipment of Kentucky bourbon whiskey. Kentucky coppers, like those in Chicago, were always on the lookout for suspicious types, and Mooney Giancana, a fast-talking Italian, stuck out in their slow-moving town like a horse with knickers. Mooney was picked up as a vagrant and later released. A few days later, he got his carload of booze and hightailed it out of town. The experience left a bad taste in his mouth. He always hated Kentucky after that, saying it was full of dull-witted degenerates, lazy shines, and coppers who could be bought too cheap. Back in Chicago, the air took on a crispness indicative of the coming fall. Antonio no longer peddled his lemon ice, mammoth watermelons, and ripe tomatoes, but squashes and dried fruits instead. Wagons laden with coal creaked up and down the streets of the patch, and residents chattered like squirrels as they scampered to and fro, gathering the necessities required for survival during the harsh Chicago winters. For Mooney, it was business as usual. There were the runs for Esposito, the calls to drive McGurn, the nightclubs where he wore expensive suits and flashed wads of cash while giving fast girls with blonde bobs long looks. And naturally, there were the 42 heists. Late one night in mid-September of 1926, he and two other 42s, Diego Rico and Joe Pape, were sitting in a club, bemoaning their boredom, when they suddenly got the idea to hit a store in the brothel district of the infamous Levy. To Mooney, such jobs were as much for the thrill as for the cash they brought. He drove and served as lookout on most heists, and jumped at the chance that night to demonstrate his getaway skills, whipping corners and laying rubber. The robbery backfired miserably. Everything was going fine, Mooney would later recall, until the crazy shopkeeper, a man named Gerard, decided to be a hero and went for a gun. With that, all hell broke loose, and gunfire was exchanged, bringing scores of people running toward the shop and wounding both Pape and Gerard. The trio managed to make their getaway, but the next morning the detectives were knocking at the Giancana door, arrest warrants in hand, thanks to a witness, Alex Burba. Gerard, the foolhardy shopkeeper, had died, and Mooney, Pape, and Rico were jailed. Bond was set at $25,000 on charges of robbery and murder. Antonio received an envelope stuffed with cash from Diamond Joe Esposito, and once again, money in hand, trudged down to the station house to win Mooney's release. The trial was scheduled for April of the following year. Out on bail and at home, the strain began to show. Mooney became more aggressive with the children, as well as with Antonio. He largely ignored Mary, his stepmother, although he seemed to brighten at four-year-old Chuck's antics, and didn't try to hide that the small, rough-and-tumble boy was his favorite. Like the rest of the neighborhood, Mooney was both impressed and amused by the little guy's sassiness and daring, his fearless acrobatics on the curbs and street corners. Not a day passed that Chuck could not be found swinging precariously from electrical wires, jumping from stoops and second-story rooftops, or dashing into the street to make a game of dodging the constant stream of carts and cars, behavior that drove Chuck's mother to near distraction as she anxiously watched for speeding cars and gangland whippers. In October, Chuck's daring would lead to tragedy. The four-year-old was playing in the street when a car barreled down on him. Ever alert, Mary ran from the stoop to save her child. Most certainly, he would have been killed if it hadn't been for what she did next. In one of those rare moments when what a person is truly made of crystallizes, Mary Leonardi Giancana ran directly into the path of the car and threw her son with every bit of strength she had across the street. Within seconds, she was dead, dragged over a block by the speeding car. Three days later, she was buried, and Chuck was left with guilt instead of a mother. Mary's funeral flooded Mooney with memories he'd never realized still slept within him, his own mother's eyes, her soft, comforting voice, the emptiness he'd felt so long ago. The feelings aroused in him an emotion long dead, one unfamiliar to him during his years as a forty-two. An affection stirred, stronger than ever, for four-year-old Chuck, who was standing by his side. Mooney tightened his grip on the little boy's hand. They had a kinship. They shared this loss. What had followed in his own life after his mother's death all the brutality and pain, Mooney would never allow to touch this little boy. 
There had been no one to protect Mooney when his mother died, but he could change that for this child. He would protect him from all the madness, push him in a different direction from the one he'd chosen. Chuck wouldn't grow up to be a common greaseball, not now, not with him at his side. Mooney stayed close to home over the next months. He quietly and solemnly watched Chuck as he reflected on his own mother, her face now no more than a vague memory. In December, the dress shop burglary trial came up, and Mooney and Caruso were acquitted for lack of evidence, but Cypher got one to ten years. A darkness still enveloped Mooney's days. He had the trial for murder to contend with in April. The possibility of prison and the electric chair haunted him at night when he fell asleep on the sofa and greeted him with the sunrise. There was no way he would allow either to occur, and therefore he came up with a plan to make sure of it. As the 1927 winter turned to spring, and the murder trial date drew near, Mooney launched an intimidation campaign against the only witness who could testify against them, Alex Burba. First, he and Rico tried husky-voiced phone calls and whispered sinister threats, all with no effect. When this failed, they redoubled their efforts, the three driving over together to pay Burba a little visit at his soda shop. But the man remained steadfast. The trial date was only days away, when Mooney decided to resort to bribery, offering Burba $2,000 in cash to keep his mouth shut. Still, he wouldn't back down. As Mooney saw it, they had no other choice at that point but to kill the stupid bastard. And on the evening of April 20th, at Mooney's bidding, Diego Rico went back to Burba's shop alone and plugged him twice, once in the shoulder and once a fatal wound in the back of the head. No one came forward to finger them in Burba's death, and ten days later the Gerard case was dropped for lack of evidence. Mooney's spirits lifted. Things went back to normal, and he started driving fast and hanging out with the guys at Bonfiglio's again. In the smoky pool hall, while his fellow 42 members grumbled about Joey Calaro's leadership, his rules against girls and guns, his heavy-handed domination, Mooney had his own ideas. Abiding by the rules set by Calaro no longer concerned him. There were other, more important men to reach, and he thought he was almost there. Driving for McGurn had put him among the Capone gang, and impressing them was all that mattered now. Once he made it with those guys, he'd bring his own band with him. Fat Leonard Caifano, Needles Gianola, Fiore Fifi Bucchieri, Willie Potatoes Dadano, Sam Mad Dog De Stefano, Milwaukee Phil Eldericio, Chucky Nicoletti, and the English brothers Chuck and Butch. Scanning the room, Mooney saw what would become the underworld's future, its young bloods. The other thing he saw was an empire. While other people were still heralding the May transatlantic flight of Lindbergh, Mooney's attention was fixed on other concerns, specifically removing any obstacles in his path to leadership. And as fate, assisted by an anonymous phone call made by Mooney to the police, would have it, Mooney's one stumbling block to control of his fellow 42s, Joey Calaro, was gunned down in November. The press described the event as the end of the 42s. Mooney described it as his lucky break. His next big break came when he got a call from the Capone gang in March of 1928. Most men might have shunned the request, might have wanted no part in the betrayal, but Mooney readily, eagerly complied. He stood in the telephone booth, collar turned up in his top coat, and stared vacantly out the dirty plate glass window at the people milling around the aisles of Chess Row's drugstore. Then he turned his back and dialed, glancing over his shoulder one last time before covering the mouthpiece with a crisp white handkerchief. His muffled voice echoed against the booth's wood-paneled walls when he spoke, his words pouring out in a low snarl. Get out of town or get killed, he said to the man on the line, the man who had saved him from petty gangs and petty crime and starvation on the streets. Then he smiled a cruel smile and hung up the phone. Chapter 3 among the branches of the budding hedges, a lone mockingbird chirped the final notes of its evening song. Nearby, a sleek black roadster lingered along the curb, camouflaged by the nightfall. Stealthily, almost imperceptibly, it had been edging forward. At the wheel, a young man, oily black hair slicked back, 
and a cigarette drooping from his lips smiled as his passengers nodded at their approaching victim. Unaware, Diamond Joe Esposito walked to his death with arrogance, swaggering confidently down the sidewalk toward his assassins, his jowls jiggling up and down as he chewed on a smoldering fat cigar. His bodyguards, the Varchetti brothers, seemed nervous, glancing from side to side. The car fairly twitched in anticipation, its engine racing ever so slightly. The exhilaration of the coming kill quickened the driver's pulse. He longed to spring forward, but waited for his moment. When it came, he shifted the car into gear and lunged with a guttural roar toward the man. Diamond Joe cried, Oh, my God! at the sight of the oncoming gunman, and instead of shielding their charge, the Varchettis fell to the ground. Riveting machine gun fire caught the padrone first in the chest, and his eyes registered fear as he stared knowingly into the driver's face for one brief second before falling forward, succumbing to the gnawing bullets that tore at his flesh. The hot lead ate through him, chewing the layers of clothing and fat, ripping them into open, flapping pieces of skin. Another round pitted and splattered what remained. Convulsing in a foam of blood, his arms and legs jerked spastically. The driver paused long enough to watch Esposito's wife, Carmelo, rush from her home. Oh, my God, is it you, Giuseppe? I'll kill them for this, I'll kill them, she screamed, and threw herself on her husband's mutilated corpse. The car sped off, swerving in the distance, and, with brakes shrieking victoriously, rounded a corner, disappearing from sight. Before he was gunned down in March of 1928, 56-year-old Esposito had been a mentor to Mooney and hundreds of other boys languishing on street corners, as well as a benefactor to a great many struggling Italian families. He'd passed out 2,500 turkeys each year at Thanksgiving, played Santa Claus to the children of the patch, and supported the local Italian charities. Despite these philanthropic endeavors, Antonio Giancana, like many of his fellow immigrants, believed it was a service his enemies have done this neighborhood— a service to rid us of such bloody tyrants as Diamond Joe. But in the patch there were always new tyrants to replace the old, new rules to follow and lessons to learn. Carving out a life in the sprawling Italian section was difficult at best. The only apparent route to a better future, the only hope to escape the poverty, was a life of crime, and even then the more ambitious, like Mooney, recognized power was not handed down, it was taken— with Esposito out of the way, Capone eyed illicit operations throughout the entire Midwest. He began consolidating the ragtag assortment of South Side gangs and made plans to eliminate his North Side competitors. He and Paul Riga continued Esposito's political friendships, hoping to extend the gang's influence still further. Viewed more as a public servant than a criminal, Capone gave the people of Chicago what they wanted booze, sex, and gambling, and his popularity in the city soared. Capone's consolidation of power meant more power for his loyal followers, and Mooney was fast to take advantage of his own dominance in the patch. In April 1927, he got another chance to prove his worth to Capone during the Republican Party primary. Incumbent Mayor Thompson was being challenged by what the Capone forces derided as a do-gooder, Senator Charles Deneen, it was critical to the gang's operations that Thompson remain in power, and they made every effort to see to it that the appropriate number of vote floaters, people who went from precinct to precinct voting again and again, were out in the streets on the day of the primary. But the 20th Ward had the gang worried. Thompson's political crony, Morris Eller, was being challenged by Octavius Granati, and rumor had it that the black attorney might actually win. Mooney got the word to get rid of Granati, the upstart Mooley shine troublemaker, on the morning of the election. Later that day, as the polls were closing, Granati was shot to death by four men in a sedan. Morris Eller remained in power, and Mooney was taken in for questioning, but released, of course, he would later say. Three months later, in June of 1928, Mooney Giancana was twenty years old, and every man, woman, and child in the neighborhood not only feared him, but revered him as well. His recent scrapes with the law, the murders he was known to have committed, his brutal intimidation tactics, all became legendary. Rather than diminish his stature, the stories the immigrants whispered among themselves only served to make the swaggering Mooney a larger-than-life figure. 
To the Italians, hoods like Mooney, who'd roamed the streets as youths and now were pulling themselves up by the bootstraps to achieve financial success, were simply symbols of a dream come true. And you had to have a dream to get by in the patch. Mooney's little brother, five-year-old Chuck, didn't think any of the thousands of poor, uneducated immigrants who littered their neighborhood had a dream, at least not one like his. He liked to pretend he was someone else, and ever since Mooney and Fat Leonard had taken him to see his first cowboy picture, he'd thought Tom Mix would be a good choice as a hero. But the best hero of all was Mooney. To Chuck, Mooney, at twenty, was a bona fide adult. Mooney came and went as he pleased. He had money and respect. He could even smart-mouth their peddler father and get away with it. As long as Chuck could remember, the bigger boys had spoken with unabashed reverence of Mooney and the 42 gang. Sometimes Chuck and the other kids would congregate on the stoop to watch the neighborhood men, fueled by homemade wine, play craps under the streetlight. One of the men served as a lookout for the Irish coppers who roamed the streets, ever ready to grease the patrolman's palms if necessary, while the others rolled the dice, laughing and swearing in turn. Even they discussed his brother Mooney, and though Chuck couldn't always make out the exact words, their tone conveyed respect. Chuck pretended not to pay attention to the bigger boy's whisperings, as he checked his shoes for scuff marks, methodically rubbing each one off with the plaid patch on his sleeve. But in truth he listened, enraptured, to their narration of his brother's escapades. They said the newspapers called Mooney the Generalissimo of the Forty-Two, that he'd killed at least fifty men for Diamond Joe and Capone without blinking an eye, and they played games trying to name them all. There's the one guy in the train tracks, there's the politician Granati, there's... And they reenacted heists and shootouts, describing in vivid detail the accompanying car chases. Hearing tales about Al Capone's men and Mooney's Forty-Two gang was better, even when Chuck had the nickel for admission in the pocket of his worn knickers, then going to any picture show at the Broadway over on Roosevelt Road, even one starring Tom Mix. Esposito's death and Mooney's handling of the Granati murder catapulted Mooney to new acceptance by the Capone gang. He swiftly found a place among the older gangsters, supplementing his job driving for McGurn with that of executioner. It was easy money, and he was good at it. The rise in status brought him the adulation he'd craved so desperately from his old forty-two cronies. Guys like Willie Potatoes, Fifi Bucchieri, Mad Dog, Teets Battaglia, Milwaukee Phil, and Fat Leonard followed him around like lapdogs. But with his prominence also came jealousy and rivalry. Other gangs resented Mooney's ties to the big-name gangsters and looked for any means possible to knock him from his throne as reigning smarthead. His was a precarious crown, and only through cunning was he able to survive their continual attempts to topple his authority. One such attempt changed everything for the John Connor family. It had been late, probably well past midnight, one chilly September night in 1928, and Chuck had waited until he knew everyone else was asleep, before propping himself up on the coarse flour sacks his sisters painstakingly stitched into pillowcases. He folded his thin olive arms behind his head and gazed past the cracked window. He never could tell whether there was a moon in the sky, or stars for that matter, but boys didn't dwell on such things anyhow. Chuck thought that was for sissies and queers. He preferred to drift into his own secret world and cherish these moments in bed at night, though they weren't exactly ones of solitude. He was never really alone, since his brother Pepe and three cousins shared the bed. Since his father had married his widowed sister-in-law, Catherine, earlier that year, things in the small Giancana flat had become cramped and overcrowded. His stern-faced stepmother had seven children of her own, three boys, Vito, Chucky, and Joey, and four girls, Pearl, Victoria, Rose, and Gracie. It was hard to fall asleep with the sharp wire bed springs squealing as they poked through the thin mattress or with Cousin Vito's knobby toes wriggling in his face and Joey's knees nuzzling at his groin. To avoid such unwelcome intimacy, Chuck scooted up on his pillow and curled into an upright fetal position, pulling the covers tightly under his chin. A slumbering tug-of-war ensued as his brother and cousins wrestled drowsily to maintain their rightful portion of the blanket. 
He amused himself by listening to the usual late-night cacophony of police sirens, screeching brakes, and the occasional staccato of gunfire echoing up and down the alleyways. Mentally rehashing the stories about Mooney he'd overheard earlier made him smile in the darkness. There was nothing he would rather be, in the whole wide world, than head of a gang like Mooney's forty-two, and he was determined that some day he would. Suddenly a thunderous blast ripped through the patch. The little panes of glass in the window rattled like Aggies in a tin can. He sat bolt upright, rubbing his eyes as much in amazement as to awaken fully. All the while the brick walls of the flat shuddered and waffled in response to the explosion. He thought the entire room might come down around him, and terrified, he leapt from the bed, feeling the cold wood floor quake beneath his bare feet. The shaking stopped, and someone screamed in the street below. Grabbing his pants, he rushed over to the window and opened it, leaning out as far as his small frame would allow, stretching into the cool night air. The acrid scent of smoke filled his nostrils. He could just make out a red glow. It tinted the skyline and lit the shadowy figures of people running in its direction. Hundreds of lights shot on from as many households. This wasn't your routine pineapple bombing. No siree, he thought excitedly, as he scampered through the window and onto the rickety wooden porch. It groaned beneath his weight, and a few of the more rotted timbers sank spongily with each hesitant step. His heart fluttered when he looked down two stories to the rubble illuminated below. Had it been daylight, and had he had an audience, he would have been fearless. He was always jumping from stoops and rooftops, and he was proud of the reputation he'd earned as the neighborhood's foremost daredevil. But tonight, the darkness made him uneasy. He forgot any thoughts of such antics, and using one hand to steady himself, slipped on his pants. He could hardly wait to find out who had thrown such an incredible bomb, and called into his brother and cousins. They sat frozen in the bed. Sissies, he mumbled to himself. Those who lived in the patch had long gotten used to the nightly bombings, shootings, and fires, but in Chuck's short life there had been nothing to equal the magnitude of this bombing. He heard a furious pounding at their front door, then heard it slam. Moments later he caught sight of his father, still dressed in his night clothes, running toward the blaze with his vegetable and lemon ice store partner, Grimilda. Before Chuck could steal down the porch to follow, his sister Antoinette burst into the room. She stood in the doorway, dark eyes searching for him, tapping her foot angrily on the floor. Of his four sisters, Antoinette had the highest spirit and strongest constitution. After their mother had died, she'd taken on the task of mothering herself, caring for her five younger brothers and sisters, with a courage and conviction uncommon for a girl of sixteen, but expected by Italians from the old country, and certainly by Mooney and her father. Old habits died hard, and although the children now had a new mother, Antoinette still clung to her role of protectress. Chuck's brother and cousins laughed as he sullenly trudged back to bed. Not until he'd pulled the rough sheets around his shoulders and fallen asleep did Antoinette close the door. The incident would make Chuck understand, as best any child could, what the violence of the patch meant to its victims. Thanks to the bombing of his father's lemon ice store, the entire Giancana family fortune, paltry as it was, was lost. Less than two weeks later, on September 17th, Antonio and Grimilda were shot and brutally beaten by young thugs from a rival gang of the 42, and with the assistance of one more bomb, what little was left of the lemon ice store was demolished. The two men felt lucky to escape with their lives, the boys on the street told Chuck that everybody thought his father and partner had been muscled by some guys Mooney had crossed, and that the same hoods had murdered one of Mooney's friends, a smart hat everybody called Dibbets, after Mooney shotgunned one of their gang. Nobody expected the police to do anything about this latest wave of violence. They were too busy roughing up the remaining forty-twos, or shaking them down to care about real trouble. After the bombing, the mood in the patch became strangely tense, Old women carrying baskets stacked high with loaves of bread, salami, and provolone lowered their heads and scuttled hurriedly to the other side of the street when punks under Mooney's spell, the Battaglia brothers, the De Stefanos, and crazy Patsy Tardy strolled brazenly among the fruit and vegetable stands, spreading the word. Mooney Giancana was declaring war. 
There was no doubt Mooney, once he'd pinpointed the perpetrators of this latest offense, would take care of things his own way in the patch. Mooney'll give the guy who bombed his father's store a good taste of his own medicine, Charker at one boy say. And it was true. Even a child like Chuck knew Mooney would mete out his own brand of justice, that it was just a matter of time. Unknown to Chuck, people of the patch did have dreams of their own. But like him, they kept them to themselves, not daring to voice them for fear they would somehow hope too much and fail. His father's dream had been to prosper in his lemon ice business. Antonio Giancana had lain awake at night, planning and worrying. It was a special pleasure to wonder where he'd get enough lemon, or whether he'd have enough shaved ice to serve his growing enterprise. Now that dream had been blown to smithereens, lost in a rubbish heap with all the rest. And Antonio lay awake, wondering where he'd get enough food to feed his children. No one in the family could recall Antonio speaking up to Mooney, but now he didn't hide the fact that he blamed his son for their misfortune. They bickered and argued, screaming obscenities back and forth like two Sicilian fishwives. When Mooney was in the house, which had suddenly become rare, he sulked and stormed through the flat, smashing dishes against the walls, and more than once, his fist. It wasn't so unusual for Mooney to be ill-tempered, unyielding in his control. He was always throwing his weight around in the Giancana household. But it was unlike Antonio to be so vocal. At twenty, Mooney had already murdered more men than Antonio cared to imagine, and he was now more afraid of his son's violent unpredictability than ever. In the midst of this family infighting and economic collapse, Chuck and two of his friends stole a bag of money containing thirty-five dollars from the old pieman's cart parked along Taylor Street as it made its deliveries of fresh fruit and cream pies. This is how the forty-two got its start, they crowed among themselves, and victorious, the boys paraded through the patch to spend their fortune on Maxwell Street, where a few nickels could buy food and clothing and a million other things about which most children in the patch could only dream. No one seemed to wonder why three ragamuffins had so much money. People in the patch learned not to ask too many questions. The Italian vendors accepted with an open hand whatever came their way, whether stolen goods or cash. So for three dollars a hunchbacked old man gladly sold them a red bicycle, and a pretty girl, who made Chuck blush when she smiled at him, took a crisp one-dollar bill for a pair of roller skates. By five o'clock that evening, the bicycle lay in a twisted heap of spokes and rubber, a victim of the boy's overzealous acts of daring. Undaunted, Chuck next entertained himself by devising acrobatic feats on the skates. As the sun slowly disappeared behind the red-brick tenements, his friends departed for home and dinner. Chuck was left alone, shivering in the damp air. He sat down on the stoop to unstrap the skates, and was so entranced by them that he jumped when Mooney's voice intruded on his daydreams. "'Where did you get those?' Mooney asked nonchalantly. "'From a friend,' Chuck answered, barely looking up. "'A friend? Uh-huh.' Chuck's hands began to shake, which made the wheels of the roller skates twirl ever so slightly. But he was sure Mooney saw them, sure Mooney knew he was lying." He pushed a matted forelock of black hair from his eyes and looked up. Gone were the casual posture and friendly smile. In their place was the coldness he'd seen so many times. In one swift gesture, Mooney leapt from the stair and lifted Chuck by his collar. He held him squirming and slapped him hard across the mouth as he whispered between clenched teeth, Don't ever lie to me, understand? Chuck nodded. Tears dribbled in milky streaks down his face. Okay, we'll try again. Where did you get the skates? It was hard to talk, but he managed to choke out a reply. I found them. Mooney raised one hand ominously, and with the other, grabbed Chuck by his ear, jerking his face right up to his own. His breath was hot and smelled like cheap wine and stale cigarettes. What? I don't believe it for a minute. Did you steal them? No, honest, I didn't. Honest. Mooney slapped him hard again. Tell me the truth, now. Chuck began to sob. Okay, okay, don't hit me no more. Please, he begged. I'll tell you, I promise. Please. I'm waiting. Nicky and Tony, they stole money from the pie man. Are you with them? Uh, well, yeah, but... Did you help take the money? Mm, uh, sort of, maybe, sort of. 
Mooney's pointed toe shoe came out of nowhere to kick Chuck in the side with a sickening thud, and he screamed, Sort of? Did you or didn't you? Tell the goddamn truth or I'm gonna beat the living hell out of you. Doubled over in pain, Chuck decided to tell it all. He'd spill his guts, and Mooney would see that they were just like the forty-two, just as smart and tough. All right, I will. I will. I promise, he said. Oddly calm, Mooney sat down next to him and listened to every word. When at last he finished, Chuck hesitantly looked into his eyes, hoping he'd gain approval or at least a lighter sentence. Mooney leaned over, still poised to strike, and hissed through his teeth, Never, ever be a stool pigeon, Chuck. That'll get you killed. He stood up and glowered. You heard of Omerta? he screamed. You keep your eyes and ears open and your fucking mouth shut. The blur of Mooney's body rushed down upon him. Again, the pointed toe of the leather shoe kicked him. Omerta, Mooney shouted. Never forget that word. Never beef on anybody. You got that? Never. Mooney picked up the roller skates, then stormed down the sidewalk until reaching a garbage can. Taking off the lid, he turned to Chuck, still cowering on the stairs. Mooney smiled and, with dramatic pomp, held the shiny skates above the gaping can. Dropping them, he slammed the lid down. The sound of metal against metal still clattered when he put his hands in his pockets and sauntered away. Chuck stared blankly at the can. His beautiful skates were gone just as quickly as he'd gotten them. He stayed on the steps for a while and cried. When he finally decided to stop, he sat whimpering and nursing his wounds and hating his brother. He'd remember what Mooney said all right. He'd never beef on anybody again if it killed him. And besides, maybe it was time he'd learned his lesson. The consequences of telling the truth were just too great. He repeated the word omerta as he limped up the stairs. In the following days, the first autumn frost blanketed the neighborhood, bringing with it new wares for the peddlers to display. Acorn squash and zucchini and pumpkins gleamed like brightly colored fallen leaves from the backs of wagons drawn by tired sway-backed horses. Emptied of their summer fare, each wobbly wooden crate and stand was now filled with the season's harvest, serving as a reminder of the approaching winter and the crisis it would bring. Unlike in the old country, winter here sent bitter cold into the drafty, squalid flats, and with it, killers like tuberculosis and pneumonia. This time of year, when Antonio could find him, Chuck carted the heaps of coal his father sold. It was a job he hated, which explained why he took his time getting home from school one crisp fall day, just a little more than a month after the bombing of the lemon ice store. Sitting on his favorite curb, Chuck threw the little stones he gathered on his wanderings, then picked them up and threw them again. He pretended they were dice. He could play like this for hours on end, which was exactly what he'd been doing when a man walked up beside him. Chuck paid no attention to the stranger standing there, leaning against the lamppost. The man started to whistle. Finally he stopped, bending down to smile as he waved one hand toward the little stones and said, Hey kid, can anybody play? Chuck looked up. The man was tall, an Italian. He hadn't seen him around before, which was odd, but he smiled back anyway. To people in the patch, anyone who wasn't a Mick, Polak, or a Shine, in short, anyone Italian, was Paisan. Uh-uh, Chuck said, shaking his head. This is a one-man game. But you can watch if you want. That's fair, the man replied, and continued whistling. Chuck had just gotten up to retrieve his stones, rubbing his dusty hands on his ragged knickers, when out of the corner of his eye, he spotted his brother. He was walking quickly toward them, and before Chuck could call out a hello, Mooney stepped up to the stranger. There was a loud pop, and the man fell to the ground. Blood gushed from his head like water from an open fire hydrant. It pulsed rhythmically. Chuck thought he could hear a slight whoosh, whoosh, whoosh as it spurted through a mangled hole of oozing brains and bone, bursting in torrents onto the pavement. And then, as quickly as he'd appeared, Mooney was gone. Transfixed, Chuck stared down at the dead man. He couldn't make out a face. Barbershop customers, lathered with heaps of shaving cream, ran out across the street, and women tending children in buggies began yelling back and forth between second-story windows and stoops. Vendors threw down their wares, leaving vegetables to tumble down the sidewalk as they rushed to see what the commotion was about. The inevitable sirens of police cars rang in the distance as they made their way through the patch. 
Still Chuck stood there, mesmerized by the blood from the whistling man. It steamed in the cool autumn air. He didn't know there was so much blood in a person. It smelled like the warm iron in a blacksmith's shop and ran in sticky puddles around his feet. Dozens of people milled around the body, pushing and shoving. Shaking their heads in disgust, the men shielded their women's eyes. When the police arrived, one began questioning those standing closest to the dead man. He was a red-faced Irish copper, with a notepad in one hand and a pencil behind his ear. Puffing out his barrel chest, he strutted over and squatted down to meet Chuck face to face. "'Let's make some room here,' another officer shouted, forcing the crowd back with his nightstick. "'So what did you see, son? Did you see the person who did this terrible thing? Did you?' He grasped Chuck by his shoulders. His eyes were bullet blue, and they made Chuck want to turn away, afraid they might puncture any words he might offer. In the crowd beyond, he caught sight of Mooney, standing as though invisible, enveloped within the onlookers. Mooney lifted one eyebrow and stared vacantly into his eyes. Chuck looked back at the officer. No, sir, his small voice trembled in reply. Well, the copper scowled. What were you doing then, if you didn't see anything? You were right here. Playing? Playing? Playing what? He put one hand on the base of his nightstick, with threatening authority. With these, Chuck opened his hand to display his treasured stones. With some rocks, the officer exclaimed, standing up. And you didn't see a thing, not a thing. Well, then go home to your mama, you, you little greaseball. Angrily, he slapped Chuck's open hand and the stones flew out, scattering in all directions. Chuck turned and ran. That night, sitting on the stoop after a meager bowl of chechi beans, he listened intently while the older boys discussed the day's murder. Everyone figured Mooney and his friends had been behind it all. The man who'd been killed was a member of the same gang believed responsible for the bombing of Antonio's lemon ice store. All agreed things would be back to normal in the patch, now that justice had been dispensed. If only they knew, really knew that it was Mooney, Chuck thought to himself. He wished he could tell them, could share his deadly secret. As much as he wanted to tell his gruesome story, to see their faces blanch with the truth, and his own stature rise in the telling, he said nothing. He chose to sit in silence, recalling Mooney in the crowd, the vivid image of his brother's victim lying in a pool of blood. Certainly losing his stones was a small price to pay, and lying to a Mick Copper to save his brother... Why, he felt sure his own father would have done the same. Tomorrow he'd hunt in the vacant lots for more stones. Omerta, he whispered softly to himself. Yes, he was sure he'd done the right thing. He'd learned the lesson well. The roller skates had taught him that. Never beef on anybody, Mooney had said. Omerta. Chuck said the word over and over again. He was proud to have done the right thing, the only thing and he would do anything to make his brother proud. He'd earn Mooney's confidence and respect if it took him the rest of his life. Mooney never mentioned the incident, nor did Chuck. Chuck referred to that afternoon in 1928 as the day I lost my stones. Only years later would he use the word innocence. Chapter 4 if Chuck had indeed gained Mooney's respect by keeping quiet about the whistling man, there was no sign of it. He even wondered whether the beatings had intensified. For days after one of Mooney's unwarranted tirades, his small back and legs sported reminders of his older brother's authority. The tender pink stripes left by a razor-sharp leather belt, the blue-black bruises that mottled his arms— Strangely, whenever he investigated a mark left by one of Mooney's more recent admonitions, Chuck felt guilty for letting his big brother down, and thankful because Mooney cared. Mooney said he wanted Pepe and Chuck to grow up right, to show respect, that he didn't want them to turn out to be just common dago greaseballs. His sisters, he believed, required even more supervision. They would never grow up to be cheap painted tramps under his close scrutiny, and he forbade them to associate with what he called whores and trollops wearing flea-bitten furs with ugly animal heads dangling around their necks. He made it clear the children needed the strictest discipline. And if Mooney was inclined to provide it, no one in the family, including Antonio, was inclined to interfere. 
indeed following the recent slaying, attributed by most as retribution for the bombing of his lemon ice store, Antonio seemed to have settled back into meek submission in Mooney's presence. Mooney ignored his stepmother's children for the most part. He felt no allegiance, no concern for their welfare. The three boys, Vito, Chucky, and Joey, could have been invisible for all they mattered to Mooney. He barely looked at them or spoke to them. They didn't exist unless they got in his way. Of Catherine's four girls, only Gracie remained in the house. The other three had married. Mooney's tactics were effective. The children avoided making waves. They tiptoed through the house. Where's Mooney? they'd whisper, and look over their shoulders when engaged in any activity, no matter how insignificant. But what made it most difficult for Chuck, who wrestled continually with conflicting feelings of anger and love, guilt and resentment, and anyone else who dealt with a strong-willed Mooney, was that just as quickly as his hand could be raised in anger, he could also hold a gift or some small treasure. And both always came as a surprise, without provocation, depending on his mood at the time. Everyone had long since given up trying to predict young Mooney Giancana's irrational state of mind, which was where they knew his nickname had come from in the first place. They just anticipated the worst and said a few Hail Marys. Mooney walked through the door of the two-story flat one winter evening after Christmas in 1928, with a box under one arm and a big smile on his face. Members of the Giancana family had to assume he was happy, and when he was, they were. Grinning with uncharacteristic excitement, he handed his camel-hair topcoat and fedora to his youngest sister, Vicky, and immediately motioned for Chuck to sit by him on the sofa. He placed the box between them. Well, open it, Chuck. It's for you. Me? Really, Mooney? Yeah, really. Come on, open it. Chuck picked up the box. It was heavy. He held his breath. He hoped it was the chemistry set he'd seen in the window of the department store. Come on, I don't have all night. Your sisters are setting the table, and I'm hungry. Mooney laughed and took a wrinkled camel from the pack in his shirt and lighted it. Chuck lifted the lid. At first he wasn't sure what the long black thing with little silver buttons could possibly be. But before he could examine it, Mooney grabbed it up and lifted one end to his lips. It's a clarinet, Chuck, he explained, and you're going to learn to play it real nice. Hey, everybody, Chuck is going to take music lessons, be a musician, maybe play in a big band someday, just like Benny Goodman. The entire family gathered round the sofa, the girls ooing and eyeing at the clarinet, while the boys tried to conceal snickers of delight at Chuck's misery. Chuck could hardly hide his disappointment, and it made him wish for the chemistry set even more. Play an instrument? Take music lessons? He wanted to grow up to be a member of Mooney's gang, not a musician. He didn't think a member of the Forty-Two would ever in a million years play a stupid clarinet that was for girls and sissy entertainers. No, he wanted to have a seventy Chrysler and learn to drive it like Mooney did when he wheeled for Jack McGurn. He managed a half-hearted smile. It's real nice, Mooney. Thanks. Is that all you're going to say, huh? After your big brother robs the bank to buy you a clarinet so you can have a trade? So you can grow up and be somebody? He stood up and put his hands on his narrow hips, waiting for an answer. Well? For a moment Chuck wondered whether Mooney had really robbed a bank. After all, the money for the clarinet had to have come from somewhere. He thought of his sister Antoinette, who had been suffering with a toothache all week. Tearfully, she'd begged for money to see a dentist. Antonio had refused. He glanced up at Antoinette, her jaw still swollen, and wondered just how much the clarinet had cost and where the money had come from. But he couldn't disappoint Mooney. It's real nice. I like it. A lot. Really, I do, he said, trying to sound convincing. But his voice sounded pleading, like he did when Mooney started to use the strap, and he begged him to stop. Chuck was no different from the people of the neighborhood or the rest of his family. He'd learned to say or do anything to appease Mooney, to avoid his brother's wrath at any cost. He put on his most convincing smile. It must have worked, because, after scrutinizing Chuck's face, with the same thoroughness he might give the blueprint of a bank, Mooney seemed satisfied. Good, he said. It's settled. You start your lessons tomorrow after school, over at Mr. Cuchardi's. Okay, Mooney. Chuck glanced down at the hated instrument, and then added, Thanks. Josie called to tell them dinner was ready, but she didn't have to. The heavy scent of garlic and oregano, mingled with freshly baked bread, made Chuck's mouth water. 
There were no Roman Catholic words of grace spoken over meals at the Giancana household, no tablecloth or napkins, and few utensils. What dishes they had were a mismatched display of multicolored broken crockery. The table was filled with platters of pasta, barely enough to feed thirteen people. A melee of twisted hands and arms reached in all directions, grabbing for every morsel of food. Between the forkfuls of pasta Chuck feverishly crammed in his mouth, he asked above the clamor, Hey, Mooney, can me and Pepe go with you in your car tonight? Josie reached over to wipe his chin with the edge of her apron. Leave Mooney alone, Chuck, she said. Let him eat in peace. His sisters glared at him now, disapproval shining in their eyes like coals in the wood stove. Chuck cast a sidelong glance at his stepmother. Her reaction didn't matter anyway. She wasn't their mother, and never would be as far as he was concerned. After Chuck's mother had been killed, Antonio had paid Catherine a visit. Soon after, they had married. Chuck knew it was a marriage of convenience, no more, no less. And what had been a difficult scrape by existence to begin with got tougher. Catherine made a point of letting everyone know how little she cared for the Giancana brood. Lifting his glass, Antonio shook his head at Chuck and mumbled his displeasure in Italian. He gulped at the wine and then set it down, wiping the red liquid from his mouth with the back of his hand. From under a canopy of bushy salt-and-pepper eyebrows, he shot a hard look at Mooney. He didn't want his other boys out on the streets. Nor did Mooney. He often viewed them as his own children, his sole responsibility. Antonio, the naive immigrant, had not the slightest idea what could happen to the boys out there on the streets. But Mooney did. He'd seen punk kids as young as Chuck working for the gangs. They ended up dead by the time they were sixteen. That would never happen as long as he was around. He'd promised himself that when Chuck's mother died. No, he'd told Chuck over and over that he had other, more noble aspirations for him. He would have a trade and leave the poverty of the patch behind forever. No matter that the example he set was one much different, if not an utter conflict. Don't you have something else to do? I think we'll have to go out another time. Mooney said, tearing a piece of hard-crusted bread from the loaf on the table. He scraped it back and forth, sopping up the red gravy until the cracked china shone. Dinner's real good, Josie, he complimented. Then, twinkle in his eye, he added quietly, But I can make better. Oh, you can, can you? Josie laughed, making the spindly-legged chair creak and sway beneath her. She was an excellent cook and had every reason to doubt his abilities. She looked at her other sisters and said, well, sometime you'll just have to show us. I will, he said, putting his fork and spoon down. In fact, I'll make dinner for all of you next week, on Thursday. The girls stared in disbelief. But Mooney was a man of his word, and if he said he'd cook them a dinner, he would. They'd enjoyed his meat-filled red gravies on special occasions over the years, but he'd never prepared a full dinner. Mooney the cook. It seemed a contradiction. But he was full of those. He was a macho, swaggering smarthead, who worked over a stove as readily as any woman. He was a man who, since he was just a boy, had learned to kill at another's bidding. And although one didn't talk of such things, it was common knowledge among girls of the patch that Mooney was a man who, since he could first get it up, got it off banging fast Mick and Pollock girls in the back seat of a car. The same man who swore he would only marry an Italian virgin. He leaned back in his chair and lit a cigarette. Dragging deeply, he smiled, making his thin lips curl around it in a crooked, half-cocked grin. He unbuttoned his shirt collar and loosened his wide silk tie and said in his most flattering tone, Josie, you're the best ironer in the neighborhood. He fingered the heavily starched collar and added, Matter of fact, I brought some shirts over for you to iron. He waved to a pile of laundry containing several dozen shirts. He was feeling the warmth of the wine and seemed approachable, more talkative than usual, almost friendly. I'll need them tomorrow, he said as an afterthought, and, fishing into his trouser pocket, brought out a wad of bills. See, Pa, your son is doing pretty well for himself, don't you think? He fanned hundred-dollar bills like a hand of cards. His four sisters nudged each other under the table. They hadn't seen so much money in one place. Chuck saw Antoinette put her hand to her swollen jaw. He wondered whether Mooney knew about her toothache. Antonio grunted and said in Italian, Well, if I ever open my store again and my ice sells well, 
Your father will have more money than that some day. Chuck rolled his eyes at his brother Pepe. Their father always had a scheme, and it never worked out. Although he had to admit this time it might. The whole neighborhood seemed to mourn the demise of his father's lemon ice store. Maybe he thought, maybe this time, Pa is right, and we will be rich. Mooney flipped through the bills with his thumb, and then easing them back into his pants pocket, stood up. With a glass of wine in one hand, he walked across the room. The twenty-year-old had a way of commanding attention. There was a self-assurance in his stride that surpassed his years, and it let you know he was a man to be reckoned with. Around the patch, people said that Diamond Joe himself had once remarked admiringly to Capone, "'Mooney has the biggest colione balls I've ever goddamn seen. He'd kill his own fucking father if he got in his way.' Ironic given Esposito's demise. Even here at home, as he sunk down into the comfort of Antonio's velvet easy chair, he never let up. He was in total and absolute control. He followed the chair's fabric, as if it were a woman's breast, admiring its sensuous luster. He appreciated the finer things, and thanks to his extraordinary skill as a burglar, the Giancana household was graced with exquisite Venetian tapestries on the walls, marble-topped mahogany tables, and the neighborhood's first refrigerator, trappings of wealth that, in spite of his efforts, did little to hide their poverty, and nothing to alleviate it. Pa, come here, he commanded. I need to speak to you, in private. Chuck was envious of the way Mooney managed their father. In spite of everything, the calls from the police station, the bail money that kept them poor, the fear and intimidation— it looked to all the world as if the old man clearly worshipped his eldest son. But for Antonio, it was just a matter of acknowledging the obvious. Though Mooney might be on the wrong side of the law, no one could deny he was doing well for himself. And that made him feel a certain pride. In a time when everyone else groveled for nickels, his son drove a fast car, swaggered around in well-tailored expensive suits, and carried bankrolls that might contain as much as five hundred dollars, no matter he never shared the wealth with him. After all, he was just a small-time vendor who wore clothes decorated with a quilt work of neatly executed patches. Antonio's entire life savings were less than one hundred dollars. What little luxury he had, he was convinced he had because of Mooney. Not yet finished eating his pasta, Antonio sighed wistfully and pushed his plate away to rise from the table. If Momo wanted his undivided attention, the pasta would have to wait. Hours later, and sound asleep, Chuck, Pepe, and their cousins were awakened by Mooney, standing in the middle of the room. His glazed eyes darted wildly back and forth. "'Get up, you thieving little bastards!' he shrieked, ripping the covers off the bed. "'What's the matter, Mooney? What is it? We didn't do nothing. Honest!' Chuck begged. He was afraid of him when he was like this. There was no telling what he might do to them. The boys all began to wail. "'All right, you goddamned ungrateful little punks. Who did it?' Who took my fucking money? Mooney swung at Chuck, who was nearest, knocking him from the bed with his fist. I'll teach you a thing or two about stealing. All of you get out of bed now, he said, yanking Chuck up by the hair with a force that lifted him off the floor. He slapped Chuck square across the face before he could raise his hands to shield himself. Chuck let out a long, shrill cry. Mooney turned on Pepe next, releasing his grip on Chuck's black curls, which twisted like knotted yarn around his fingers. The small boy crashed to the floor. So, who did it? Mooney bellowed. You? He screamed at Pepe. You? You? He spun around, accusing each boy in turn. The room grew eerily still. Chucky, Vito, and Joey stood along the wall, shaking their heads fearfully, not taking their eyes off Chuck as he writhed on the floor. Fine. None of you have the balls to admit it, he sneered and took off his belt. I'll give you one last chance. He waved the belt like a whip above his head. Still on the floor, Chuck began to cry again more loudly. Mooney reeled on his heels, towering above him. No, Mooney, no, Chuck pleaded. I wouldn't take your money. I would never do that. I promise. Honest, I do. Please don't, Mooney, please. The belt sliced through the air with a cutting hiss. It came down again and again. Chuck's body began to shudder involuntarily. The air seemed thick and full of blood. He could taste it when the belt sliced through his lip. His rib cage heaved, and he thought he might vomit. The salt of the blood and bile in his mouth made him gag. 
Like a machine, Mooney moved around the room, dispensing his punishment methodically and with precision, until each boy felt the full force of his rage and understood the terror it could bring. Breathing heavily, he let the belt drop to the floor and said, So no one's talking. Fine. Then take off your clothes, all of you. The boy stood immobilized. Now! I said now! He repeated the command, smiling cruelly. Chuck's hand shook so hard he could barely pull his nightshirt over his head. He couldn't imagine what Mooney was planning to do to them, and he wished, desperately, that whoever took the money would come forward. The unfairness of it all stung worse than any slashing belt or strap. He hated Mooney, hated him more than he'd ever hated anyone or anything. Mooney leaned against the wall and lit a cigarette. Now we're going to play a little game. I'm going to take each one of you, one by one, into the bathroom. Then we'll see if you decide to tell the truth. As promised, each boy was dragged, alone, into the bathroom. There Mooney threw his young victim in the tub, and wielding a broken broom handle, pummeled him under a torrent of icy water. Never fucking steal from me, he screamed with each blow. Again and again, the wooden club came down, until the water ran red and screams could be heard up and down the darkened hallway. Antonio and the other family members heard them, but did nothing, staying in bed, as much out of fear as resignation. Not one of the boys admitted to stealing his money, and when Mooney grew too tired to beat them any more, he kicked them, shivering and crying and dripping wet with water and blood, with his stylishly sharp pointed toe shoes all the way back into bed. No one ever came forward to confess the theft, but Chuck overheard Antoinette tell their father that Cousin Vito had taken the money and given it to Catherine. Whether the story was true or not, Chuck never knew, but he did notice when his stepmother slipped on a new coat and hat. His father said nothing to his wife or to his eldest son. The following week, as the family sat around the table toasting Mooney's culinary talents, it was as if the incident had never occurred. His brother must have forgotten, Chuck thought to himself, gingerly stroking the bruises hidden beneath his shirt. But how could he forget something like that, something so horrible? It didn't make much sense. But then a lot of things Mooney did didn't make sense, like the times he'd spot Chuck walking home from the YMCA over on Monroe and Ashland. He'd pull up in his car, fat Leonard Caifano at his side, and open the door. Come on, he'd say with a smile. Get in. They'd spin off down the street toward Jaime's men's store, and Chuck would be trotted in for a new suit of clothes. Mooney would examine him, with pride, spinning him around in front of the gilded full-length mirror. Looks pretty sharp, don't you think? he'd ask Fat Leonard. Each time Fat Leonard would agree, and they'd shuffle him back into the car for a trip to a soda shop. The next day, Chuck would strut off to school, flaunting his new shirt and pants or sweater, and the other boys would admire them with unconcealed envy. Wish I had a brother like yours, they'd say longingly, as they tugged at pants too short and gazed down at shoes too tight. So how could he not love Mooney? Chuck thought, looking across the table at his big brother carving the roast like some ritzy chef. It was the first meat they'd had in weeks. Mooney loved him and his brothers and sisters and showed it. So what if sometimes things got out of hand? Chuck reprimanded himself for being so mad at his brother. He'd try harder to be good. That's what was wrong. He'd brought his brother's anger on himself. He'd tell the line and make him proud from now on. As 1928 came to a close, Mooney's adventures, many unaffiliated with Capone's gang, grew bolder and more numerous. He was in and out of jail more times than his father could count, charged with everything from gang rape and burglary to suspicion of murder. As in the Girard case, witnesses against Mooney always developed amnesia and disappeared, to be found later living in another state, or dead. When the charges were more trivial in nature, such as theft or petty extortion, the arresting officer and station captain simply received a monetary gift in exchange for letting him off the hook. Without Esposito's financial backing, the task of coming up with money for bonds and bribes fell to Antonio. His son might be affiliated with Capone, but so were many other punks from the patch. That status didn't entitle hot-headed soldiers like Mooney to gain financial assistance every time they had a personal scrape with the law. The cost of keeping his son out of jail continued to escalate. What little money Antonio's fruit and vegetable business earned 
was quickly spent down at the station house, stretching the old peddler to the breaking point. If need be, he would borrow the money, forcing the entire family to go without meat or bread or some other necessity of life for weeks on end. Yet despite this hardship, Antonio never asked Mooney for a dime. Stolen goods, ranging from plump turkeys at Christmas to the latest women's fashions, continued to be carted into the John Cana household in January of 1929. Mooney used them to control his father and the children, providing their survival, making them dependent on his crimes for signs of affection, and fearful of the consequences of his rejection. Deep down, they'd all come to believe that without him, they'd be lost. Antonio's righteous indignation from the previous year's lemon ice store bombing dwindled to nothing but a memory. Mooney's nightly car chases, gunfights, and robberies, as wheelman for Capone's Jack McGurn, made good telling among the boys who hung out on Taylor Street on cold winter afternoons. It was no surprise to them that, when the murders of February 14, 1929, made headlines, Mooney and his friend Needles were picked up by the coppers for questioning. As a known driver for the Capone gang, and one closely tied to McGurn, the suspected mastermind of the murders, Mooney was one of the first taken down to the station house. But he wasn't there long. Back home, and none the worse for his interrogation, Mooney lounged victoriously in the comfort of the velvet easy chair, perusing the paper with obvious pleasure. The gruesome photos of what Chicago was calling the worst gangland slang in history, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, were splashed across the front page. He looked up and winked devilishly at Chuck, still seated at the dinner table with the rest of the family. Grinning, he tapped the paper with the back of his hand and called over, Hey, Pa! Capone and McGurn must have had one hell of a gang to pull this off. Antonio didn't reply, but simply shook his head and poured another glass of wine. Mooney's behavior would have been inappropriate for a more mature gangster, but there was a novelty to what he was doing that hadn't yet worn off. And besides, he had good reason to gloat. It had been a job well done, and what would earn the respect of those men he needed to reach if he was ever to rise in power. Like McGurn said, a good wheelman is hard to find, but a good wheelman with the smarts and guts to kill without question is a gold mine. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre put everything neatly in place for Capone and fixed his position as undisputed boss of Chicago. Under McGurn's direction, Mooney and Needles had donned officers' uniforms and joined Fred Burke, who acted as wheelman, along with the duo of Alberto Anselmi and John Scalise. But as high as he'd been in February, by the time March rolled around, Mooney was facing another rap. This time it quickly became apparent the neighborhood would be losing its most feared protector, and that likewise the Capone gang would be losing what people said was the best wheelman and hitman they'd ever had. The fact was Mooney had run into the law once too often, and this was one case, given his publicity, he couldn't fix. For a rather inglorious burglary, Sam Mooney Giancana was sentenced to three to five years at the Joliet State Pen. The Giancana family wouldn't have to put up with the eldest son's snarling domination, seesaw emotions, and frequent scrapes with the law much longer, nor would they be receiving the counterbalancing perks just days before Mooney was to surrender to the authorities for his stay in Joliet, Chuck tiptoed to Antonio's bedroom and cautiously peeked in. Mooney was alone and had his back turned to the door. He was looking out the window. The first street light flickered in the encroaching nightfall, its light reflected on the room's flaking plaster walls, dabbling the cracks and fissures in a finger paint of shadows. Sighing, Mooney pulled a pack of camels from his shirt pocket and drew one cigarette out, tapping it on the window casing. He fumbled in his pocket for a match and struck it on the peeling sill. It flamed in the darkness. Catching sight of Chuck's silhouette in the doorway, he blew out the match. What do you want? he asked, in a tone that sounded more tired than gruff. Chuck shrugged his shoulders and stuck his hands deep into his pockets. Looking down at the floor, he replied, Nothing? I don't know. Nothing? Sounds pretty damn strange to me. Chuck saw a slight smile play across Mooney's face as he continued. So what do you want? He took another drag off his cigarette and leaned against the wall, waiting for a response. Chuck came closer, hoping to assess Mooney's demeanor. In the darkness, he could make out the chiseled profile, the large nose shadowing thin lips. 
He searched for signs of annoyance, but his brother's features seemed unusually softened, and he felt it safe to continue. Mooney, what are we going to do without you? Do you have to go? Do you? As Chuck spoke, Mooney stared at the floor. After a few moments, he looked up, though his head didn't move. His dark eyes solemnly examined him. Chuck felt his chin tremble. Hey, there's nothing to cry about. It'll all be fine. I'll be back before you know it. When? Well, soon. Real soon. I don't plan on staying away any fucking longer than I have to. Believe me, Joliet's no Garden of Eden. He turned to face the window once more. But Mooney... Yeah, he said over his shoulder. Mooney, how's the neighborhood going to be with you gone? Shit, Chuck. Everything's going to be fine. He sat down on the side of the bed. Come here and listen to me. Chuck sat down next to him. Okay, just remember something about your big brother. I can take care of anything that gets in the way, anything that gets in your way or Pa's way, anything. You understand? Uh-huh. You know why that is, Chuck? Do you? Chuck shook his head. It's real simple. People listen to you when you're a man to respect, a man of honor. Anybody that crosses Mooney Junkana is gonna fucking pay, and pay good. The people around here know that. They know my reputation. Don't ever forget that I'm the justice of the peace. That means I know how to make things go smooth, real nice and peaceful, like they should. I know how to keep the peace, Chuck. You understand? And I know what to do when somebody steps out of line, and I don't mess around. I do it. It's called justice, Chuck, and it takes guts. You gotta know how to handle people to get along in this world. He cupped Chuck's face in one hand and lifted his chin, pulling him close, lowering his voice as if he knew some momentous secret that he was about to share. Listen, listen real good. If people do what I want, we'll take care of them. If they don't, well, we'll take care of that, too. You don't ever have to worry about that. It doesn't matter if I'm in jail or not. I'll know what's going on, here at home and in the neighborhood. It doesn't matter where I am. I can make things happen. People respect that, Chuck. And they'll do whatever it takes to make you happy when they respect you. They know, without any question, they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I mean business. His hand fell from Chuck's face, and he began tearing at the pack of camels to retrieve a lone cigarette. When he lighted it, the light made his face look sad. He turned away and said huskily, Now go on and get the hell out of here. Chapter 5 Winter in Chicago was always bitter cold. Maybe it was the wind, or maybe back then, during the Depression, things just seemed colder. In any case, for the Giancana family, the winter of 1932 was no exception. A metal gray sky pressed on in the patch that year like a foundry worker's hand, holding the smog and fumes that regurgitated from the smelters and Model A's down on the red brick tenements. The barnyard's sense of fresh hay and horse manure steaming in the icy ruts along Taylor Street combined with freshly roasted chestnuts to create an earthy, sweet aroma. In spite of their increasingly desperate poverty, people of the neighborhood maintained their joviality, perhaps the Neapolitans better than the Sicilians, but both understood hardship and both recognized the effectiveness of simply enduring. They were a social people who could scarcely stand to be isolated inside during the winter months, so they gathered on the street corners and stoops, rebelling against the cold by bundling themselves and their children in a rainbow of ragtag coats and capes, Occasionally a good joke led to a round of laughter that pierced the street's harangue of honking horns, trolley cars, and yelling vendors like a welcome footstep on dry, crunchy snow. But it was bleak without end. The only relief from the oppressive skies came when it rained freezing cold drops as big as Christmas pears. They formed great puddles and then froze, evoking cautious, icy perils for the older folk, who crept along the sidewalks balancing sausages and cheese. Chuck and the other children, however, loved the slippery stuff, merrily pushing and pulling one another in orange crates across its glassy veneer. Indoors, the men drank a bit more wine than usual, and the women spent more time darning old socks and mending tattered clothes. Some fell in love. 
Angeline de Tolve had fallen in love herself, a sturdy, broad-shouldered girl from a family better off than most. She had a ready smile, classical profile, and wide-set eyes and hips. Considered both pretty and well-bred, she fit precisely Mooney John Connor's idea of the kind of woman a man should marry. Although she'd been somewhat attracted to Mooney before he was sent off to Joliet, much to her father's relief and satisfaction, she hadn't fallen in love with him. You see, Francesco Antonio de Tolve had declared, I told you Mooney Giancana's nothing but a low-down, no-good bum. No convict will ever have my daughter's hand. I'd sooner die. Mamma mia, the disgrace such a thing would bring. Happily for her father, Angeline had instead fallen for a guy named Salvatore Sali. Nobody knew too much about him, except Mooney and those engaged in activities of Chicago's underworld. He knew all about the punk. Solly was a truck driver by day and jewel thief by night. He fenced his wares through some of the syndicate's soldiers over on the north side. From his prison cell, Mooney kept abreast of Solly's comings and goings, as well as the blossoming love affair. Before Mooney was released on Christmas Eve of 1932, news of Angeline's engagement reached him, and his heart went as cold as the bars outside his window. He recalled how Diamond Joe had managed to get his bride. Esposito simply had a couple of guys knock off her fiancé so the old padrone could have her for himself. And sure enough, not long after Diamond Joe's men took the guy for a ride out to the railroad tracks, Esposito married the fifteen-year-old girl. Mooney made up his mind that the lovers would never be joined. No matter what the cost, no matter that he had another girl waiting for him back in the patch, Angeline de Tolve would be his. On New Year's Eve, only those brave enough to drive inched nervously down Chicago's roadways. Blasts of wind whistled around the corners, freezing the tattered shop awnings along Maxwell Street into stiffened submission. Cars creaked slowly through the streets like old arthritic men, their fenders prematurely grayed by soot and salt and cinders. Earlier the roads had been wet and mushy, but now they were frozen into nasty chuckles of ice and were glazed and treacherous. Occasionally one of the more faint-hearted hit his brakes, sending the car reeling against the embankments like a punch-drunk fighter. In the twilight a solitary black Ford came up on Solly's rear. It honked aggressively, and startled, Solly jumped. Stupido, he yelled at the window, shaking his fist in the air. The headlights behind him flashed off and on. In response, he swerved to the right, and his car went slightly out of control, fishtailing to the left and right and back again. Like a shadow, the other vehicle mimicked his motions with amazing control, and then moved up, pulling alongside. Solly strained to see the other driver, but suddenly realizing the road took a curve, he slammed on the brakes. His car began a frenzied skate across the icy pavement, and in seconds it was over. The Ford slowed to confirm he was dying within the wreckage, and then quietly evaporated into the night. Mooney waited until March of 1933, which he considered a reasonable period of time, before going by the de Tolves to pay his respects. There he found a woman grieving for herself as much as for her dead lover, a woman mourning the loss of her future and her dreams. Clearly she was devastated. Chuck's sisters, like other girls in the patch, heard the local wags talk of how poor Angeline de Tolve sat alone for hours in her room, staring at Solly's picture. She refused to see anyone, and cried until her parents didn't think there could be any tears left. But then, at the mention or thought of some forgotten memory, she would find still more pain buried in yet another hidden reservoir. Her grief didn't abandon her. When Mooney visited that spring, the emptiness was as fresh as the winter's recent graves. At twenty-three and unmarried in 1933, a woman was considered on her way to spinsterhood. For Angeline, there seemed little hope for happiness. Her life had been shattered by what everyone, including the police, called a senseless accident. There was nothing left. This, Mooney set out to change. She was desperate, and he used that desperation to his advantage. He had a gift when it came to reading other people, becoming increasingly astute as he matured. He accurately evaluated Angeline's vulnerability and was cognizant of how she brightened at even the tiniest compliment. His attentions were nourishment to the emotionally starved woman, and realizing this, he increased his efforts to make her feel pretty and desirable again. 
By early summer, Angeline sat in front of her mirror, adjusting a ribbon in her hair, looking forward to a visit from Mooney. She began to see that he might provide a way out, an alternative to the cloistered life of spinsterhood she imagined loomed in her future. He gave her more than presents. He gave her a new beginning. And he made her smile. To her friends, Angeline said she'd fallen in love. To his, Mooney smugly said she had fallen. In spite of the fact that their daughter's sorrow lifted in Giancana's presence, the de Tolves found acceptance of the hoodlum, now an ex-con, more difficult than ever. For Mooney, it was a challenge he relished, going so far as to command his father to visit the de Tolves in late July. Antonio took Lena as another representative of the Giancana brood. It was Mooney's idea to let Mr. de Tolve see that Angeline would be marrying into a hard-working, humble family, whose only crime, as Antonio put it, is that our eldest boy has made good. The de Tolves admitted that Mooney Giancana was the first person to come along since Solly, who seemed to make Angeline happy. He brought her flowers and pretty little trinkets almost daily, and the young man did have an uncanny knack for laying his hands on money. A businessman himself... Francesco Antonio de Tolve told Antonio he liked that about Mooney. No matter where it came from, he half-heartedly agreed to give his daughter's hand in marriage. As doting as Mooney was during his courtship, and continued to be throughout the remainder of that summer after their engagement, it didn't escape Angeline. He was rumored to be seeing someone else, the same fast girl who'd waited for him to get out of prison, Marie Finelli. Angeline told her friends it was all an ugly rumor. The idea of a betrayal so early in their relationship was probably more than she could bear to consider. Mooney was skilled at portraying whatever emotions suited his purpose, and was so sincere in his affections that it would have been hard for any woman, let alone one like Angeline, who was on the rebound, to believe he wasn't the man he presented in the polite confines of her father's parlor. She defended him to her friends— Perhaps in the past he'd sought out the companionship of loose girls. That was normal. All young men did. But seeing someone else, now at this time in his life, she refused to discuss it. Angeline had been correct in her assessment of Mooney's relationship with Marie. He didn't love her, nor would he have ever wanted to marry her. Marie didn't fit his idea of the marrying type. All he wanted from her was physical release. And when Marie wasn't available for a little action... He stopped by Michigan at 22nd, as he told Chuck, to have one of the good-looking whores cock his joint. Mooney had a peculiar way of compartmentalizing his life, explaining to Chuck on a muggy summer afternoon in August why he was marrying Angeline. A man's gotta marry a virgin, not a slut. You don't care how good a wife is in bed. You can fucking buy that. You want a woman who's well-bred for your wife. Remember, she's gonna be the mother to your children. So you want a woman who knows how to behave one who looks halfway decent and won't embarrass you in front of the guys or out on the town in some swank joint. And if she doesn't look so good, well, you can dress her up real nice in a mink and some pearls and diamonds to give her style. Money can give any woman class. He nodded knowingly. Now remember what I'm telling you. Banging is different, Chuck. A woman who loves to bang. Well, that kind of woman is trouble when it comes to being a wife. Anyhow, nobody said a man can't fuck more than one woman. Capiche? Carnal pleasure, the kind Mooney reveled in, and the word wife just weren't appropriate together. They were never used in the same sentence and rarely found in the same bed. As Chuck saw it, Angeline de Tolve would definitely make a good wife, but Marie, from what Mooney said, was good for banging, even if she did have a mouth like a dock worker. People said she was beautiful, but everybody called her a tramp. Riding in the back seat of Mooney's car, less than a month before his brother's wedding date in September, Chuck listened to Mooney describe Marie to Fat Leonard as the best fuck this side of the Mississippi. Mooney laughed his gleeful laugh, the one he used when he beat somebody at poker, and went on to tell them how, after respectfully leaving barely the whisper of a kiss on the pristine cheek of his wife-to-be, he'd rush back to spend the rest of the night steaming up the back seat of a car with Marie. Over the next weeks, before going by the de Tolves to see Angeline, Mooney continued to take Marie to the family's flat for an afternoon in Antonio's bed. One visit in particular stuck in Chuck's mind, probably because it was so close to the wedding, and Chuck had wondered then whether Mooney really loved Angeline, at least with the same passion Chuck saw in the movies. 
He watched the door to his father's bedroom close and heard the two laugh, locking it behind them. His sisters simply shook their heads, going about their daily cleaning, and prepared to change the sheets on their father's bed before he returned home for the evening. Chuck could hear the iron bed heave and creak with the weight of their bodies as they fought to breathe, gasping and clawing. A distinct squeaking came from the bedroom, and his sisters paused in their relentless scrubbing. Chuck sat down at the table, pretending to read a tattered newspaper he'd scrounged from the alley's garbage. When the obscene sounds began, he glanced up. His sisters were on their hands and knees, poised to obliterate some imaginary stain. Now distracted, they let their scrub brushes drip soapy water into iridescent bubbles on the floor as they listened intently to the slow, purposeful squeak, 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 signifying each deep thrust of the two lovers. Antoinette caught her breath and put her brush to the floor, kneading it back and forth in unconscious rhythm. The other girls followed her example. The squeaking sounds came closer together. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Squeak, 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 squeak. Their brushes moved faster up and down each plank, and methodically the tempo of their scrubbing increased in harmony with the lovers. Chuck heard Mooney groan, and Marie cry out in ecstasy. Yes, yes, please, Mooney, please! Chuck felt his face turn hot. The flat became still, and Chuck's heart was pounding. He could hear his sister's labored breathing. They sat trembling with their brushes, faces flushed and perspiration gleaming down their necks. All done, announced Antoinette, and they rose from the floor, carrying the clanking buckets and brushes to the kitchen. Certainly a woman of Angeline's impeccable reputation would not have stooped to please Mooney the way Marie did, so shamelessly, so readily. That's what Chuck's sister said, anyway. But after Angeline and Mooney were married in a small ceremony in her family's home on September 23, 1933, it became clear to Chuck that Mooney had a definite vision of what marriage would entail, and fidelity wasn't on the list. His brother didn't stop seeing Marie. He just seemed to think that his adultery should be discreet, that a good husband would avoid humiliating his wife at all costs. And should he be caught in an indiscretion, he made sure that Angeline would think long and hard before leaving him. Such a feat, he bragged to Chuck, was accomplished by providing one's wife with every possible material convenience and comfort. It didn't hurt that Angeline was a devout Catholic, and that his cronies knew better under the threat of death than to breathe a word about his philandering habits. Nor did he underestimate the effect pride and a woman's friends could have, and he used them to his advantage setting out to make Angeline the envy of all. From the beginning, Angeline, Ange, as Mooney called her, had a maid. He moved her to a pleasant, spacious apartment over on the west side and told her to furnish it as she pleased, with all the finer luxuries. To friends and family members, their standard of living was enviable, impressive, if in truth somewhat modest at first. But they had money in their pockets, beautiful, expensive clothes, jewelry to wear, and tasteful decor. Mooney brought home fine paintings and oriental rugs. Ange began collecting such unheard-of amenities as porcelain, crystal, and sterling silver, which she proudly displayed while entertaining friends. It worked nicely. The men went outside to sip their scotch and talk syndicate business, while the women held lengthy discussions about children and the latest fashions over a game of gin rummy. But whatever three-dimensional quality there was to the young couple's lives was an illusion. Angeline knew her husband continued to see Marie, as well as pay for pleasure at the local brothel, and Chuck's sisters said the infidelity deeply wounded her. As soon as he was married, Mooney started bringing Chuck over to spend the night, explaining to Ange that he was getting older. Chuck was eleven now, and needed a man around who wasn't afraid to use the strap. Chuck believed Mooney was genuinely worried that he might get in trouble, and that he somehow planned to prevent that by keeping him busy and off the streets. Mooney wasn't concerned, however, about the moral fiber of the rest of his family. Pepe, he said, was a good kid and would never get in trouble. As for his sisters, who were fast becoming spinsters, he forbade them to leave their flat except in pursuit of such acceptable womanly duties as selecting cleaning powders at the market. You know better than to let me catch you going out with some two-bit hustlers. I'll kill them, and I'd better never see you dolled up in lipstick and brassieres like a fucking slut. 
he threatened. He didn't expect any problems from them. But Chuck's upbringing, as he explained to Ange, was another story. I need to watch him like a hawk, and besides, he can help around the house and keep you company when I'm gone on business. Mooney charged Angeline with the task of instructing the boy in the finer points of well-bred behavior. Here was an opportunity for his little brother to gain some class, to learn which fork to use at the table. In spite of Mooney's thinly veiled intentions, Chuck loved his visits to his brother in Ange's home that fall in 1933. There was always more food than he could eat at one sitting, and he could sleep alone without the prodding knees and elbows. At Mooney's house it was as if he'd died and gone to heaven, and he didn't mind helping his brother's wife. He truly liked Ange. She was pretty, and he thought nice, even if she didn't understand men. But most of all, he treasured the time he had with Mooney. Ange and Mooney were like a king and queen to people in the neighborhood. In December, with just a few days until Christmas, some of the little kids in the patch caught sight of Mooney and Ange bringing Chuck home in their sleek new car. They rushed at them like beggars. Can we help you, Mrs. Mooney? one asked. Do you need something, Mr. Mooney? said another. Mooney reached into the pocket of his double-breasted coat to retrieve a tightly wrapped wad of cash and handed them dollar bills as he shook his head. No, he said as he climbed behind the wheel of his shiny roadster. Just give it to your mama for some Christmas turkey. With that, Mooney and Angeline spun off down Taylor Street, leaving Chuck standing once again in the old, familiar world of poverty and hunger. He hated coming back to the neighborhood, but seeing the way other people, both children and adults, fawned over Mooney made him proud. By New Year, things had gotten so bad at Antonio's home that many times they'd each just have a potato and a handful of beans for dinner. The comparisons seemed to make Chuck's life in the patch even more intolerable, and he couldn't understand why his father didn't do something about it. He couldn't help but compare him to Mooney. In Chuck's eyes, Antonio would never measure up. Despite the unspoken conflict early in their marriage, Ange and Mooney were popularly perceived as the picture-perfect postcard of a stand-up guy and doll. By mid-1934, the only thing that appeared missing was children, and Mooney didn't intend to be childless. There was a man's virility to confirm. Because of a heart condition caused by rheumatic fever as a child, doctors warned Angeline that pregnancy could be difficult, if not dangerous, both for herself and a baby. But her traditional views on childbearing and the insistent amorous encouragement from Mooney won out. She became pregnant before Christmas of 1934, and in June of 1935 gave birth prematurely to a three-pound baby girl. They named the frail infant Annette. After Ange and the baby came home, Mooney brought Chuck over to see little Annette. Looking at the tiny face nestled in Ange's arms, Chuck felt old for the first time. He would be thirteen soon, not a man by any means, though he desperately wanted to be, but seeing the sleeping baby made him realize he wasn't a little kid any more, either. The days of rubber-band guns, orange crate wagons, and tin cans on his heels had ceased to amuse him. Ange and Mooney celebrated their second anniversary by going out in the town in September of 1935. Had there been a contest among Italians, the Giancanas would have been voted most beautiful couple. Wherever they went, they made quite a splash. Considered the perfect pair, Ange and Mooney were stylish and fun. But little by little, in the harsh daylight of ordinary life, Chuck began to notice that they weren't like other couples he knew. They laughed, but it was strained sometimes, hollow in a way. If her husband made it, she would spend it, he overheard Ange say angrily on the phone one day. I'll spend so much there won't be a dime left for him to spend on that tramp. He was sure she meant Marie. For a while, Chuck thought about what Ange had said, and it bothered him. Mooney had said that was the way men were supposed to be. He'd said it was different for them than for women. Sure, Ange had been sheltered by her parents, but his sister-in-law would have to come to grips with the real world if she was going to survive being married to someone as important as Mooney. Driving him home one night and mad as hell over something Ange had said, Mooney put it best, Chuck thought. Ange needs to learn what her place is and fucking stay there. When Christmas came in 1935, even the beautiful tree standing in the corner of Mooney's living room, twinkling and sparkling, didn't seem to have the same magic it once would have had. The only thing Chuck looked forward to was the holiday food, 
Enough ravioli to feed an army, they'd say at home in the neighborhood. He couldn't understand why Mooney and Ange didn't invite them over for Christmas. It was so much nicer at their house, and secretly he hoped they would surprise them all with an invitation. But the holiday came and went without one, and he spent it sulking in the patch. He really didn't know how it came up, but all of a sudden, one cold winter afternoon in January of 1936, Mooney began discussing politics. Everybody thought FDR was the finest man ever elected to the presidency, and although just a boy, Chuck was no exception. Yeah, he's the perfect president, all right. He's on our side, Mooney smiled knowingly. On our side? The gangs, Chuck. The gangs. Oh, he replied still not understanding the full implications of Mooney's comment. If he wasn't, he'd be dead, like Sir Mac, like Huey Long. Plain and simple, we'd take him out. Chuck was incredulous, and yet pleased to be included in such an adult conversation. He wanted to act as if he'd been around, and he thought Mooney was pulling his leg. No, come on, Mooney, you're kidding me, aren't you? No, I'm not kidding, Jesus, Mooney snapped impatiently. Read a little. Long. He was the senator from down south in Louisiana. The guy was on the take for years. Some of our friends in New York had him hit. Worked it out with a New Orleans boss. They figured it out so it would look like a loony did it. All the papers picked it up. He laughed and then, a moment later, turned serious. You know, Chuck, you'd think people would catch on. He shook his head in amazement. Picking a nutcase, who was also a sharpshooter and in debt up to his eyeballs, to take the fall for a political assassination was as old as the Sicilian Hills, according to Mooney, who used the examples of Huey Long and Anton Cermak to prove his point. Anton Cermak had been mayor of Chicago and a Capone rival, a real double-crosser, Mooney said. For years he'd waged war against Capone on behalf of another mobster, a rival named Teddy Newberry. After an unsuccessful attempt on the life of Capone enforcer Frank Nitty by Cermak Henchman in 1932, Paul Riga, Capone's successor, turned the tables, killing Newberry. Rightfully fearing for his life, Sir Mac fled to Florida in December of 1932. In further retaliation, Riga enlisted what Mooney called a real patsy, a guy named Joe Zangara, to eliminate Sir Mac. Thirty-three-year-old Zangara had been sponsored by Diamond Joe Esposito from Sicily just five years before, and was placed in Florida to work the sugar runs from Cuba, a sharpshooter in the Italian army and a heavy gambler, Zangara was deeply in debt and in real trouble with his Chicago bosses. He was given a choice, hit Sir Mac or die. On February 15, 1933, while riding in an open car with President-elect Roosevelt in Miami, Sir Mac was shot and Zangara was quickly apprehended by the authorities. He immediately began spouting anti-capitalist political pabulum claiming he had missed his real target, FDR. But in fact, Mooney said his political rantings were a carefully devised smokescreen. Zangara had no connection to communism or fascism, but was actually a goddamned registered Republican. Zangara's connections were to the Chicago syndicate, something that escaped the attention of the press and was covered up by the paid-off coppers and investigators. Three weeks later, Sir Mac died, and as had been planned all along, Zangara was convicted of murder and sent to the electric chair. Nice and neat, Mooney grinned. Nice and neat. Quizzed about Huey Long, Mooney told Chuck that for years the senator had worked closely with the syndicate on everything from slot machines to casinos, becoming partners with Carlos Marcello in New Orleans, Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, and Meyer Lansky in New York, Santo Traficante in Florida, and Paul Rica in Chicago. But by 1935, Long had gotten out of hand, and another loony assassin was located. Unlike Sir Mac, Long was no turncoat traitor. He simply became too greedy, demanding over $3 million a year in payoffs from his friends. He was cutting into profits. Greed killed Huey Long, Mooney insisted. It'll get you every time. Always remember, any profit is a good profit, and always leave something for the other guy. That's what Long forgot. Chuck would remember that afternoon for the rest of his life. It marked the beginning of a new relationship with his brother. He was no longer a child in Mooney's eyes. Over the past years, New York had had its own share of double crosses. Mooney said half the guys there were crazy. 
It's not at all like Chicago, he explained with no small amount of pride in his voice. Here we got control, under one boss. We're organized. In New York, they've been backstabbing and killing each other for years. Indeed, the gang wars had raged on in New York until Lucky Luciano seized power in 1931. But even Luciano's reign was cut short when, just five years later, he was arrested on charges of compulsory prostitution. In a case spearheaded by vengeful special prosecutor Thomas Dewey, Luciano was found guilty on 90 counts of direction of harlotry and extortion. With Luciano's sentence of 30 to 50 years in Clinton State Penitentiary, Frank Costello, a man with whom Mooney would someday collaborate, took control. By spring's first thaw in 1936, while other boys his age were still in knickers and playing jerk-off games, Chuck decided to leave such childish trappings and behavior behind forever. When he wasn't at Mooney's or on the corner selling the season's first tomatoes for his father, he looked at girls. On Saturdays, he hopped the bumper of some rich sap's car and went up on California and Roosevelt to Douglas Park. There he'd sit in the shade of the massive oaks all afternoon, catching the scent of fresh pine. The air smelled different in the park's wooded lawns, clean and clear, and the sounds weren't those of boisterous, argumentative vendors or swearing, dissatisfied customers, but of squeaky little sparrows and fat, chattering squirrels. He liked to watch the young men in their starched white shirts, hair neatly pomaded beneath straw hats, as they paddled across the lake in canoes, carrying pretty girls with Carol Lombard bobs. Much to his friend's dismay, Chuck even stopped entertaining the neighborhood with his crazy acrobatics, swinging from electric wires, jumping from stoops and second-story rooftops. "'Don't you know shit like that's for kids?' he exclaimed in exasperation to his puzzled friends. It wasn't that he'd suddenly lost his guts. In fact, he'd become more daring. But the childhood thrills were gone. The only people that still put the scare in Chuck were his brother Mooney and the big Irish coppers. Both were as constant as ever. The beatings from his brother hadn't ended, and the police hadn't gotten any smaller as he'd grown larger. It baffled him that one of the worst coppers around wasn't even a mick. His name was Frank Pape, no relation to Mooney's cohort Joe Pape. An Italian from the neighborhood, Frank Pape had joined the force in 1933, and over the previous three years had managed to make quite a name for himself. He didn't screw with Mooney, though, and on one of his increasingly frequent rides with his brother that spring, Chuck had an opportunity to see Mooney in action. It was almost dinner time, and they were driving down Ashland in a Ford souped up for getaways, when Mooney spotted Pape rounding a corner. Let's have some fun, he said to Chuck and Fat Leonard as he whipped the corner in pursuit. Cut in front of him, Leonard said, laughing. Dare him, Mooney! Just dare that son of a bitch to try to outrun us. In this car, the poor bastard don't stand a chance. That'll get under his fucking skin real good. He looked back at Chuck. Having fun? Chuck nodded and said nothing as his brother pulled up behind the police car, honking and yelling out his window. Hey, Pape! Hey, you goddamn traitor greaseball! Hey, asshole! They came alongside the copper. Fuck you, Pape! With those words, Mooney cut right in front of the cop and hit his brakes. He and Fat Leonard were in stitches. Pape don't know whether to shit or go blind, Mooney, said Leonard, looking over his shoulder at the car behind them. He's going fucking crazy! Mooney looked back and gestured out the window. Fa fain culo! Fuck you, he yelled, and with tires squealing, whipped the corner. Man, oh man, that copper's going to be mad tonight, Leonard said, hurriedly loosening his wide striped tie and rolling up his sleeves. This is great, Chuck exclaimed. Give it to him, Mooney. They were going fast, and it was exhilarating. At last he'd found a thrill to surpass the ones he'd left behind as childish. Right. Mooney slammed the car into second gear and left the mighty Frank Pape in a cloud of burning rubber. They laughed and laughed at the sight of the mad little wop swearing and shaking his fist behind them. That was nothing, Fat Leonard remarked a few minutes later. You should see when your brother catches one of them in a fucking alley. We give him a taste of what they do to our people in the neighborhood. Jesus, Mooney knows how to make them cry for their mamas. Shut up, Leonard, Mooney interrupted, giving him a stern look. You're going home for dinner now, Chuck. Pape was one of the few cops Mooney left pretty much alone. But when he wasn't on a real job for the syndicate, he loved to corner the other Mick officers in some clammy, dark alley within the safety of the neighborhood and beat the living hell out of them. Taking revenge on the coppers for all the abuse his people, as he called them, had taken for years, made Mooney Giancana a hero to the Italians of the patch. 
Soon to be fourteen, Chuck had begun to think of himself as street smart, someone who knew his way around, and that summer he spent time swaggering up and down the alleys, shooting the breeze with smart heads, but whatever carousing he did, he did during the day. He might be a sharpshooter, a tough guy, but he still avoided the coppers, especially on Friday or Saturday nights, in spite of what the neighborhood men said about Mooney having them under control. Cops were crawling all over looking for trouble, and as Mooney had warned him, they'll pick you up for no goddamn reason and take you down to the station house, put your ass in a fucking lineup and shake you down, or worse, set you up for some crime you didn't commit. Sitting out in the stoop in front of the flat like he'd done most every hot summer night for as long as he could remember, Chuck got more insight into why people in the patch had come to idolize Mooney. A group of neighborhood men were playing bocce beneath the street light and started to talk about his brother among themselves. Until Mooney came along, you couldn't stand in this corner here and play craps or ball or anything, one paunchy Sicilian with slick back hair said to the rest of the group. You know I'm right, the Mick Coppers. Why, they used to just walk right up and whop you real good with their nightsticks and yell, Break it up here, you dirty dago greaseballs! They all nodded in agreement. That Mooney's made a difference. He sure has. They believed there was security in the neighborhood thanks to Mooney, and that the coppers knew better than to incur Mooney's wrath. The police give Mooney plenty of room, and his family and friends, too, Chuck heard one say. The most the coppers will tear these days is a shakedown, said another. The men said the coppers had seen what lengths Mooney would go to in order to make an enemy pay, having found what was left of more than a few men Mooney's entourage had worked over. They said that had made all the difference in how they were treated in the patch. It was no secret that Mooney would get hold of some unlucky bastard, and while two or three crazies from the old 42 gang held the guy down, Mad Dog De Stefano would shove a poker right up his ass. Clear to China, that's what the coroner says, commented one of the bocce players. Yeah, all the way up the poor son of a bitch's innards till his eyes bug out. If the guy was a stoolie who had talked too much or to the wrong people, and Mooney and his friends wanted to have a little more fun, the men said the hoodlums cut off his penis and crammed it right down his throat. Mama me, that would hurt, the paunchy Sicilian cried, and they all grabbed their testicles in mock pain and laughed. He described how there would be blood everywhere, and at the sight most rookies vomited all over the place. The examiner always tells the new ones the same thing, that you can't cut off a man's dick without him bleeding like a stuck pig, so they'd better get used to it. They laughed again. That Mooney's put the fear of Jesus into them coppers, and it's a good thing, too. It was clear to Chuck, listening to the men rave about Mooney, that there were just some rules in the patch you didn't break, even if you were a cop. Staying out of his brother's way was one. Better to take a bribe than a poker up the ass. That's what the precinct captain tells his men, the Sicilian said, concluding their discussion. Chuck had to believe that the coppers followed that advice. Chapter 6 Throughout the remainder of 1936, Mooney continued to harvest the rewards of dozens of lucrative illegal enterprises. When he'd married Ange three years before, he'd taken a job which paid a measly forty dollars a week, at her brother Michael's factory, Central Envelope. He used this employment to satisfy the nosy by the book probation officers concerned with his rehabilitation. In actuality, Mooney frequently assisted the gang's clever Welshman, Murray Humphreys, on labor fixes that needed a convincer. In 1934 and 1935, He'd still driven occasionally for Jack McGurn, enjoying the steady supply of blonde showgirls Jack brought his way, but by 1936, McGurn had fallen from grace, and Mooney carefully avoided supporting him when seated at a table with one of the gang's bosses, Paul Rica. The syndicate's attitude toward McGurn had changed drastically since their St. Valentine's Day job, when McGurn himself was gunned down on February 13, 1936. Nobody shed any tears. The guy didn't have a pot to piss in. High and dry, that's the way we left him. Selling junk to the moolies. Somebody did us all a favor making Jack McGurn go away. Rika commented at the news of his fellow gangster's demise, while daintily sipping an espresso. Over the years, Mooney had developed a keen admiration for 45-year-old Paul Rika. Paul could almost always be found at the Napoli, the haunt once owned by Diamond Joe Esposito, and now controlled by his successors. Mooney described Rika, an enigma to most of those around him, as a cruel, heartless bastard who could laugh while cutting out a guy's liver with an ice pick, 
or cry with sincere sentiment at the birth of some soft-brained soldier's kid. Rika was a somewhat handsome man with strong Italian features and a firm square jaw that he clenched when angered. To those outside the underworld, he reflected the mannerisms of a wealthy country gentleman, slipping into upper-crust society and wealthy political circles with ease. He used this talent to cloak a violent criminal past, like cashmere around a leper. Mooney told Chuck that the ladies and crooked politicians loved him. Rika reached the shores of North American opportunity before his twenty-first birthday. In Italy, where he was known as Paul de Lucia, he'd served time for a murder he had committed at seventeen, and was personally responsible for at least two dozen more. After release in 1920 from his dank and stinking gray-walled Italian cell, he immediately killed the man who'd testified against him and fled the country. Once in New York, he was passed on to Diamond Joe Esposito in Chicago, which was where Mooney had first met him. Under Esposito, Paul joined a stable of eager young immigrants with criminal backgrounds, working with the foul-tempered Jennas, running moonshine, and as a waiter in Esposito's Bellinopoli. There he earned the nickname Paul the Waiter. Rika climbed up the ladder to win Esposito's favor, becoming closely aligned with Capone. Although Esposito's death didn't sadden Rika at the time, when the Roaring Twenties became the depressed Thirties, memories of the old regime started to give him twinges of nostalgia. Diamond Joe knew how to keep a low profile. Capone, on the other hand, had become an obstacle to free enterprise, a larger-than-life figure on whom G-men like Elliot Ness and Treasury agent Frank Wilson could build their careers. After the public outrage accompanying the St. Valentine's Day massacre, the Treasury Department, with Rika's blessing, turned up the heat on Capone. Rika hadn't been disheartened by Capone's prison sentence. As Mooney explained to Chuck, Scarface may have been Rika's friend, but this was business. They had an operation to run, and with Capone out of the way, there'd be no stopping Rika. The media might proclaim Frank Nitty Chicago's boss, but Mooney insisted it was a convenient ruse intended to keep the likes of Elliot Ness confused as to the actual power structure in Chicago. Those on the inside knew better. Paul Rika ran the show. For proof, one had only to look at obvious examples of Rika's power. When major business deals were made with other bosses from other cities, Nitty was nowhere to be found. Nor would men like Jake Guzik and Murray Humphreys consult or take orders from a man of Frank Nitty's ilk, a barber turned enforcer, a man they believed possessed half their intellect. While Frank Nitty served as front man, attracting the scrutiny of the press, Rika was free to work the back rooms with Murray Humphreys, virtually unnoticed. Together the two gangsters slapped more backs and lined more pinstripe pockets than a country politician, letting their old crony, greasy-thumb Jake Guzik, take care of the money. If polite conversation didn't work, then, like Esposito and Capone before him, Rika sent Mooney Giancana, ever the trusted executioner, to give the uncooperative a taste of hot lead. Mooney told Chuck there was a finesse to crime, the way Paul played it, and because of that, Rika had won not only his respect, but that of the President of the United States, politicians looking for votes, and police captains more interested in taking bribes than fighting crime. A few years earlier, Rika had used the threatened loss of income resulting from Prohibition's end to formalize his national role. In Chicago's Bismarck Hotel, he'd hosted a private meeting of the nation's crime leaders to discuss the syndicate's future— Gangsters such as Lucky Luciano, Rocco Fischetti, Harry Duckett, and Sylvester Agolia all attended, but Meyer Lansky, who'd come to town with his friend and colleague Luciano, wasn't invited to participate. Instead, Lansky was told to wait in the Bismarck's lobby while Rika made his pitch upstairs for a syndicate takeover of unions coast to coast. Among Rika's men, Welshman Murray the Camel Humphreys, curly to his friends, was the most knowledgeable about union activity and the most visionary regarding its possibilities. Humphrey saw a time when the gang would completely control the unions. Entire industries could then be manipulated any way the syndicate desired. Unlike Capone, who, according to Mooney, had more guts than guile, Humphreys had the brains to make it happen. And in the early 20s, he'd launched an attack on Chicago's South Side Dry Cleaners Union, plucking the gang's first real cherry. Controlling this union brought home to Humphreys an important truth. Control a workforce, and you control the livelihoods of countless families sustained by those jobs. 
By threatening union members with loss of work, the gangsters could marshal the efforts of husbands, wives, sons, and daughters in support of virtually any scam the gang could dream up, including swinging an election. But aside from valuable political clout, Humphreys also found union coffers brimming over with a ready source of capital highly attractive. Thus, his representatives wasted no time raiding the funds of unions they took over. With Rika's organizational ability, Humphreys' foresight, and Greasy Thumb Jay Guzik's financial acumen, what had started out as merely another form of extortion, squeezing money out of rich businessmen in exchange for smooth labor relations, soon became an endless source of revenue. Unions were targeted for takeover, and the word went out to the younger thugs such as Mooney Giancana, Willie Byoff, and Johnny Roselli to muster together bands of psychopathic hoodlums for shakedowns. It was Mooney's chance to showcase his ruthlessness and guts, but also, more important, his ability to lead, and he grabbed the opportunity. For his muscle, he called on old 42s like Fifi Bucchieri, Mad Dog De Stefano, Needles Gianola, Chucky Nicoletti, and Tietz Battaglia. He took pride in the fact that after a few weeks or days of steady pressure from his terroristic hoods, Union officials were more than willing to comply with whatever he had in mind, and with each success Mooney's stock rose. Following the conquest of the Dry Cleaners Union, the Building Trades, Barber's Union, and Motion Picture Operators Union rapidly fell. If there wasn't a union, Humphreys made one up. People suddenly became members of unions they'd never heard of, and their employers began paying dues and fees to syndicate frontmen in exchange for protection from violence. In 1934, the Chicago Gang became more daring and ambitious in its tactics, and Rika, Nitty, and Humphreys, who claimed to have gotten a foothold in Hollywood by financially backing fellow bootlegger Joe Kennedy's successful entry into the motion picture industry, decided to take their union rackets national by placing a local man, George Brown, along with Willie Byoff, in power as president of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Motion Picture Operators. The move gave Chicago absolute supremacy over Hollywood's film industry and the theaters in which films were shown. To oversee California, Rika sent one of Mooney's friends, the handsome, smooth-talking Johnny Roselli. Suave young Roselli took to Hollywood like a rising star, negotiating quicker than you could hum a few bars of anything goes, as Mooney would later recall, millions in extortion dollars from the major studios. In no time at all, stars whom Mooney described to Chuck as gang-sponsored, among them the Marx Brothers, George Raft, Jimmy Durante, Marie McDonald, Clark Gable, Gary Cooper, Gene Harlow, Cary Grant, and Wendy Berry, were awarded extravagant contracts as well. With no federal, state, or local laws regulating union funds and their activities, Chicago had found the key to Fort Knox. By 1936, all major unions in the city had fallen under the syndicate's domination, and those that were occasionally rebellious soon got back in line. A net had been cast upon the waters of gangland discord, creating an interwoven web of men who recognized that unity brought huge financial advantage. With unions, we caught the big fish. Humphreys would reminisce years later with Mooney. All we had to do was reel it in. To oversee the syndicate's burgeoning enterprises, Trusted lieutenants such as Louis Campagna, Tony Accardo, Charlie Cherry Nose Joy, the Fischetti and Fusco brothers, Johnny Roselli, Frank Nitti, and Sam Hunt were given specific, agreed-upon territories. From within these protected areas, the lieutenants reigned over dozens of workers, or soldiers, guys with more guts than brains, who handled the day-to-day -day hustling on the streets. Enforcers like Mooney Giancana often acted as drivers and bodyguards for a general and his advisors or a high-ranking lieutenant. As hired killers, enforcers were considered a special breed. They had no territory and could be called on by any member of the hierarchy, with permission of the general, to ply their trade. Roles were fluid and ever-changing. A man could rise among the ranks of the syndicate through the death of a superior or by distinguishing himself as smarter, tougher, and more ruthless than his counterparts. Monies from the unions, as well as from all other illicit activities, were pooled and distributed, the general receiving the largest cut. Having made a successful push for power in 1937, it was no secret in Chicago's underworld that Paul Rica had nearly every local, county, and state politician eating out of his hand. His loyal followers, Mooney among them, 
maintained that he was also a welcome guest at the White House, granting and requesting favors with equal aplomb on the national level. In the space of two decades, Chicago Syndicate, a dragon with many heads, had reached maturity. Mooney made it known he liked the way Rika and Humphreys took care of the unions. He'd liked Humphreys since the first time he pulled a job for him. He told Chuck he could tell back then that Humphreys was smarter than the rest of the morons who sneaked up and down the alleys, smarter than Nitty or Capone, for that matter. Humphreys had graduated from high school, whereas most of them had barely scraped through sixth grade. And although Mooney hadn't done any better, he firmly believed they had this intelligence in common. Mooney was well known for his uncanny knack at calculating and memorizing numbers. In his twenties, having a way with figures hadn't scored many points. All that counted then was his skill as an executioner and wheelman. But since he'd gotten out of Joliet, his mathematical ability had come in handy and was beginning to set him apart from the other hoodlums. He'd even developed a habit of showing off his gift for numbers after a few drinks, telling Chuck it puts other guys in their fucking place. Nobody ever short me and lived to tell about it. The threat wasn't lost on the thick-headed men he'd organized under his rule. Mooney had over fifty flunkies marching routinely back and forth between the shop owners and the patch by 1937, picking up protection money. He said if he didn't keep a tight rein on them, they might give more than a passing thought to skimming a little extra off the take for themselves. Mooney's men weren't stupid, and they took him at his word, making sure their payoffs to him were always to the penny. Mooney created his own small empire in the patch, one built on car thefts, burglary rings, moonshining, jewelry heists, extortion, and loan sharking, as well as penny ante gambling. And as his domination grew, he was able to dispense jobs like candy to the starving immigrants or take them away. He reveled in the power his association with the syndicate afforded, and the more he had, the more he craved. By 1937, Union rackets were increasingly falling under his supervision, and he was regularly called on by Rika and Humphreys to supply the soldiers required for their control. Rika and Humphreys were impressed with Mooney John Kana, finding the 29-year-old astute and calculating, and Mooney likewise was impressed with them. Since the days of Esposito, he'd been captivated by their style, listening intently, albeit most often from the sidelines, as they planned everything from political fixes and murder to getting fellow bootlegger Joe Kennedy out of a nearly fatal scrape with Detroit's Jewish mafia, the Purple Gang. The Purple Gang had put a contract on the mixed life for bringing bootlegged rum through their territory without permission, and Kennedy, fearful for his life, had gone to Chicago to beg Esposito to intervene on his behalf. Mooney had watched Esposito, Rika, and Humphreys toy capriciously with the man's fate, Esposito had finally put in the requested phone call, and ever after, Kennedy was in Chicago's debt. Whether required to knock off a friend or save the skin of an enemy, Mooney said he'd learned by watching two of the best, Rika and Humphreys. Mooney clearly admired Paul Rika, but he reserved some of his highest praise for Humphreys, raving on and on to Chuck about the way Humphreys could analyze his situation and figure out a strategy taking on whatever challenge the gang had, and then, like some fedora-hatted Houdini, snatching a plan right out of thin air. But in the final analysis, Chuck knew his brother's appreciation of the camel was far more simple and straightforward. Humphreys gets the job done, and he gets it done smart. At first it had surprised Chuck to see his brother pull up a chair at the Bellinopoly, eager as a first grader, whenever Murray had something to say. But he soon realized that by watching Humphreys operate, Mooney learned tricks foreign to the muscle-bound world of the patch. For Humphreys, violence was not always the best or only solution. A live sucker is more valuable than a dead one, was one of his many pearls of wisdom. When Mooney heard that one, he'd laughed in agreement. He thought that was one of the sharpest things Murray ever said, and went so far as to repeat it to Chuck one Saturday night after dinner. Murray Humphreys is one of the smartest guys you'll ever fucking meet he said as a way of ending their conversation. The guy's sly as a goddamned fox. It wasn't that Humphreys abhorred violence, Mooney told him. He'd personally taken out his share of guys, but it was just that the camel favored peaceful alternatives, and those alternatives invariably made the syndicate money. There's no denying it, Chuck. 
Brains like Murray's can make the fucking difference between winning and losing. Put a big bullet in your gun. Take a guy with my muscle and put it with Humphreys' smarts, and who knows? A man could be boss one day. He'd smiled when he said that, and Chuck couldn't help wondering whether that was exactly what Mooney had in mind. If so, he knew his brother could make it happen. There hadn't been anything yet he'd set his sights on that he hadn't gotten. Mooney also liked Humphreys' style, and Murray had plenty of that. Early in his career, Humphreys had taken to wearing expensive suits and camel hair coats. The coats had become his trademark, hence his nickname, the Camel. Mooney noticed how Rika and Nitty appreciated Humphreys' elegant qualities, his ability to hobnob with the politicians and businessmen. Murray Humphreys, floppy ears and beady eyes aside, was, as Mooney put it, high tone, a class act. How a guy looks can open the door to the king of fucking England, Chuck. It gets Murray anywhere he wants to go, and where Murray goes, the syndicate goes. In deference to that fact, Mooney began to make an even greater effort to dress well, visiting Rothschilds each week, and coming back with armloads of elegant gray flannel suits, double-breasted pinstripes, and foulard silk ties. He began wearing supple calfskin shoes and two-toned black-and-white Oxfords. Soft felt fedoras to match each ensemble lined his closet shelves. And he didn't neglect Ange, making sure she dressed in the latest fashions, lounging pajamas, pearls, and a mink coat were among her ever-growing wardrobe. It was late March of 1937, and Angeline had thrown another one of her jealous hysterics. They were becoming more frequent and more irritating to Mooney. Before he stormed out the door, he sarcastically remarked to Ange that a few well-placed backhands might put her in her place. Maybe that was what she needed. It was impossible to explain anything to a woman, he complained to Chuck in the car later that night, on his way to meet with Rika and Humphreys. Ange should have learned by now not to ask questions, that what men do isn't any of her business. He told Chuck she was getting pretty jealous, practically hysterical, accusing him of seeing other women just about every time he left the house. Christ, Chuck thought to himself, leaving home at night hardly ever had anything to do with sex. This was business. And the feeling you could get around the guys, well, Mooney was right. It was too goddamn good to pass up for a fucking whining woman. Not for a whore, and especially not for a wife. At home, a man could play the husband role, and Chuck thought Mooney did a damn good job of it, too. But at the Napoli, you were a man. As soon as they opened the door to the cafe, Chuck could feel it. It was electric. Paul and Curly want to see you. A swarthy-skinned busboy whispered in broken Italian. They're in the back. He motioned with one hand toward two men seated at a table. Mooney lapels turned up on his coat and the brim of a tan fedora pulled down rakishly to one side, strolled through the bistro tables. Chuck followed at a respectful distance and stood against the back wall. His brother left his coat on, but out of respect, took off his hat, placing it on his lap. He pulled the chair forward to face Riga. Chuck thought the deep-set eyes across the table from his brother went right through him. Mooney had said Paul was like a wild dog. He didn't react well to jumpy, shifty guys. And Mooney knew better than to let him ever see any sign of real emotion. So he didn't flinch for an instant, but sat there for several moments waiting for Paul to say what was on his mind. Mooney, we got a little problem. Curly and I know you can handle it. Rika leaned back in his chair and unbuttoned the vest of his elegant sharkskin suit. He lit a long cigar before continuing. It's like this. We gotta get the barber's union back in line. A couple of the old guys are squawking again. We're gonna have to persuade them to come along. They've got a barber shop over on Loomis and Taylor. Mooney looked first at Rika and then at Humphreys. Without another word, he put his hat on and stood up to leave. Consider it done, Paul, he said, and signaled to Chuck to follow. Driving always made Mooney's mind work better, and he took his time getting them home, whipping a few corners on the rain-swept streets. It was just like the good old days. Convincing the barbers that working with us is the next best thing to life insurance is going to take some extra muscle, Mooney said suddenly. His wheels were obviously turning. I'll send a couple of the regular boys and Carl Torciello. Carl needs the money real bad, I know, because his sister-in-law told Ange they're having a hard time. Mooney told Chuck that Carl had even stopped him one day to see whether he could get some work. Anything, Mooney, the handsome Italian had said. Anything. 
I got a wife and a beautiful little girl, Anne Marie. She's just five years older than your daughter, Mooney. I got to feed and clothe her and our new baby. So I'd be real appreciative if you hear of anything. If Carl plays it right, this could be the start of a whole new life for him and his family, Mooney said, and then smiled. It'll sure make Ange and her girlfriends happy, too. I'll be a prince for helping them out. He paused for a moment and puffed thoughtfully on his cigar. Besides, he continued, I like Carl Torsiello. We'll give him a chance and we'll see what happens. At home, when he went right in and called Fat Leonard, he sent him to Torsiello with instructions for the job. Twenty years later, Carl Torsiello would tell Chuck about his chance to make it big with Mooney and how excited he and his wife Tilly had been at the time. It was like manna from heaven, Carl said, shaking his head. We needed money so bad back then, Chuck. Shit, it was smack in the middle of the Depression. You were lucky to have food on the table. Men would have killed for a chance to work anywhere, let alone for your brother Mooney. It was an honor. Carl had realized right away that this was his big chance, maybe his only chance, to get in with Mooney and his fast-growing group of high rollers. When he came home from work that Thursday afternoon and looked around his tiny flat, he'd imagined how wonderful it would be to always have meat on the table and money in his pocket. He was tired of breaking his back eighteen hours a day out on the railroad tracks and tired of being paid peanuts, fifteen dollars a week, to unload the endless crates of oranges and pears coming in from California. You're worn out, Carl, his wife had said. All that will change now because tonight is a new beginning. Things will be different from now on. You know what I mean? This is for Mooney, right? She lowered her voice when she said Mooney. Everybody did. It was a sign of respect even if he wasn't around. Think what a change this will make. You could quit your job and start making real money. We might even get a new table, she added, running her hand over the buckling veneer, or new clothes for the children. He'd thought Tilly was right about it being a new beginning. He'd hardly been able to control his excitement, couldn't think of anything else all day. All he'd known for certain was that Mooney was going to pay him more money than he could make in six months of working at the rail station, and that Fat Leonard had said they needed someone tough and strong for the job. Well, you fit the bill, Tilly had replied, laughing, when he told her what Leonard had said. You're made to order if Strong's what Mooney's looking for. During dinner, he talked on and on about how this would be the lucky break they needed. But Tilly was a devout Catholic, and wasn't about to give credit to Lady Luck. In all their married lives, she'd never thought Luck had much to do with anything. No, it's not just Luck. It's more than that, she corrected him. This is sent from heaven, Carl. We should thank God. He could tell Tilly had been proud of him. He'd felt so good about that. With him working for Mooney, the Torsiello family would finally be off and running. At least that's what Carl had thought. The guys arrived at seven o'clock sharp that night to pick him up. But before Carl walked out the door, he planted a kiss on Tilly's cheek. Whatever it is I'm to do, Till, you know I'll do my best for my family, he'd said. He had to remind himself of that after they got to the barber shop. The dim light gave the room a certain eeriness. The mirrors lining the walls reflected each tool of the barber's trade in weird distortion. Razors, neatly lined along the counters, glinted like knives prepared for battle. He hadn't liked the look of things almost from the start. He glanced over at the other guys and wondered what was next. There were three of them standing there together in the dark, James, Turk, Torello, Mad Dog De Stefano and Fat Leonard. He knew their reputations. They were some of the meanest men in the neighborhood. He hadn't minded when they'd jimmied the lock and broken in. He'd known whatever Mooney had in mind couldn't be legal. He wasn't naive. But the baseball bats, brass knuckles, and pistols the guys carried made him nervous. He thought of Tilly and the children and recalled her words. From heaven, she'd said. He told himself he wouldn't let her down, that he'd act like a man. Leonard smiled and pointed to a light coming from beneath the door of the back room and whispered, In there! It was the signal Mad Dog and Turk must have been waiting for, because they lifted their bats and stormed the door. When it fell with a crack of splinters and brass hinges onto the tile floor, Carl saw two old men. One was balding and had a dapper little mustache. The other was clean-shaven with hair as white as Tilly's Sunday apron, Carl thought. He was short and round and probably pushing seventy. Their eyes met. Mamma Mia, what do you want? The one with the mustache cried. You want money? Here's money. 
He waved at the desk between them, and the steel cash box piled high with the day's receipts. They don't want money, Sal, the white-haired man said. No, they're here about the union. He stood up and faced the four intruders. That's right, isn't it? He was a brave old man, even if he was bluffing, and Carl suddenly wished he was somewhere else, any place besides standing in the barber shop, confronting an old man who couldn't hurt a fly. Turk lifted his bat and slammed it on the desk, making the barbers jump half out of their skins, and swept a jumble of dollar bills and receipts onto the floor. The cash box fell with a clatter, and coins rolled in all directions. That's right, old man, said Leonard. We're here to talk about unions. We heard you have a few beefs. Maybe you want to tell us what they are. The barbers looked at one another. Carl could tell they were scared to death. Well, cat got your tongue? What's it going to be, assholes? You going to make waves or vote for the union? Either way, you're going to keep your fucking mouth shut and mind your own goddamn business, or else you won't be cutting hair anymore. Got that? Capiche? Come on, Leonard, can't you see the bastards are nothing but trouble? They need a lesson in manners, getting cocky in their old age. Maybe they should retire, sneered Mad Dog. Shut up, Leonard hissed. Carl glanced over at Turk and Mad Dog. As they fingered their bats, he thought that everything he'd heard about them was true. They were excited at the idea of letting the old man have it. Turk put one hand in the pocket of his jacket. There was a gun there, and he looked as if he was itching to use it, but Leonard drew his first. Okay, old man, what's it gonna be? Leonard said, waving the revolver. You want us to leave you dead or alive? I'm waiting, but I'm not gonna wait long. Before they could say a word, Mad Dog sent his bat crashing onto the head of the white-haired man, and he crumpled to the floor like an old newspaper. Blood stained his snowy crown, had poured down his face, clouding his frightened eyes. He looked up for mercy, but the bat came down again. This time it hit his leg with a sickening, crunching sound, and he grabbed it, shrieking in pain. His eyes fluttered, and he slumped unconscious on the blood-smeared tile. "'Nice piece of work, Mad Dog. You showed him pretty good,' exclaimed Turk. "'Give him another one.' They laughed and didn't seem to notice that Carl wasn't joining in their amusement. His first instinct had been to comfort the poor man. The blood made him sick. He'd been a goddamn fool to think he could ever be a part of Mooney's gang. "'You're killing him!' the other barber screamed, and he began blubbering in broken English. "'My friend of fifty years! You're killing him!' He rushed for Mad Dog's throat but didn't reach him, catching Turk's pistol across his temple. He staggered against the desk. "'Hey, guys, what are you waiting for? Teach the cocksucker a lesson he won't forget. Kick his ass! He'll remember who to vote for!' Leonard ordered and stepped back to light a cigar. Brandishing brass knuckles, the two jumped on the man. When they broke his fingers one by one, they cracked and snapped like kernels of corn, popping at a fair. He screamed for a while and struggled against the blows that followed, but their youth was too much for him, and he fell into a stupor on the floor. "'Is he dead?' Turk asked, chuckling as he lit a cigarette. "'No, and he's not going to be either,' Leonard said. "'We didn't come here to kill him.' We came here to teach the sons of bitches a fucking lesson. We want them to vote, you know, and dead men don't vote. Sometimes they do, said Turk, catching his breath as he smirked at his cohorts. They all laughed until they couldn't laugh any more. In the midst of the beating, Carl slipped to the front of the barber shop. He decided he'd tell Fat Leonard he thought he heard someone coming. But the truth was he couldn't stand it any more. He'd walked straight out the front door of the shop to the curb. After he got a grip on himself... He stood beneath the red and white barber pole, thinking about Tilly and how he'd let her down. He'd lost his chance. So be it, he said out loud, alone in the shadow of the street light. He clenched his fist and wanted to cry at the unfairness of it all. He couldn't do it, no matter how much money it meant. And he decided then and there that somehow they'd make it, he and Tilly and the children, without Mooney and the syndicate. Chapter 7 Mooney hadn't said much besides, later, when Fat Leonard started to tell him about Carl Torsiello and the night before, as they pulled up to Louis's gas station on California and Lexington. Chuck was excited to be included on Mooney's rounds through his territory that spring, and as usual he stayed out of his brother's way that day, standing outside the open garage door in the bright sunshine, drinking a cold bottle of Coca-Cola from the cooler. Each morning when Mooney came to the gas station to conduct business, the owner and his wife thanked him profusely, 
It's an honor, Mooney. Just make yourself at home. The place is all yours for as long as you like, they'd say, and then skedaddle, hastily leaving a customer's car waiting on the grease racks. Once the duo left, Mooney lit a cigar. He didn't smoke cigarettes much anymore, and got down to business. It was easy to tell when the word had gotten out that Mooney was at Louis, because one by one, neighborhood men from all walks of life, from low-life greaseballs to bankers and coppers, started to show up, waiting for a word with him. And it could go on like that until noon. Then they'd sit around a while before heading for Claudio's bakery and Mooney's afternoon appointments. Chuck sat down against the wall of the building and watched admiringly as his brother worked his magic. There was a big, heavy-set man in a suit who looked like a businessman, asking for Mooney's backing to open a bar. A disheveled guy in old dungarees waited on the sidelines, pacing back and forth, smoking one lucky strike after the other. Rumor had it he owed the syndicate money and couldn't pay. Across the garage, two old fellows with shiny bald heads huddled in the corner. Chuck had seen them there before. They ran card games and book joints. There were the usual down-and-outers, too, looking for a job at one union or another. Three of them stood outside near the door, talking about how many mouths they had to feed. And another baby on the way, one lamented. A few new pock-faced recruits, whom Fifi had swept off the streets, were lined up against the wall behind the grease racks, tough guy sneers permanently frozen on their faces, as they waited to flex their muscle and prove their worth. It always fascinated Chuck how people groveled and pawed their way in to talk with Mooney. They shuffled like shines on a plantation, eyes to the floor. His brother could have been the Pope the way they fawned and whined. To hear grown men ask permission to buy a house or a car amazed him. They begged and poured out their life histories when they needed a job, cajoled and smiled and said, Yes, sir, yes, sir, when they wanted to open a business, legitimate or otherwise. More often than not, they didn't come to ask for money. They came for his permission or advice. Or they brought him money in neat long envelopes and left without saying a word. Something about the way Mooney made the entire Giancana family, including Antonio, come around with their tongues hanging out, whether they needed money or, in his sister's case, Mooney's approval to go somewhere, rubbed Chuck the wrong way. Mooney treated them just like all the other common dagos who came off the street, and Chuck resented that until he'd started coming along with Mooney to Louis and Claudio's bakery and actually witnessed what went on. He wouldn't have believed it. Other people got the same treatment the Giancana family had gotten all their lives. His only consolation was that many got worse. At least Mooney hadn't killed any of his family. More than once, Chuck had seen Mooney give one of his lieutenants a certain look after a guy had shown up with some sob story about not being able to pay a debt and he started to put two and two together, when shortly thereafter, the newspapers would report that a man's body, twisted up like a busted tire, had turned up in a ditch. It didn't surprise him. Nothing Mooney did surprised him any more. Maybe it was Joliet. Mooney had become more reserved, quiet, since he'd come back. Before he'd left, not much moved his brother that Chuck could recall, but now nothing touched him. He was unreachable. Maybe he'd worn a mask so long that he'd become the mask. It was as if there wasn't a real person named Mooney sitting in Louis' gas station. Mooney had flesh and blood like everybody else, but he was a counterfeit person somehow. People who knew him, even Ange, didn't recognize that. Maybe they just couldn't believe it, or didn't want to. Now, when he saw Mooney give one of his men that look, Chuck knew what it meant and he also knew it didn't mean a thing to Mooney, one way or the other. Other people thought he had feelings like they did. That was their weakness, and Mooney's greatest strength. The businessman got up and left, scurrying down the sidewalk, and the nervous guy sat down. I don't have it yet, Mooney. I will, though. My pa, he's going to help me come up with the money. I got to stay away from joints with card games. I promise I'll have it next week. You've said that before, Rico. We want it today, not tomorrow, not next week, today, capiche? The man started to cry, sobbing and sniffing and puffing on his cigarette. He was shaking like a leaf. I don't know where I can get it, Mooney. There isn't any place. Please give me another week. I'll have it then. I will, just like I said. Get a grip on yourself, man. Pull yourself together. It's all right. There was a cool evenness to his tone. Go home now. 
We'll talk again soon, when you're in better shape. Mooney turned to Needles. Chuck expected his brother to give Needles this special look, the one that said the guy would be lucky to make it until sundown, but he didn't. He smiled instead, the peculiar sympathy in his eyes, and said, Take him home, Needles. The man stood up and dried his eyes. Thank you, Mr. Mooney, he cried out, joy in his voice. Chuck watched, mystified, as Needles put his arm around the guy and led him to the car. No one, not even Mooney's closest associates, could predict his brother's reactions. But undeniably, just as easily as Mooney could order a man's death, he could also grant him life. He was that powerful. Later that day, after the continuous stream of visitors had diminished to a trickle, Chuck joined his brother, Needles, Fifi, and Fat Leonard for a cigarette and a lukewarm cup of oily black coffee. He felt privileged that they let him sit there while discussing the morning's efforts. Now tell me about Torsiello, Mooney demanded. Leonard explained that the problems with the barber's union were taken care of, but added that Carl had gotten cold feet. When Fat Leonard finished, Mooney displayed an uncharacteristic sympathy. Too bad, Carl's a tough son of a bitch. He would have made a goddamn good soldier, maybe even a lieutenant some day. His reaction surprised Chuck, because such behavior was typically branded as cowardly by his brother and, from what he'd seen over the past months, swiftly punished. But here was Mooney letting it go like it was nothing. As if reading Chuck's mind, Mooney continued, You guys get along fine without him, right? And he stayed out of your way, so just forget about it, Mooney said, leaning back and putting his feet up on the table. Some guys just don't have what it takes to go up the ladder. Carl's no chump. He just doesn't have the stomach for that line of work. He's not a bad guy. We'll leave him alone. Help him and his wife Tilly if we can. And if a different kind of opportunity comes along, maybe I'll give him another try. But he won't get another chance like this one. Chuck knew exactly what his brother meant by that and was the one thing that worried him about his own future. Not many guys made it to the top in the syndicate without earning it, without breaking a few legs and killing their way up. He couldn't think of one. That's how Mooney got where he was. There didn't seem much getting around that. And Chuck didn't know what he would do if Mooney ever sent him along with one of his executioners to put a guy away. Years before, Chuck had romanticized it all, as if it were something out of a movie. But little by little, he'd realized this was for keeps, and deep down he'd started wondering whether he could do it. Maybe he was more like Carl. Maybe he didn't have the guts for it. He hoped Mooney wouldn't demand that kind of proof of loyalty from him, his own brother. Only time would tell. But he was getting older. He was fifteen. And Mooney had already built a well-deserved reputation in the patch by the time he was twelve— Chuck didn't see how he could ever match that, not if he had to murder his way there. Paul Rica didn't have to brief Mooney on the syndicate's answer to the end of Prohibition. He was well aware that they'd found more than one lucrative angle, and he was becoming increasingly involved in the workings of each. Aside from the growing union rackets, the syndicate still cooked the alky, only now they sold it to licensed distributors— Distributors, typically well-known bootleggers turned legitimate entrepreneurs, were always hungry for a better profit. Rebottled and passed off as a quality brand or import, booze costing five dollars a barrel to distill in a backwoods barn could bring the syndicate and a corrupt distributor thousands in profit. Much of Joe Kennedy's so-called fancy scotch was, in fact, not so fancy after all, but rebottled still alcohol. One hand washes the other, Paul Rica told Mooney, and right now one of those hands is empty. All the distributors want cheap booze, and to give it to them, we need more stills and more alky. In response, early in the summer of 1937, Mooney sent a soldier, Guido Gentile, to find some property out in the country. Way, way out, Guido, Mooney had told his scout. This is going to be a big operation, and we don't want any fucking agents nosing around our business, screwing things up. Gentile set out to find a barn and cooperative farmer in an appropriately godforsaken place. He did, in Garden Prairie, Illinois. Gentile had a long wish list, a steady supply of grain and cookers, as well as vehicles for transfer of the moonshine. Once Gentile got the operation in place, Mooney sent nine soldiers from the patch to feed the stills. By January of 1938, 
They were producing enough algae to supply connections along the East Coast to Boston, north to Milwaukee and Detroit, and across to Cleveland. After giving Rika and the guys their cut, the operation supplied Mooney with more money than he'd had in his entire life. Throughout the summer, Chuck spent more and more time at Mooney's side, or at his house, soaking up whatever he could of his brother's business savvy. After Ange had given birth in April to a surprisingly healthy baby girl named Bonnie, Mooney had become more willing than ever to take Chuck along. Whether or not there was a connection, Chuck didn't know, but for his part, he thoroughly enjoyed watching his brother in action. It seemed Mooney conducted business everywhere he went. It wasn't always formal, as it was at the garage or bakery. Most times it wasn't formal at all. Chuck would be sitting at Mooney's house, eating dinner with his brother, Ange, and his two nieces, and the phone would ring. Ange usually answered. Mooney had her screen his calls, and if it was somebody he wanted to talk to, he'd take the call in the other room. He'd set a time and place to meet later, usually that night. It might be on a street corner, in a parking lot, or just in the front seat of the car. A real office was something nobody longed for. The syndicate guys reveled in the secrecy, liked slipping around corners and whispering orders, planning their next move. It made Ange more comfortable when Mooney took Chuck with him. Her jealous outbursts became less frequent. Chuck decided that she believed her husband would never have a romantic encounter when his younger brother was standing by, which couldn't have been further from the truth. After a few hours of meetings, Mooney liked to stop by one of the high-class whorehouses to unwind, suggesting to Chuck that he'd take advantage of the opportunity. It's free, he'd say as they parked the car. Other assholes gotta pay up to a hundred dollars to screw these girls, but not a Giancana. Anything you want, Chuck. You hear what I'm saying? Anything. It's yours, Chuck. Anything you want and all you want. Free and clear. The Italians they saw in Mooney's rounds were men Chuck came to know well. At the Bella Napoli, Paul Rica let him stay at the table with Louis Campagna, Johnny Roselli, Tony Accardo, and Murray Humphreys, and Chuck felt honored to be included, even if all they talked about was how tasty the cannoli were. Chuck couldn't tell whether Mooney was grooming him for the day he'd joined the syndicate. He was afraid to ask, or if, by always taking him along, he was simply placating Ange. Through Mooney, Chuck also met men from outside the neighborhood, guys like Jake Guzik, whom Mooney worked for. Guzik was a Jew who'd earned the nickname Greasy Thumb because of his knack at thumbing through stacks of bills. Mooney told Chuck that it was Guzik, along with Rika, Sam, Golf Bag, Hunt, Murray Humphreys, and Nitty, who held the syndicate together after Capone had gotten pinched by the IRS. But what really impressed Chuck about the man wasn't his business acumen, but his friendly manner and generosity. Every time they went to Guzik's hangout, St. Hubert's Old English Grill and Chop House, they'd leave with three or four old suits to take home to Antonio. Thanks to Guzik, their father had started looking like a regular Romeo. Chuck enjoyed sitting at the table with Guzik, too. He was warm and talkative, and, Chuck thought, different from the other men around Mooney. Jake Guzik just didn't have the eyes of a killer, Sitting at his table was like being at a happy-go-lucky payoff window. Everybody from police captains and politicians to judges came and went all night. Between his wine and lamb chops, Guzik managed to make them all leave smiling, envelopes stuffed with cash in hand. By August of 1938, Chuck was finding an old hat for men like Murray Humphreys to climb into the front seat next to his brother for a little talk while he sat quietly in the back. The men discussed things such as payoffs and labor disputes for what seemed like hours. After a few months, he saw a pattern to the visits. Mooney made his rounds at night just as he did during the day, but usually the night's events were far more interesting. Mooney would have never taken him along, Chuck was certain, if he'd known what was going to happen one night in late October. It was strange, really, how Chuck had managed over the past months to block out his concerns about being able to cut it in the syndicate. Meeting Jake Guzik had gone a long way toward making him feel more comfortable. His fear of someday actually having to hit a guy in order to make it had all but subsided. Mooney said that Guzik didn't have the stomach for killing, and Chuck wondered aloud how Guzik could have gotten so far with Capone and the guys. In reply, Mooney tapped his temple with his index finger and said, Brains, Chuck, brains. Guzik doesn't have to kill to prove he's valuable. He's a Jew. He's good with money, 
and he's as fucking smart as they come. Hearing that relieved Chuck, he figured that he'd just have to prove he was clever enough, that he had the brains to be valuable. He stopped worrying about having to hit a guy or being a part of a hit. The only time he'd seen a guy drop was as a little kid in the neighborhood, and that seemed like a long, long time ago. But if he closed his eyes and thought about it, he could still see the pool of steaming blood and smell it in his nostrils, could still hear the tune the guy had whistled that day. Sometimes he'd even wake up with it playing in his head over and over. But that night in October, when he and Mooney climbed into the car, murder was the furthest thing from Chuck's mind. It had started out just like any other night. Chuck was hoping to see a little action, maybe stop by the whorehouse or the Napoli. But when Mooney pulled over to the curb and Needles got in, Chuck's delusions about it being just another night disappeared. Needles was all business. We gotta do something about that son of a bitch, he said. Yeah, I know, Mooney answered. So what do you want to do? It was interesting to Chuck how Mooney always asked that question when a guy came to him with a problem. It certainly wasn't that the guy's opinion mattered. In essence, the guy was asking permission. But allowing him to speak gave Mooney insight. That's what Mooney called it, into how his mind worked, what he was thinking. Take the motherfucker out, that's what. I fucking had it with this slimy double dealing. He shortened us. You know it and I know it. I say we fucking push him. Mooney looked back in the rearview mirror at Chuck. Well, let's just go pick up Fat Leonard then and pay the cocksucker a visit. He turned the corner and the tire squealed. After finding Leonard, they ended up at a pool hall. Needles, go bring the fucker out, Mooney ordered and looked back at Chuck. You get up front with me. Needles got out of the car and went inside. A few punks were milling around in front, playing tough, and Fat Leonard got out and yelled at them, Hey, what you fucking looking at? Get lost! Scram! They took off down the sidewalk. Boy, Fat Leonard really got rid of them fast, Chuck said. Mooney didn't reply, but sat in silence, smoking his cigar. Something about the way Mooney had turned real cold all of a sudden made Chuck uneasy, and he decided to light a cigarette. When he did, Fat Leonard leaned in the door and shook his head, saying, Chuck, aren't you too young for those things? I'm old enough, Chuck retorted, dragging deeply. Hey, Mooney, the kid thinks he's old enough. Getting pretty touchy in his old age, too, Leonard said, laughing. Mooney sat at the wheel, not saying a word. Pretty soon, Needles came out with a plump little Italian, dressed in a blue pinstriped suit. Hey, goddammit! The man said as he got near the car, shaking Needles off his suit coat. You guys made me leave a nice fucking woman in there. Now let's get this over with so I can get back to her. You ain't going nowhere, Mike. You're going with us, Needles said, and shoved him in the back seat next to Leonard. Needles got in beside him. Chuck looked back at Leonard. He smiled at Chuck and winked. It made him queasy when Leonard smiled like that. They drove up and down the city streets until well after midnight, back and forth in no direction whatsoever. No one said a word. When they passed the street light, Chuck could see sweat trickling down Mike's forehead. So what's going on, Mike? How's business? Mooney finally asked. Fine, Mooney, real good, Mike said hurriedly, and then added. So what's the problem? How come you guys want to muscle me? I ain't done nothing. I pay on time and sometimes even a little extra. So what's the problem? He looked at Leonard and Needles. Nothing, Mike. We just thought it was time for a little talk, Mooney replied, his voice still even, his eyes never leaving the street ahead. Yeah, about what? Like I said, I ain't done nothing to piss you guys off, honest, Mooney. He was beginning to act real skittish, looking wild-eyed around the car. There's no reason to whine. I didn't say I was mad at you, did I? What would I be pissed off about? You say you're clean, that you've been good to us. Well, why shouldn't I believe you? Mooney maintained his concentrated driving. I don't know why, but I don't think you believe me. No, I don't, Mike retorted, and went to take off his suit coat. Needles gave him a hand. Looking back, Chuck noticed Mike's shirt had big wet spots where he'd been sweating. There's no reason you guys shouldn't believe me. Like I said, none, Mike whined. None, Needles snorted. Are you sure, Mike? Sure we can trust you? Why, yeah, sure, you can trust me. Hey, listen, why the hell don't we go over to the Napoli for a drink or something? It'll be on me. What do you say, huh? Don't change the subject, Mike. We were talking about trust. You know, trust between Paisan, Mooney said softly. 
Hey, you guys come on out and tell me what your fucking problem is. I need to get home. Mike exclaimed, indignation brimming in his voice. Yeah, to your wife and kids, Leonard said, laughing. Mike, tell me, how much money you been making? Is it enough? Mooney asked. You know what I make? Sure, sure it is. I ain't got no beefs. You guys let me make a good living. Well, on the street they're saying you're making a whole hell of a lot more. More than you're telling us about. Is that right? Hell no. Why, you guys know everything. You know about every goddamn nickel I make. I pay you your share, don't I? That should tell you, shouldn't it? Yeah, but we're wondering if you're paying us all of our share, Mike. Now, come on. It's no big deal. Sometimes a man needs a little extra, so he just skims it off the top real nice. He thinks nobody will ever know. A lot of guys do it. But you gotta be straight with us. Have you been holding out a little on the side? Like a few dollars to take care of that whore you keep up in your apartment on Roosevelt? No, I ain't never shorted you. Never. As God is my witness, Mooney, never. My Jesus Christ, you think I'm fucking stupid? Don't you think I see your clothes, your nice new car? Don't you think I heard about the fur coat you give to your whore? Mooney remained collected, in total control, and didn't raise his voice, although there was a threatening hint of anger in his words. Well, I... I... What? Speak up, Mike. I can't hear up here, Mooney called back. Look, it's nothing, Mike. Let's just be straight with each other, and then we can do business together. But you gotta be straight, okay? Nobody's gonna hurt you, Needle said. Mooney just wants to know the truth. Okay, okay. Maybe I've been skimming a little extra off for a few things, but only a little. Shit, I never meant to screw you guys. You're my friends, right? We're friends? He nodded and looked around the car for confirmation. Sure, Mike, you're among friends here. Mooney said, smiling. Yeah, we're friends. We practically grew up together. Shit, you know my family from way back, back in the old days in the neighborhood. Let's just get square and you guys take me back so I can get home. How much do you want? Mike fumbled through the pocket of his suit coat. Mooney looked over his shoulder and fixed Fat Leonard in his gaze. Chuck recognized the look. Fat Leonard barely nodded. Well, I don't know. How much do you think you shorted us? Mooney asked. Uh... How's four hundred? Okay, four hundred? No, five? Five hundred? Needle started to laugh. Leonard snickered. Mike, you're insulting me. Five hundred dollars? You're insulting me! Mooney smacked both hands on the steering wheel. The man started to cry. I don't have any more than that right now, but I will, he added, sniffling. You guys are scaring me. How much do you want? Whatever you say, I'll get it. It's a promise. You have my word on my mother's grave. Mooney pulled the car over. Thinking he would be getting out, Mike put his hand across Needles. Okay, we got a deal. I'll just walk back from here. You're not getting out, Needles said, pushing his arm back. No, Chuck is, Mooney said. Get out, Chuck. Go on home. Here's a few bucks for something to eat, Mooney said, pressing a twenty-dollar bill in his hand. Now go home. Mike started to sob. Come on, guys. Let me out. Chuck watched from the curb as the car sped away. The man's pleas still rang in his ears. The next day, all he could think about was the guy from the pool hall, Mike. He had a pretty good idea nobody would ever see him again. Chuck wasn't sure how he felt about it all. It seemed as if what Mooney did paid off. He was respected, had a nice place, a beautiful car, and women flocked to him. He had a nice wife and kids. It sure didn't look as if anybody thought what Mooney did was wrong, or really bad. The whistling man suddenly came back to Chuck. He'd heard the tune in his head as he'd walked back after they let him out. He'd been disappointed at first, not to be included in Mooney's inner circle, but he knew what Mooney's look to Leonard had meant. He'd heard what Needles had said. Yeah, it was all for keeps. It wasn't the fucking movies they were in. Mike the whiner, Mike from the pool hall, was probably being picked at by some big crows out on a farm somewhere, and Chuck was glad he hadn't been there to see it happen. A few days later, he got off the nerve to ask Mooney about the guy. He knew better and felt like a fool after he'd opened his mouth. Shit, you gotta remember this is fucking business, Mooney said over a scotch and water after dinner. Chuck, there's nothing personal in it, but you can't have bastards stealing you blind. Let one get away with it, and Christ, everything would fall fucking apart. Remember that. And don't ask fucking questions. You might get answers you don't like. 
That was all Mooney said. He never really answered his question, and Chuck didn't ask again. Mike from the pool hall just disappeared. Throughout the fall, there were good days and bad days when it came to his relationship with Mooney. Just when he'd think maybe his brother was going to let him in, treat him like a man, not a kid brother, something would happen to screw it all up. He knew it was his own fault. He was always letting Mooney down. Chuck still had his friends back in the patch, and more than once Mooney had caught them out at night, raising hell on the street corners. It was strictly forbidden for Chuck and his brother Pepe to be out in a car with friends, which made it seem all the more racy and exciting. If he got hold of Chuck, Mooney still beat the hell out of him, slamming his fist into Chuck's jaw, punching him in the stomach, or bruising a few ribs. In spite of the certain punishment that would follow if he was caught out in the town, whenever he got the chance, Chuck hung out under the streetlights shooting craps and drinking beer, or went over to Roosevelt and Paulina in Joe and Goldia's car to shoot the breeze with the cab drivers, relatives of gangsters whose connections had gotten them a leg up when jobs were scarce, among them Tony Accardo's brother-in-law, Queenie, and Rocky Potenza. The cabbies were tough guys who swore and smoked and slugged anybody who got in their way. Chuck thought they were fun to be around, so he spent a lot of time hanging out at the taxi stand trading stories. Joe and Golia, whose family was better off than most, was the only kid in the neighborhood who had a car. Most nights they had free, Chuck and Pepe piled into Angolia's little two-door Model A and headed downtown for Navy Pier. They just sat on the pier, watching the throngs of people who gathered there on warm summer nights, while Joe picked out top tunes on his guitar. The boys sang and smoked cigarettes and drank beer until the wee hours, exchanging tales of sexual encounters and reading the juicier passages from Tobacco Road out loud, or waxed philosophical about the meaning of life, and argued about whether or not the German guy, Hitler, was really out to take over the world. Sometimes when Chuck knew that Muni wasn't around town and wouldn't catch them, they'd push Joe's Model A to its limits, whipping corners and speeding down thoroughfares to the all-night bars and whorehouses, or to a card game on Michigan Avenue for a few hands of poker. But not much escaped Mooney. If he wasn't close by, it didn't seem to matter. He had eyes everywhere. And stoolies who for a dollar, or in Chuck's estimation for a chance to get on Mooney's good side, would snitch on the boy's misadventures. He might have been emotionless about everything else, but it riled Mooney to distraction to have his rules broken. The only reason Chuck could determine for Mooney's extreme reaction to disobedience was that he believed such flagrant disregard for his authority by some punks, his own brothers on top of it, made him look bad to his soldiers. And if Mooney couldn't control a few rowdy kids, it might make the guys up top nervous, too. Guys like Riga might begin to wonder how Mooney could control hundreds of men, men who would screw their own mothers for a dime. Once this realization dawned on Chuck, he tried to keep a low profile out of respect for Mooney's position, but an opportunity would come along for a little fun out with the guys, and his determination to be good would melt. Once again, he'd find himself back on the streets, resenting Mooney's authority. And besides, he told himself, he was only doing what everybody else did. Hanging out was what boys his age were supposed to do. It was the very last day of November, when Mooney had had enough of his younger brother's disobedience. Late one Friday night, at around two o'clock in the morning, he calmly loaded a five-gallon can of gasoline into the trunk of his car as Anne stood in her satin nightclothes in the doorway, hands on her hips. Don't do something you'll regret, she called out. He ignored her, not looking back or bothering to reply, but got in the car and drove straight to Paulina and Roosevelt, where he'd been told Chuck, Pepe, and their friends were carousing in an all-night diner. Just as Mooney expected, Joe and Golia's car was parked along the curb, he pretended not to see the boys. They were standing under a street light shooting craps, but then quickly ducked around the corner. From the safety of the shadows, Chuck couldn't really tell whether Mooney was mad. He didn't slam his car door or stomp through the street. If anything, Mooney seemed amazingly controlled. The boys watched as he soberly opened his trunk and carried the can of gasoline over to Joe's Model A. Methodically, he doused the hood and opened the car door, placing the gas can almost gently on the seat. He walked to the front of the car and leaned casually against the hood as he lit a cigar. What's he going to do? Joe whispered. Whatever it is, Pepe answered, it's not going to be good. 
After a few minutes, Mooney called out at the top of his lungs, Hey, Pepe, Chuck, I know you're out there. What did I fucking tell you? I know you can hear me, so listen and watch real good. He reached into the pocket of his coat and pulled out a box of matches. He lit one and held it up. Your fucking travels are over for good, he yelled. And with that, he tossed the match in the door. Flames burst up with a sudden rushing hiss. Thick black smoke began pouring from the windows. Standing back from the fire, Mooney started to laugh. You won't be riding around in this fucking heap again. Maybe now you punk bastards will learn a thing or two about fucking respect. He threw the box of matches down and walked to his car. When the gas can exploded in a roar of metal and shrapnel, he didn't even flinch or look back. Instead, he got in his car and drove off down the street. Within moments, Joe's car was demolished. It burned and crackled, threatening to explode, until all that remained was a large blackened cinder with rims instead of tires. There had been people along the street when it happened. Most, seeing Mooney, made themselves scarce. If Mooney Giancana wanted to burn down the entire neighborhood, no one would have lifted a finger to stop him. The backlash wasn't worth it. The boys didn't go home that night. They sat in the alley whispering among themselves while the car glowed like an ember until sunrise. It still was smoking when the sun was straight up in the sky and they'd grown cold and tired. They wrapped some dish rags they'd gotten from the diner's sympathetic cook around their hands and wrestled open the car's charred doors. The seats were too hot to sit on, so they squatted down. Amazingly, on the first try, the engine started, and they decided to attempt to drive it back to Joe's place. Making their way through the patch, the rims clanged along with an ear-splitting racket. Clang, clang, clang! They clattered over the uneven brick streets. Foul-smelling smoke spewed from under the hood, and they coughed and choked on the fumes. Shop owners came out of their shops to see what was making so much racket. Gossips on stoops paused in mid-sentence, and red-faced vendors stopped haggling with choosy buyers. Even women with soap suds in their hands rushed to poke their heads out of windows. They all wanted to see what was making so much noise, and when they did, they laughed and pointed and lined the street as if it was a parade. The Angolia family wasn't so jovial at the sight of what had been their pride and joy, but when told the perpetrator had been Mooney Giancana, they decided to let it pass. Chuck couldn't get over how the Angolias clammed up and took it, even though he'd known they wouldn't have any other choice. No matter what Mooney did, no one ever stood up to him, not when they heard thousands of tales of Mooney's vengeance, and certainly not when a prime example of his destructive capabilities sat right outside the door. That was the bottom line, and because of that, Chuck really couldn't blame them. Chapter 8 Mooney's temper, although well known from his 42 gang days in the neighborhood, had actually cooled and taken a different turn since he'd met Ange. Women, like Chuck's sisters, always try to attribute such a change in a man's behavior to his marriage. But Chuck didn't think the change in Mooney had anything to do with Ange. Mooney still got mad inside, but he just didn't express it the same way. Never let anybody know what you're thinking, he told Chuck. Don't get mad, get even, and the other guy won't be expecting it. He won't know what hit him. Somehow people must have figured out that no matter how Mooney acted, they weren't off the hook. From Principe the tailor to Claudio the baker, and everyone in between, people went out of their way to be nice to him more and more. And stories about guys like Mike or some other sap who got out of line probably helped perpetuate the fear. In five short years, from 1933 to 1938, Mooney had become the model of composure. Chuck saw him sit at the garage for hours, totally expressionless, while guys rambled on and on. He'd lean back, arms folded, and it was hard to tell whether he was even listening. Every now and then he'd raise one eyebrow. That was it. No other sign of reaction. He could just as quickly turn to one of his soldiers and quietly order a hit as he could order a cup of coffee. It was impossible for an outsider to tell which— at home, however, Chuck didn't see his brother waste any time or energy controlling his temper. He exploded at Ange and the two girls whenever he felt like it. It was near Thanksgiving when Chuck got a chance to see how little Mooney's temperament had really changed and how little influence his wife exerted. He and Mooney listened to the Charlie McCarthy radio show and talked for hours after dinner. 
It was probably midnight when Mooney got a call from Murray Humphreys. Chuck went into bed. Chuck hadn't planned to eavesdrop, but his brother and sister-in-law were making such a racket he couldn't resist. He knew Mooney had knocked Ange around a few times, and as he crept down the hallway, he imagined this fight was about the same thing, other women. How many women Mooney had on the line, Chuck couldn't guess, but there had to be several. There was the woman at the envelope factory and the showgirls from the nightclubs along Rush Street. Chuck's sisters knew about some of them, so he assumed Ange's friends did also. And that meant his sister-in-law knew about Mooney's infidelities as well. So you're going out? Why so late? For what? Ange yelled. Peering around the doorway, Chuck could see her brow was pinched into a half-puzzled, half-accusing expression. She seemed ready to cry from the cracked sound in her voice. Mooney had his coat and tie on and his hat in his hand. For business, goddammit! Business, Ange! Can't you stop this? You remind me of the goddamned coppers! He turned his back to her and started toward the door. No, I can't. Don't go out that door without telling me who you're going to see tonight. Chuck could hardly believe his ears. Nobody ever ordered Mooney around, and he knew the reaction would be swift. Mooney spun around and threw his hat down on the sofa. His eyes were narrowed and his jaw clenched. Or you'll do what, Ange? Do you think you can threaten me? He stepped toward her with his hand poised to strike. Instinctively, she drew back. Don't you know better than to ask me about business by now? He continued. Jesus Christ, don't ask questions. And never, ever tell me what I will or won't do. You got that, do you? He hissed the words, edging closer to her with a cunning purposefulness. His body swayed like a fighter, waiting to throw a punch. Do you hear me, Ange? He grabbed her by her shoulders and shook her. Do you? She pulled away. Stop, you're hurting me, she said, whimpering as she rubbed her arms beneath the soft satin robe. You're losing your mind. That's what's going on here, Mooney exclaimed. And I'm not seeing another woman, if that's what all this is about. She was stunned by his directness. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Why can't you admit it? Why? Can't you tell the truth? Her voice was getting progressively louder and more strained. What difference does it make? I've been humiliated enough by now. Do you think I'm one of your brainless little tramps? Do you think I'm a total fool? That I'm blind? Oh, you want truth? he said, sneering. I'll give you the goddamn truth, then. You're a goddamned pain in the neck. That's what you are. And nobody on earth would blame a man for anything he did to a nagging woman like you. How can you say that? I just wanted to be like it used to be, Mooney, before we were married. You acted like I was the most beautiful girl in the world, like you loved me. Chuck recognized a familiar pleading in her words, and thought of all the times he'd begged Mooney not to hit him. She knew what was coming. She had to. Act. I don't like that word. Why don't you think about that word act for a while? Yeah, I acted like I loved you. You forgot who you were dealing with. I hate you. God, I hate you. Oh, you do? Well, then you aren't going to like this. He slapped her across the face and then shoved her against the wall. Placing his hands around her throat, he almost touched his lips to hers. He paused, breathing hard, and then whispered huskily, God damn it, Ange, what's wrong with you? You make me crazy. When are you going to finally believe me? There's nobody else. I'm sorry. I didn't mean a word I said. God, I love you. He kissed her. She burst into tears. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. But please, Mooney, tell me the truth. He looked her square in the eye. I'm not seeing anyone else, and I never have. I never would. He pulled her close. I love you. Angeline de Tolve Giancana, just you. He held her face in his hands and kissed her hard. When he stopped, she seemed limp and breathless, as if he'd somehow managed to drain all the anger, all the life, out of her. He put his hands on her shoulders and held her at arm's length. Now go ahead and go to bed. I have to go out for a while. He turned steely again, and all tenderness dropped from his face. He picked up his hat and went out the door. After Mooney left, Ange stood there for a few minutes and then walked over and sat down. She didn't move for a long time, all alone in her beautifully furnished apartment. She started to cry. For Chuck, what little was left of their picture-perfect life had crumbled right before his eyes. She was so alone. He suddenly wanted to hold her. He felt a kinship with this woman who was, in so many ways, a stranger to him. She hated Mooney, all right. 
And she loved him, too, just like every other person in his world. That was Mooney's secret. He lured you to his snare, and he knew your weakness, what bait to use. For some it was approval, for others, love, or money and what it could buy. Each one ended up like some struggling, soulless animal that he hated for its weakness. But remarkably, somehow, he made you thankful in the end, made you feel guilty for hating him for hating you. It was totally insane. Chuck didn't have the slightest idea what Ange did or what she thought about, what made her smile, or laugh like you were supposed to at Christmas and on birthdays. Not a ghost of an idea. But he knew what she and Mooney were all about, and it made him sad. He felt a pain fill his heart. As he stood there in the darkened hallway, the sadness swept over him like the fog did in the patch early in the morning. He wanted to cry for her. He may not know her as a real human being, but neither did Mooney, and that, he thought, was the saddest thing of all. He left her to her private hell and went to bed. The next day, Ange and Mooney smiled and went about the house as if nothing had ever happened. Mooney asked her whether she'd like to go out to see the movie Holiday with Cary Grant and Catherine Hepburn. She gushed and fluttered like a schoolgirl on her first date. It wasn't that they never went out. Mooney made sure they went out at least once a week. When they did, Chuck thought they looked like movie stars. and swept her hair high in her head, swathed herself in furs and diamonds. Mooney was perfectly groomed and dressed in a finely tailored suit. They cut an impressive figure, and when they strolled out the door arm in arm, they practically smelled of money. The confrontation between Mooney and Ange hadn't really changed anything. Mooney just cut back a bit on his nightly outings for a while, and Ange stopped whining and nagging. He bought her a new mink stole and a big diamond cocktail ring as penance, and she was satisfied. It was a destructive cycle. Like the changing seasons, weeks would go by when everything seemed as if it was back to normal, and then little by little, Mooney would get progressively more distant, and Chuck's sister-in-law increasingly anxious and suspicious, the mood would build like a slow-gathering storm, until the tension was so thick Chuck could taste it, like a coming rain in the air. He could almost predict an approaching fight between the two. They had a rhythm of certainty. It was always the same. First Ange became sullen and bitter, nagging and complaining day after day. Finally she would burst into a torrent of tears and accusations. In response, Mooney would push her around, smack her a few times, and then Ange would cry and say she was sorry. At that, Mooney would kiss her and tell her he loved her more than anyone else in the whole wide world. Chuck guessed it was true. Mooney did love Ange as a wife, although he wasn't quite sure what that meant anymore. From watching Mooney, he knew there was a difference between a wife and a girlfriend, or a friend for that matter. A man didn't confide in his wife, nor did he ever show any sign of emotional weakness. He was in control, and Mooney lived up to that description perfectly. If he ever did express any real feelings, Chuck hadn't seen them, if there was even such a thing in Mooney's personality. Indeed, Mooney was becoming more secretive, more cautious. As his power increased, his operations became more closely veiled. People around him got little pieces of information, parts of the jigsaw puzzle, but nobody but Mooney knew how it all fit together. Not Paul Rika and the bosses, not his underlings, such as Needles and Fat Leonard or Teats. Nobody. Chuck felt lucky to catch a few glimpses. He was one of the few people who'd ever followed Mooney around all day. And one thing he knew for sure was that the puzzle was getting bigger, and that Ange and Mooney's home life was just a tiny, almost remote piece. Mooney was basically discreet in his indiscretions. He saw women outside the family and made sure his outside pleasures stayed that way. His plan for a stable marriage had worked magnificently. Edge would never have considered actually leaving him. She had too much to lose, and he knew it. He'd been successful in making his wife the envy of all, and equally successful in making her relish it. As the years passed, it gave her pleasure to note that no one had a more finely furnished home, a better fur, a finer car, more stunning jewels and no one would have dared. The men who surrounded Mooney knew better. 
They asked permission before they bought a home or a car. A cut beneath Mooney and Ange was all one could strive for, the only acceptable option. Should another woman reveal, over a hand of gin rummy, her designs on a home or other luxury Ange perceived as better than her own, she told Mooney about it later during dinner, complaining bitterly. How much do you pay your men? How can they afford to buy their wives nicer things than I have? I don't think that's the way it should be. You should put a stop to it. And Mooney did. More than ever, they were the king and queen. Even if the silly, puff-brained women didn't understand how things worked, his men did. They learned quickly to stay in their place. Of course, some people had a harder time coming to grips with Mooney's domination. His brother-in-law, Tony Campo, squawked a lot, but after a decade of matrimonial hell for his sister Lena, it appeared Mooney had finally gotten Tony in line. Campbell was one of Mooney's soldiers, to Mooney a Cetriolo, a cucumber. He told Chuck he despised Campbell's weakness for gambling, the way it left Lena and the kids in near poverty, and the way it fell to him to make sure his sister had enough food on the table and a nice place to live. A snarling, dominating little man, barely five feet six, Tony Campbell enjoyed taking his frustrations out on his wife. It was no secret he knocked Lena around, which was one of the few things Chuck knew that still made Mooney go crazy. Almost monthly, Mooney stormed out of the house to Lena's rescue. In December of 1938, after receiving a tearful late-night call from his sister, Mooney erupted and raced across town with Chuck by his side and a thirty-eight in his pocket. Lena sat huddled on a stoop, waiting for them. Up close, Chuck could see the purple bruises left by Campo's fists, her lips were almost blue, and her teeth chattered in the frigid night air, as she told them through tears that Campo had thrown her out. Mooney went into the hallway and knocked almost politely on the door. In return, Campo yelled, Go the fuck away! Hey, Tony, it's me, Mooney. Open the door and let me in. We gotta talk. Chuck heard the door unlock and saw Campo cautiously peer out into the hall. Realizing Mooney seemed calm, Campo opened the door and said, So how the hell are you, Mooney? He shuffled over to pull up a chair. Hey, come on in. Have a seat. Mooney looked back over his shoulder at Chuck and Lena. Stay in the hall, he whispered, his thin lips hardly moving. He didn't come forward at Campbell's invitation, but stood in the doorway, watching his drunken brother-in-law's every move. He nodded in response to Tony's question. I'm doing fine, Tony, fine. What's going on here? Hey, she's no good as a wife, as nothing— she don't have the brains, Mooney, to do what her husband tells her. No good. She's no good. Mooney left the door open and moved toward the table. He took his top coat off, draping it neatly across the chair, and then sat down. Campo surveyed him warily. Come on, loosen up, Mooney. You want a drink? He put a bottle on the table. Yeah, I don't mind if I do, Mooney replied. Campo poured him a glass of wine. From the hall, Chuck couldn't tell what Mooney was doing. He didn't look as if he was mad. When they left the house, he felt certain Mooney was going to kill his brother-in-law. Now the two men looked more like old friends having a drink together. They sat there for a while, Tony nervously gulping down one drink after another, Mooney barely touching his. It felt like hours before Mooney reached into his pocket and pulled out the gun. He stood up. Chuck thought Campo's eyes got the look of a cow's just before it goes to slaughter. Okay, motherfucker, Mooney said, never raising his voice. Stand up. He motioned with the gun and walked around the table. Campbell was frozen in his chair. Mooney didn't say another word. Instead, he pulled the man up out of the chair and then, with an animal-like growl, threw him against the wall. Please, Mooney, please, don't do this. Campbell begged. Mooney rammed the nose of the gun in his stomach, and Campbell doubled over with a gasp. With one hand, he shoved him back up against the wall. You want to be a dead man, motherfucker? No, Mooney, no. I lost my temper. It's nothing. I love your sister. Chuck heard a click as Mooney cocked the revolver. Maybe I should just put this gun in your mouth, he said, laughing a low, mean laugh as he pushed the gun's nose against Campbell's lips pressing it on his fleshy mouth until he cried out in pain. Or maybe, Mooney dropped his hand to his side, maybe I should shove it up your fucking ass and pull the trigger. No, Mooney, no, please, God, please, no. 
Mooney lifted the gun back to Campo's ear and lowered his voice. Or maybe I shouldn't waste any more time. Maybe I should just blow your brains out and get it over with. All I have to do is pull the trigger, Tony. One, two, three, boom. You like that? You like that, Tony? Boom. And you're a fucking dead man. How about it? You want to die? No, Mooney, please. I'll never hit her again, ever. You have my word. Your word? Mooney laughed. Your word? You're a no-good motherfucking bum, Tony. That's what you are. Am I right? Am I? Answer me, Tony. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. You're right, Mooney. You're right. Mooney moved in close to Campo again. You know what would make me happy, Tony? Do you? Campo shook his head fearfully. I think I should make you eat this gun. That would make me happy. Yeah, I think I should stick it down your fucking throat and pull the trigger. That's what I think. Mooney smiled. Open up. What? Campo began sobbing now. No, Mooney. Please. No. No. Mooney pushed the man's head tight against the wall and forced the gun into his mouth. Open wide, Tony. I might slip and then boom. It's all over for Tony Campo. Crying, Campo opened his mouth. That's more like it. Yeah, that's better. Taste it. Taste the gun, Tony. It's cold, isn't it? But it gets hot when you pull the trigger. Can you taste the lead? It's in there. Can you taste it, Tony? Can you? Campo's eyes were wide with terror. Mooney pressed it farther, and Campo started to gag. How's it feel, huh? You like being fucked over? Nah, not much. I didn't think you would. Well, that's how my sister feels, and it's gonna stop or you're gonna die. He took the gun out of Campo's mouth. You hear me, Campo? You hear me? I don't want to ever hear about you laying a hand on my sister. Got that? Capiche? He pointed the gun directly at the man's head. Uh-huh. Campo nodded. Well then, fucking answer me. He moved the gun closer again. Yeah, I understand. I won't ever hurt Lena, ever. That's more like it. Now get the hell out of here before I change my mind and blow your goddamned head off. Campo rushed out the door past Chuck and Lena. In the car later, Mooney was quiet. Why didn't she just kill him, Mooney? I mean, the guy deserved it, Chuck said. You think I'd do that in front of my sister and her children? Goddamn animals act like that. If I was going to kill him, he'd be nowhere around them. Besides, Campo's a fool. He's not fucking worth it. And worse, he's a goddamn two-bit gambler. I got no respect for drunks or gamblers. Liquor and gambling control people, Chuck. Weak people. And when you know that about a guy, you know you've got him. And there are millions of dumb sons of bitches just like him, on every goddamn corner. They're sheep, and they'll never be anything else. You can own them. They're weak. Remember that. I still would have killed the bastard anyway, Chuck said angrily. Oh, you would? Mooney retorted. Well, here, smart guy. Mooney reached in his pocket and pulled out the gun. No, no, that's okay, Mooney, Chuck quickly replied. I don't want the gun. I didn't think so, Mooney said, and shoved it back in his pocket. Do you know what it's like to kill a man? He laughed. No, you don't. It's not like you think. Sometimes you don't even know the dumb bastard. It's not like you're mad at him or nothing. Sometimes you know the guy like he's your own best friend. He lit his cigar and took a long drag. You stalk him, so you get to know his habits, where he and his wife and kids live, where he keeps his girlfriend, and you know who his friends are, who can beat him at poker, and who can't. You know everything and nothing about the son of a bitch. Chuck watched the way Mooney's eyes lit up, as if they suddenly had come to life. There was a pleasure in his voice, a pride in his skill. So you wait it out till the time is right to make your move. Sometimes it's the dead of winter. You can feel the cold metal of the gun against your skin. Your feet are cold. You can almost hear your heartbeat. You're alive, really alive. More alive than in your whole fucking life. You stalk him like a cat. You get so close you can smell his cologne. And if you're out in a field somewhere, the air. Well, it's cleaner. You can breathe, Chuck. And the hair sticks up in your arms and the back of your neck. He sighed. You feel hot like you do in the back seat of a car with some bitch you've been dying to fuck. But better. Sometimes you want it to last, so you just play with a guy, toy with him a little bit. They always act the same. They beg you not to do it to him. 
When you finally do hit the bastard, he drops like a sack of potatoes right there at your feet. Sometimes, he said, chuckling, you push a guy and you look down later at your new suit and see how he bled like a stuck pig all over you, and it makes you mad. You wish you could fucking kill him all over again. As Mooney talked, Chuck's throat went dry. His heart pounded in his chest, and he felt sick to his stomach. He thought about the whistling man. When Mooney mentioned about his hair standing up on his arms, the little hairs up and down the back of Chuck's scalp had tingled with anxiety. It scared him. He was afraid, all right, of his brother as much as his story. He knew Mooney was cold, but he'd never heard him talk about it. No thought for the other guy. It was all business. And that was what made it all right. But what about the guy's wife? What about the guy's kids? He sat in silence, stunned by the realization that to Mooney, they didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Nothing at all. Less than a month later, on January 17, 1939, the John Connor family got some bad news. Treasury agents had raided the sill in Garden Prairie and arrested Mooney along with his cohorts. Chuck was with Ange when she got the call, and he thought she might go into a swoon. Her knees crumpled as she put the phone down and turned to him, sobbing, Oh, my God, what will we do without Mooney? He couldn't reply at first. The idea that Mooney might be caught by the coppers and sent away to prison again hadn't crossed his mind in years. Everything had been going along so well. Mooney was starting to treat him like a man, as if he was somebody other than just a little brother. If he left, their lives and all their plans for the future, his as well as Ange's and the kids, would be swept away. He looked at Ange slumped across the table and simply shook his head, saying, I don't know what will happen if he goes away. I just don't know. Ange began to cry. When the trial came up in May of 1939, the judge went light on the locals who had provided the barns and mash, but he let the wrath of the law come to bear on the Chicago punks. Convinced he would receive a lighter sentence, Mooney reversed his not guilty plea and was sentenced on nine counts, receiving four years, with fines and court costs of over three thousand dollars. By October 1939, Mooney was on his way to Leavenworth, Kansas. Like Murray Humphreys, Mooney referred to his upcoming stint in prison as school, but unlike Humphreys, who told reporters as he'd left for Leavenworth back in 1934, while I'm down there I intend to study English and maybe a little geometry, Mooney would learn something he hadn't yet dreamed of, something that would change the face of Chicago and his own life forever. Chapter 9 I used to think all shines were stupid. Stupid and lazy, that's what I thought, Mooney said. Just a few weeks out of prison, he breathed in the cold air with seeming relish and turned to face Chuck. But man, oh man, was I ever wrong. He shook his head and continued, lowering his voice to a husky whisper. Chuck, there are shines on the south side you wouldn't believe it. Shines who make millions, more than you can imagine. He paused, as if he didn't believe what he was saying himself. How? Chuck asked. There was a light covering of snow on the steps, and it crunched under his feet as he shifted back and forth to stay warm. He wasn't wearing a coat. He never did. It was a habit that was a holdover from his childhood, when they couldn't afford any winter clothes. Policy, Chuck. Policy. Policy? Really? Chuck was incredulous. I thought that was just nickel and dime shit for the colored people. Mooney laughed and grinned. So did I. But, Chuck, it's more than that. It's a hell of a lot more. Dutch Schultz out of New York knew that back in the 30s. The guy made a million dollars a day on policy. Shit, I'm not even sure how policy works, Mooney. It's real simple. It's a kind of lottery. You pick some numbers and bet on them. With a nickel bet, you could win five bucks. As much as two thousand dollars on a two-dollar bet. Jesus Christ, Chuck whistled, impressed. That's a dollar on a penny. That's right. But the real beauty is anybody can play. Everybody's got a nickel to spare. And there isn't a soul on the South Side who doesn't play. They all do. It's not the big buck heavy gambler shit. It's for the everyday people. And they've got a lot more dreams than the big guys. A nickel could buy them their dream. And poor people live on dreams. Chuck knew the colored weren't alone in that. Every person he'd ever met in the patch had a dream. 
As a kid, he'd thought he was the only one who dreamed of being somebody, of commanding respect. But as he'd grown up, he realized everybody in the neighborhood had a dream. It's what kept people going, the reason they got out of bed in the morning. Policy isn't the big one-time score. It's volume, Chuck. Volume. Like I said, everybody plays. But the percentages are always with the house. Volume. And Chuck, pennies make nickels, nickels make dimes, and goddammit, dimes make dollars. Millions of dollars. He paused and continued. You'd think somebody would have heard about this before now in Chicago, but it belongs to the Shines, and who the hell pays any attention to them? Even Capone didn't. Years ago, Capone had his chance and turned it down. He didn't see the profit in it. Mooney leaned on the rail and gazed out into the street. Remember when they let me transfer from Leavenworth to Terre Haute? Yeah. You told them you needed to be close to your family, right? Chuck chuckled his brother's obvious ruse. Right. Well, anyway, that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Besides getting out of school a year early, because when I got to Terre Haute, I met Eddie Jones, a colored policy guy. Mooney's words took on a dreamlike quality. Jones says the whole thing started back in the old days, in New Orleans, back in slave times. He moved up the river and north with the shines till it reached Chicago. Pretty soon everybody in the colored neighborhood played. Wash women, street sweepers, ministers, you name it. He paused and shivered. Hey, what do you say we go have a drink? They headed for one of Chuck's favorite dives, the Little Wheel, on California and Lexington. It's all so clear, Chuck, Mooney continued, once they were in the warmth of the car and on their way. Nobody in the syndicate knows. Nobody. They never dreamed the colored bosses were raking so much in. Nobody knows but me. He looked over at Chuck and smiled a broad, smug smile. Well, what good does no one do us? Chuck asked. Coloreds don't let whites in on their action, ever. What the hell good does it do knowing that a handful of smart shines are making a killing, while us Italians are over here making peanuts? He paused for a moment and then answered his own question. Nah, nah. It wouldn't do us one damn bit of good. You know I'm right about that, Mooney. Unless one of them let an Italian guy in. Yeah. Mooney nodded his head in agreement. Well, one will. Who, that Eddie Jones guy? Yeah, Eddie Jones. And oh man, you're fucking kidding, Mooney, aren't you? He'll let you in? They'd reached the bar, and Mooney stopped the car and turned to Chuck. Oh, he'll let me in, all right. We've got a deal. When Eddie gets out of prison, we're partners. Meanwhile, I'm going to work with his brother, George. Hell, it's smart business. Good for him and good for the Italians. And very good for Mooney Giancana. He grinned and opened the door. It was jumping in the little wheel, crowded and noisy. A jukebox blared out a scratchy Jimmy Dorsey tune. The place smelled of stale beer and cheap perfume. Smoke hung in the air, casting a cold blue film over the room. As Mooney led Chuck to a booth in the back, the bartender called out a greeting. A few guys gathered around and told Mooney how glad they were he was back in town, how it hadn't been the same without him, and then respectfully went back to slouch over their red-lipped girlfriends and drinks. They ordered scotch. Doubles, Mooney said to a pock-faced waiter they called Goldie because of his gold tooth, and leaned back in their chairs. Chuck couldn't get over the way things had changed since Mooney had gotten out of prison. Those three years at school, as Mooney and Ange referred to his prison stay, had made a hell of a difference. Chuck was twenty now, and Mooney treated him like a man, an almost equal. When Mooney came home right before Christmas in 1942, as a result of early parole, things changed between them for the better. All the days and nights he'd watched over Ange in Mooney's absence, carted over the envelopes stuffed with money from Guzik, Fat Leonard, and the guys for her and the kids, all the errands he'd run, all the chauffeuring to places like Marshall Field, where she continued to buy designer dress after dress, it had all paid off. He hadn't done it for any other reason than that he thought it was the right thing to do, but now he realized it had been more than that. His loyalty had earned him something he didn't think he'd ever achieve. Mooney's respect and gratitude. Mooney never said anything, but he didn't have to. Their drinks came, and Chuck's dark brown eyes searched his brother for more information about this latest venture. As if reading his mind, Mooney went on to relate the story of the Jones policy empire. He told Chuck that by the thirties, Eddie and his brothers had the most lucrative policy wheels in black Chicago. They've got over a thousand soldiers working for them, and the money, you won't believe it, 
There's so much that they have to carry it to their headquarters over on South Michigan in fucking bushel baskets. Over $50,000 a day. So much money, they have to divide it between 25 different banks. Chuck whistled. Wow, he said. Not one easily satisfied with a simple gambling enterprise, Jones had invested his earnings in legitimate businesses, purchasing a Ben Franklin store, four hotels, a food market, and several apartment buildings. But of all of Jones's holdings, Mooney was most impressed with his international villas. The guy's got a place, a fucking mansion in Mexico, and another one in France. To hear Mooney talk, Eddie Jones lived like royalty. His wife was a beautiful cotton club queen from New York, who dressed in exquisite diamonds and furs. Their home in Chicago was furnished lavishly with antique tapestries, oil paintings, and real gold fixtures in the baths. Mooney didn't have to say it. What Jones had was everything Mooney had always wanted, and more. Chuck watched his brother's face in the ice-blue light of the bar. It hardened with determination as his story wound down. So what's next, then? I mean, what happens with Jones and all? Chuck asked, as he leaned forward on his elbows and swished the amber liquid pensively around in his glass. What's next is policy, Chuck. I've got meetings with George Jones tomorrow morning at their Ben Franklin and a meeting with Paul Rica and Jack Guzik tomorrow night. Once those guys see there's money in this, big money, well, shit, I'll have the nod. And then I'm on my way. He smiled broadly. Yeah, I'm on my way. Mooney was well aware that his Chicago superiors had other, more pressing concerns to address that year, things more important, at least on the surface, than any gambling venture Mooney might propose. He told Chuck later that approaching the bosses while they were trying to finagle their way out of a federal indictment, the Brown Buyoff case, made all the sense in the world. Maybe I should have asked for the moon. The guys were so distracted by this federal rap, I probably would have gotten it, he said, eyes twinkling. Like most of America, Chuck had heard all about the gangland Hollywood scandal. Three years earlier, federal agencies had begun digging into the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees and Motion Picture Operators, headed by Chicago's one-time pimp and union man, Willie Byoff. But the feds on Earth was an incredible trail of corruption that led right up to, but stopped short of, for lack of evidence, Chicago's top men. Byoff and George Brown were ultimately convicted of labor racketeering. Meanwhile, their most easily nabbed partner in crime, 20th Century Fox producer Joe Shank, a man Mooney said had funneled more than half a million to Roosevelt's campaign for the syndicate through Postmaster General Farley, was also imprisoned for not paying taxes on the $400,000 in payoffs he received from Chicago. According to Mooney, Roosevelt later repaid this underworld donation to his political campaign by making labor gangster and president of amalgamated clothing workers Sidney Hillman a frequent White House guest and his most prominent labor advisor. Additionally, Roosevelt agreed to make a person whom Mooney called their boy, Harry Truman, chairman of the Democratic National Committee and his vice presidential running mate. Mooney told Chuck that the possibility of buy-off implicating his superiors had been a legitimate concern to Rika and the other bosses, and consequently, Byoff's life wasn't worth two cents, which was probably what had led Byoff to start talking to the feds that year. Chicago had continued to conduct their Hollywood business as usual, with Johnny Roselli at the helm after Byoff's conviction, but now Byoff's testimony would put the entire upper echelon of Chicago's syndicate in jeopardy. Mooney seemed strangely happy about the whole affair. Won't it hurt the syndicate if Rika and the guys go off to prison? Chuck asked. Won't things fall apart? Mooney smiled secretively. No, not if there's someone Rika can trust to work with Guzik and Humphreys, somebody smart with the muscle to keep things in line, the guy who can step in and handle things. Well, he smiled again. That guy will have it made. Shit, Rika and those guys could be facing ten years. That's ten years, Chuck, for another guy to get to. Well... Let's put it this way, to get to wherever he wants, to the top. Mooney told Chuck that the studios were too lucrative to abandon. We're not about to turn our back on so much money and power. He's had relationships with men like Columbia's Harry Cohn, Warner Brothers' Harry Warner, and Louis B. Mayer of MGM were far too important to Chicago's future. Besides, he added, those guys are more than business contacts. They're our friends now. 
Roselli's got them in his pocket. With Mooney getting the go-ahead that winter to move more heavily into gambling, particularly the policy rackets, he rapidly began setting his plan in motion. He divided his territory by race and city wards. The colored section was reserved for policy, or numbers as it came to be called by whites, looking to give the game more class, while the white neighborhoods would be graced with the more traditional forms of gambling such as poker, craps, and horse racing. To oversee his little empire, Mooney bestowed the job of underboss on Fat Leonard Caifano. Under Mooney's direction, Fat Leonard made substantial progress. In the white wards, utilizing legitimate taverns and restaurants as fronts, he set up book joints, many with back rooms for poker and the like. Any competitors were given an ultimatum, join up with Mooney or join the other saps in the graveyard. After making good on that promise with a few guys who stood in their way, other joints fell right in line, and it wasn't long before Mooney controlled no fewer than two hundred operations throughout the city of Chicago and another two dozen in the county, each averaging a healthy two thousand a month. Not one to leave any money on the table, Leonard solicited the assistance of individual bookies to work the hundreds of thriving factories and taverns. Penetrating the colored policy rackets was another matter. Until Eddie Jones was released from prison and gave his support, progress would be slow. Colored gamblers wouldn't play a white man's wheel, and few colored policy men were willing to serve as front men for the cutthroat Italians, despite the monetary reward. In the white neighborhoods, Mooney's ventures fared much better. When word got out that the syndicate was making a push into gambling, and there was money to be made, the more ambitious, legitimate businessmen flocked to Fat Leonard in hopes of setting up their own book joint. But more often than not, Leonard put a trusted Italian soldier in charge as manager, with instructions to employ guys from the old neighborhood. Take care of our people first, was Mooney's motto. Depending on the size of the place, the manager hired one or two cashiers, several scratch sheet writers, and a lookout for ten dollars each day. Once business got underway, the scratch sheet writers scurried about, receiving telephone updates continually through a wire service at local and national tracks, and revised the odds on each race. The joints hummed. All over the city, cashiers raked in the dough, and lookouts stared endlessly out the door for any sign of a raid, which was highly unlikely given that Leonard had paid off the necessary coppers. "'As sure as the goddamn sun will rise tomorrow,' Mooney said to Chuck one night that winter, the captain will get his two hundred dollars for every book joint in his district. And Mooney was more than happy to pay it. He thought the syndicate got off cheap. If the coppers found out this operation will bring in five million this year, he said, laughing, we'd have to make them full partners. At the end of each month, the managers totaled the profits in order to make books with Leonard's bag man, and then the cash was taken to Mooney. There it was counted again. Nobody could say Mooney wasn't generous. He made sure cash bonuses were delivered each month to his managers and their men, but Mooney's bonuses could never be predicted. One month a guy might get a thousand bucks, the next one hundred for doing exactly the same thing. It never made any sense to his soldiers, which was exactly the way Mooney liked it. You gotta keep him guessing, Chuck, he said. Never let your men think you're completely satisfied with their job. They'll work harder when they're worried about what you're thinking, and what might happen if you ever get real fed up. Don't make work just a measly paycheck. Make it life and death. In March, while Chuck was just starting a job as a lookout at a book joint Mooney had invested in on 65th and Cicero, news came of the indictment against Paul Rica, Frank Nitti, Phil D'Andrea, Louis Campagna, Frank Maratodi, Johnny Roselli, and Charlie Joy. Mooney told Chuck that Rika had instructed Nitti to take the rap for the rest of the guys, confessing he'd acted alone or else. Perceived as Chicago's boss by authorities, the ineffectual nitty would most certainly be believed, and, Rika reasoned, considered quite a prize, practically guaranteeing the real conspirators their freedom. Chuck secretly wondered what a confession from nitty and the acquittal of the other syndicate men would do to Mooney's plans. But nitty, faced with Rika's ultimatum, committed suicide, leaving Rika and his boys to face the charges without a fall guy. Found guilty and sentenced to ten years in prison, Rika appointed Tony Accardo as boss of Chicago's Underworld, with Humphreys and Guzik as advisors. Mooney saw the transition as his big opportunity to move up within the ranks 
and wasted no time solidifying his own power base. By the time the sensationalized Brown buy-off case was underway, Chuck was making $75 a week in his position as a lookout. It was good money at the time, but he was still disappointed. He continued to live at home with Antonio and his brother and three sisters. His other sister, Mary, had gotten married through an old country arrangement, and now they saw her only occasionally. He found being at home depressing. Chuck had given up on his father, ever amounting to anything more than a vegetable peddler. Antonio had opened and closed more stores than anyone could remember. Living under the same roof with the man was almost more than Chuck could bear. His father's low station in life contrasted sharply with Mooney's success, offering a constant reminder of what Chuck might be if he failed to hit it with his brother. What Chuck wanted most was some real action, a pretty wife, and some big bucks. In the past few years he'd had his fill of whores, fast Polak broads, and penny ante crap games. Looking at the older men, most of them old 42 members, who surrounded his brother, it seemed everybody had gotten a piece of the big time but him. He obediently carted the small-time gamblers from Madison and Des Plaines to the book joint in Cicero that early spring in 1943, and dutifully kept his eye on the door for any sign of the coppers, but the truth was he was bored. Worse, the other syndicate guys who worked the place, among them Fat Leonard, were nervous around him. They thought he was a spy for his brother, and it made them skittish and untalkative, always afraid they might say or do the wrong thing. The only real excitement came when there was a raid— he was always tipped off in advance, and at the sight of Chicago's finest rushing toward the door, he yelled out to the cashiers, Clean up! In an instant, the large scratch sheets showered down from the walls like dandruff, leaving the joint's back wall as slick and shiny bare as a bald man's pate. Nevertheless, the coppers always had a look around, and then, disappointed, shrugged their blue-suited shoulders, and went off on another wild goose chase. That was Chuck's big excitement and he thought he was further than ever from big-time hoods in his brother's domain. With the war against Japan already in full swing by the spring of 1943, Americans were asked to further tighten their belts. Consumption of sugar was limited to two pounds per month per family, and ten million people were scraping by, in the name of patriotism, on as little as six gallons of gas a week. Ever enterprising, Mooney saw a lucrative opportunity for another racket, hustling stolen ration coupons, and busily set out to turn a profit on the nation's hardship. As Mooney expected, there was a ready market for the thousands of coupons his soldiers stole from Chicago's government warehouses. And like his New York counterparts, shit, Gambino and Luciano are making millions on stamps, he explained to Chuck. He found plenty of people looking to make a fast buck themselves, people willing to pay his men, who scrambled from one end of the city to the other, top dollar. From mom-and-pop neighborhood groceries and gas stations to the highfalutin businessmen and politicians downtown, Mooney's list of contacts and men who owed him a return favor some day grew. Thanks to a war raging in the Pacific, business boomed for Mooney. And while other women in the United States were learning what rivets were, or struggling with hoes in tiny victory gardens, and as other women pined for the silken touch of a pair of nylons, or the extravagance of chiffon and woolen yard goods, Ange began to enjoy a more lavish lifestyle. World War II brought no hardship to the John Connor household. Mooney wore trousers graced with sumptuous cuffs, and Ange's drawers and closets, as well as those of her daughters, Bonnie and Annette, were filled to overflowing with stylish leather shoes and other such black market luxuries. Most homemakers carted heaps of fat they'd saved for the war effort down to the corner butcher, or dreamed of the latest washer and dryer while rationing their meager supply of sugar for a few dozen holiday cookies. But Ange was a lady of privilege. She had the latest appliances, and through extravagant card and tea parties that featured linen-covered tables heaped high with cakes and confections too dear for most. Tarts, mints, and sugar-laced ladyfingers sweetened her friend's palates. Mooney's fare, however, was beginning to leave a sour taste, in some of the more important bosses' mouths, notably Guzik's and Humphreys's. Told of Mooney's success in amassing new gambling ventures, the old guard was starting to get nervous. Word on the street was that Mooney was moving too fast, that he was an insane, cold-blooded killer, and worse, a goddamned upstart. In April, Mooney decided to get the big boys in line and settle the score once and for all. 
He'd establish his supremacy by doing something so absolutely crazy that only a 42 would have thought of it. He'd kidnap Jake Guzik, his friend and mentor, the man considered the syndicate's elder statesman, the same man who'd given Mooney his old suits for Antonio. Mooney gave Guzik what he considered a reasonable choice. The kindly old man could either accept Mooney's gift of $200,000 and support him, getting Humphreys and the rest of the syndicate powers to do the same, or get a bullet in the brain. It was up to him. After two days in a condemned building in Cicero with a gun to his head, Guzik came to a wise decision. Mooney and his ventures had his wholehearted support. Mooney drove Jake to West Roosevelt Road and let him out, and that was that. Already shaken by the Brown Buy-Off case, the rest of the syndicate fell right in line, just as Jake had promised. The caper with Guzik left Mooney busier than ever before. There were new men to get on board. Jake Guzik's protege, the Greek Gussie Alex, who was a premier political fixer, the old-time Capone slot machine king, Eddie Vogel, and the North Side's Ross Prio. He had to meet as well with longtime Capone advisors and financiers, Abe Pritzker and Art Green, and the local politico, Jake Arvey. Mooney's days and nights were filled with backroom meetings and whispered orders to his men. He was making his move. When he could get away from his job at the book joint, Chuck went along with Mooney on his daily rounds. Seeing Mooney hold court at Louis' gas station again, conducting business just as in the old days, made everything seem right with the world. Fat Leonard sat there as he always had, slurping down a cup of lukewarm coffee, while nearby, needles lit cigarette after cigarette, and the men, coppers, politicians, businessmen, and beggars, filed in one by one, just to have a word with Mooney. Occasionally a familiar look would cross Mooney's face, and Chuck knew Needles would soon be taking some poor slob for a ride out in the country. The guy would be lucky to escape with a brutal beating. Mooney never gave a second thought to pushing, killing, a guy if he got in his way, or if he just needed to set an example. People were like pawns to be shoved around in the context of a bigger game. It was a calculated view of life Chuck didn't like to think about and when he did, it bothered him. But he knew damned well that if he let Mooney's tactics get under his skin, he had no place to turn. The vision of his father hawking watermelons always came to mind, quieting any misgivings. After wrapping up at Louis, they jump in Mooney's souped-up Buick and head into the heart of the city, where Mooney usually ended the day, after stopping countless times for hushed strategy sessions at Chicago's biggest book joint. It always amused Mooney that the syndicate's largest operation sat directly across the street on Canal and Van Buren from the city's main U.S. post office. But he told Chuck they had the okay from the city fathers to run the joint, that the place was protected from raids thanks to a few large payoffs in the right pockets, pockets that went all the way up to the governor. There were four large gambling joints like this one downtown, which Mooney operated with partners Gus Alex, Russ Prio, and Eddie Vogel, Proceeds averaged well over fifty grand a month at each location, with annual revenues of two to three million dollars. At first glance, the white stone building on Canal and Van Buren didn't look like much to Chuck, but once Mooney led him up to the second floor and through the immense double doors, he discovered a gambler's paradise. There were scratch sheets on the back wall for the horses, crap tables and poker games ran twenty-four hours a day. The clientele ranged from postal workers to coppers and everything in between. There were always plenty of good-looking women roaming from table to table, and the drinks were good. Mooney rarely had a drink, or if he ordered one, he scarcely drank it. More than once he reminded Chuck that drinking makes you stupid. Let the other guy get drunk and spill his guts, not you. At night the book joint was like a rowdy class reunion. Fat Leonard and his brother Marshall, Fifi Bukhari, Needles, Teats Pataglia, Wheelie Potatoes, all the old 42s would gather at a table for a few hands of poker. Sometimes Gus Alex, Murray Humphreys, Jake Guzik, Eddie Vogel, and Russ Priel would join them for a game with her own entourage of underlings. To Mooney's 42 followers and the other bosses, the gatherings at the book joint were social events. The guys laughed and gossiped like old hens. But to Mooney, the meetings were strictly business. Everything Mooney did was strictly business. Mooney studied the way a guy laughed, the way one guy acquiesced to another, even if they were just horsing around. He paid attention to little things such as who sat where. 
He absorbed every last detail. Nothing escaped his scrutiny. He was constantly evaluating the people around him, finding their vulnerability, assessing their worth, deciding whether they were right for the next job or if they weren't. Chuck thought the most impressive thing about Mooney was the way he could be doing all that without anybody knowing it. The guys couldn't read Mooney, ever. It also amazed Chuck how Mooney was never wrong when he sized a guy up. The slightest move in the wrong direction, and it would be all over for a guy's future. He wouldn't even be aware that Mooney had decided his fate. The guy might not lose his life, but Mooney would slowly cut him out of his. And once Mooney was done with the guy, for whatever reason, it was over. The guy would never get a break, not as long as Mooney pulled all the strings. Never trust anybody you didn't grow up with, Chuck, Mooney told him. Those people you understand, you can predict. A new guy, you gotta fucking watch him. You don't know what makes him tick, if he'll be there when he's supposed to. Is a guy a coward? You don't know, unless you've seen him stare down the barrel of a gun. Guys from the neighborhood, I know them better than their mothers. Forget about their wives and girlfriends. I know them better than they know themselves. I keep a file, he tapped his temple with one finger, right here, and I remember every move a guy's ever made, so I always know exactly what his next move is going to be. Behind his back, Mooney was called a lot of things, a ruthless bastard, a cold killer. But one thing he could never be accused of was going back on his word. Mooney believed a man's word was his bond, and keeping a promise was the honorable thing to do. He told Chuck, as they drove from meeting to meeting, that that was at the heart of why he'd never liked politicians and celebrities. He said they wanted power so badly, they'd sell their souls just to get a movie contract or be elected to some lousy post, that their word wasn't worth two cents. But for the same two cents, there wasn't one he couldn't buy. Maybe it was from watching Diamond Joe or Rika and Humphreys operate for so many years, but Mooney recognized that a guy's ego was his biggest weakness. They're all alike, he said. Look at President Roosevelt. Shit, he got to the White House thanks to syndicate money. We used Hollywood and Joe Shank to funnel money to his campaign, and Joe Kennedy up in Boston, too. He gave him millions. Roosevelt's got a lot of favors to pay back. Or look at guys like Jimmy Durante and fighters like Graziano. They want to be big-time stars, and with us, they can. Or how about our congressman, Jimmy Aducci, or Andy Akins, our friend the police captain? Why do you think they're where they are? Why do you think I can drive as fast as I want and never get a ticket? Park where the hell I please. Believe me, Chuck, they're all on the take, or want to be. In Illinois, Mooney began fraternizing in earnest with legislators, senators, and federal judges as well as with local precinct captains, ward committeemen, and county sheriffs. He whined and dined them all at swank restaurants like Fritzel's or chic clubs like the Chez Paris, and he started traveling to Hollywood, solidifying Chicago's future, while the rest of the syndicate's top brass languished behind bars. Moon even took Ange along to California early in 1944. We got the royal treatment, she gushed to friends, a tour of the studios by all the bigwig producers, and we met lots of stars who acted like Mooney was their best friend. Betty Hutton was so charming, but Ann Southern was arrogant and rude. All in all, it was wonderful, though we were treated better than the stars by the heads of all the studios. Chuck had to smile at that. Such treatment simply meant Mooney had picked up the pieces Roselli, now in jail, had been forced to abandon. It was a thrill for Ange, but it was all business to Mooney, part of some master plan in the back of Mooney's head. Unlike the politicians and entertainers he disdained, Mooney always kept a promise. If he said he'd give a guy a chance, he would, even if it was years later. Sitting in the Van Buren book joint one evening in late May, Chuck was reminded of that when Fat Leonard mentioned they needed two guys to run a liquor store. Mooney remembered a promise he'd made. Well, I said I'd give Carl Torsiello another chance if one ever came up, and I fucking meant it. If we need a couple of guys to run a liquor store, I'll put Sharky Yulo and Carl Torsiello in. Carl's still busting his balls over in the rail yard. Ange tells me his family's barely getting by. And Christ, the guy's as loyal as the day is long. He's perfect to run a joint. He told Chuck to find out whether Carl wanted the job. It had been seven years since Carl had heard from Mooney, but Chuck was sure Carl had heard all about Mooney's climb up the ladder in the syndicate because Carl's wife, Tilly, was in a Castro, and her brother, Pete, had been a member of the old 42 gang. 
Carl's sister-in-law, Rose, was friends with Ange. Her husband, Sharky, had worked for Mooney as a soldier since the old 42 days. After the Barber's Union deal, Chuck imagined Carl thought he'd never get a chance again. But here it was, a chance for the guy to have an honest job running a liquor store for Mooney. When Chuck gave them the news, Carl and Tilly were elated. Years later, Carl would tell Chuck that he and Tilly spent hours talking and dreaming about what their lives would be like with him running the liquor store. He'd anxiously awaited the go-ahead from his brother-in-law, Sharky, and was devastated when Sharky came by the house and delivered a less-than-polite reply to Mooney's offer. Fuck that nickel-and-dime shit. You can tell Mooney to go scratch his behind. I'm not about to sit in some goddamn store all day. I don't want any part of it. Carl and Tilly were sure Sharky had rejected Mooney's offer, more because he didn't want Carl to get a leg up than anything else. Chuck thought they were probably right. Sharky was a small man who liked to talk big, and he'd always enjoyed the fact that he was on the inside, and Carl wasn't. He's just jealous, Carl, Tilly had said, trying to console him. Sharky's decision put Carl in an awkward spot. He faced a real dilemma. He couldn't tell Mooney what Sharky had said. The guy would be killed for his arrogance, and Carl, always wanting to do what he felt was honorable, thought telling Mooney would be wrong and vindictive. Carl agonized for days over his decision until finally coming to what he thought was the only logical conclusion. I couldn't tell Mooney what Sharky had said, so I had to turn down the offer. He admitted there'd been tears in his eyes when he wrote his reply in his best longhand. Dear Mooney, the note read, I regret I am unable to accept your most generous offer at this time. Please accept my humblest apologies. Sincerely, Carl Torsiello. He gave the envelope containing the note to his thirteen-year-old daughter, Anne-Marie. Take a trolley over to Mr. John Connor's house, he instructed her, and give him this envelope. Chuck and Mooney had just finished dinner when Carl's daughter arrived with the message. Chuck thought the little girl pretty but timid, with the big soulful eyes of a moppet. She stood in the living room, head bowed respectfully, and awaited Mooney's response. Chuck, why don't you give her a ride home? was all Mooney said, after he thoughtfully read the note and crumpled it in his hand. Then he surveyed Carl's daughter and added, smiling, "'Your Anne Marie?' She nodded, barely looking up. "'Chuck, on your way to the Torciello's, get a hundred-pound bag of sugar for Anne Marie's mother.' After rejecting Mooney's offer, the Torciello's never expected to hear from him again. It was all Carl could do each morning to trudge out to his job at the rail yards— for weeks, the family mourned the loss of opportunity. Then, just as suddenly as they had heard from Mooney before, another request came. Edge had heard from Tilly's sister that their daughter, Anne-Marie, was an excellent student. Could she be employed as a tutor for the John Connor girls, particularly Annette? It was a request that so honored the Torciellos it was unthinkable to refuse. It was late spring when Anne-Marie began her employment at the John Connor residence on Monitor Street. Watching her, Chuck could tell that the girl was enthralled by the opulence of Ange and Mooney's lifestyle. As each new luxury was revealed, her eyes grew wider. The washer and dryer, a new refrigerator, a vacuum cleaner, and the beautiful porcelain and china left the thirteen-year-old speechless with delight. Chuck knew that in Anne Marie's home, as in most homes in the patch, improvements came slowly. Largely, things had remained, with few exceptions, as they'd been decades before. The neighborhood had stood frozen in time as well. The bustle and clamor of excitement were still in evidence in every corner. Men continued to gather for a game of bocce in the evening, and women still sat on stoops in their aprons, trying to catch a little sunshine and fresh air, gossiping with one another while their children played with makeshift toys. What changes there were had been made thanks to an increase in the neighborhood's political clout and the syndicate's pull. The street's muddy ruts had been replaced by concrete before the war, and the city sanitation department now made regular garbage pickups. Trolleys still clanged and clattered past the red-brick tenements, but no longer were horse-drawn carts the norm. The vendors continued to hawk their wares, but from sagging storefronts and rusted-out trucks. The poverty of the patch was the same, more or less, as it had always been, but in the heart of one of the Patch's younger residents, a very serious and studious little girl named Anne-Marie Torciello, suddenly there was hope. After school each day, she fairly rushed to her new job as tutor. 
It was the strong-willed little girl Annette who most needed help with her studies. Annette was smart enough, she was pretty enough, and, Anne-Marie told Chuck one night as he drove her home, she thought Annette had enough to be the happiest girl on earth. But instead, she said, Annette sulks through her English and history drills and refuses to do her homework. She'd rather daydream about movie stars. Worse, however, was Annette's open resentment toward her. She hates me, she fumed. She knows I can't make her do anything, and she loves to throw that up to me every chance she gets. Listening to Anne-Marie pour out her frustrations, Chuck couldn't help but feel sympathetic. Annette was an enigma, and not only to Anne-Marie. No one, not Mooney, not Ange, not one person who knew her, could understand the bitterness she carried. She was never happy, no matter what her parents did to coddle her, nor did she show the slightest appreciation for the many luxuries she enjoyed. Chuck felt certain Anne-Marie was angry because, like most girls from the patch, she would have traded places with Annette or her sister, Bonnie, in a heartbeat. Just as she'd done with Chuck, Ange took Anne-Marie under her wing and taught her how to set the table with the finest silverware, told her what was proper etiquette and what was not. Unlike her own daughters, she found in Anne-Marie a ready pupil for the social graces. That little girl never complains. She just thanks me over and over again, Aunt remarked to Chuck and Mooney. It can be the tiniest thing, a cast-off sweater, a faded ribbon, a quarter for a special treat. This was a girl who eagerly did her schoolwork and did it well, a girl who took pride in whatever she was required to do, be it washing dishes or making beds. Thus, in a few short weeks, Ange found herself lamenting to Mooney and Chuck her disappointment with Annette and Bonnie. Why can't they be more like Anne Marie? she asked night after night. Her comparisons fueled Annette's resentment, and she soon became virtually uncontrollable at the mention of Anne Marie. Ange's slightest request was grounds for domestic warfare and fits of childish rage. Ange and Mooney tried everything from cajoling and screaming to threats and bribery, but to no avail. Nothing seemed to soothe the troubled, angry Annette, and although Anne-Marie kept her thoughts to herself, she did confide in Chuck on his evening drive to her home. It's quite obvious to me, she said, the John Connor girls are spoiled brats. Chuck laughed at that. He'd known Mooney's girls all their lives, and he loved them as if they were his own. He couldn't count the number of times he'd walked into their house and said, give me a bite, while leaning down to receive their affections. Giggling, Bonnie and Annette always complied, planting little wet kisses on his cheek. They might be his little princesses, but he had to admit that Anne-Marie was right. They were spoiled. A shy little girl, barely four feet tall, in the seat next to him, was slowly gaining his respect. There was no doubt about it. Anne-Marie Torciella was a sharp little cookie. As summer drew near, Ange decided to have Anne-Marie move in, telling Mooney she thought the girl would be a help, as well as a good influence. All Mooney could do was shake his head. Well, it's worth a try, he said, in uncharacteristic resignation. And then he turned to Chuck, saying, But boarding school is where Annette and Bonnie belong. Anne-Marie quickly learned that living at the Giancana house was not the same as being their daughter. She was, for all intents and purposes, a servant. While Annette and Bonnie went out to play, she helped the cook prepare the meals and set the table. After dinner, she cleared the dishes and washed them as well. Like Ange and Mooney, Chuck was impressed by her unswerving loyalty. Her stamina and determination were unusual for what he considered a child. She rarely smiled, going about her chores with unyielding discipline, but she positively beamed when escorting Bonnie and Annette on outings. She excitedly described her day to Chuck, the stage shows at the Oriental Theater, the turquoise blue swimming pool in Forest Park, the ball games at Pariki Stadium, the beautiful clothes she saw when they went to Marshall Fields. Chuck imagined it made Anne-Marie's heart ache with desire when she went to Marshall Fields and felt the softness of a cashmere sweater or admired the sensuous luster of a satin blouse. Her station in life was sadly different from that of the John Connor girls, and on more than one occasion, when he'd accompanied them to Marshall Fields, he'd heard Annette and Bonnie impudently remind her of that. Too bad you just hired help and can't have nice clothes. They taunted as Anne-Marie watched them toss one pastel sweater after another into the open arms of a smiling sales clerk. Although nine years her senior, Chuck thought he and the little girl had a few things in common. It was an ultimate irony that they both were surrounded by so much and yet had so very little. 
As much as Ange might praise Anne Marie's seriousness and uncommon maturity, or Mooney grant him greater status, such rewards paled next to the material world of the John Connors. Some day, Anne Marie told Chuck with a fierce determination that belied her years, some day I'll have nice things too. Chuck often wondered whether she fell asleep with the word some day on her lips, just as he had so long ago. Hearing her say that made him more convinced than ever that he'd been right all along about one thing. Hang on to your dreams, he advised her, because you have to have a dream to get by in the patch. Occasionally Chuck thought that the lifestyle the Giancana girls led wasn't a dream come true at all, but rather a nightmare. He believed children were like the dogs he'd seen in the patch. They sensed a person's true feelings. Mooney rarely, if ever, expressed any warmth toward the girls. He brought them armloads of presents, things girls from the patch like Anne Marie might give their eye teeth for, but Chuck never heard him once say, I love you. All the clothes and toys and fancy baubles in the world couldn't make up for that. Ange tried to compensate for Mooney's aloofness, and in her attempt, gave in to their whims and demands, however unreasonable they might be. Chuck saw the storm building through that summer of 1944. Annette's black mood cast a darkness over the Giancana household for weeks. In reaction, Anne-Marie grew quiet and solemn, trying to be as unobtrusive as possible. Mooney had been going out of town on business to New York several times a week, something he hadn't done much of before, and Ange was left to deal with the strain of the headstrong girls alone. It almost seemed that Annette was pushing her mother purposely, seizing every available opportunity to encourage a confrontation. Ange had been almost too calm, too compliant, and then the storm finally broke. On a Friday night in August, Chuck was greeted at his brother's door by a tearful Anne Marie. Hurry, Chuck, she whispered, clearly frightened. Please, please hurry. I don't know what's going to happen. Her fear was contagious, and he hesitated on the steps, afraid of what he'd find inside. A thousand horrible things ran through his mind, but he tried to look calm and nonchalant. Now slow down, he said. What's wrong? It's, it's Ange and Annette. It's terrible, Chuck. Just awful. She began to cry. He grabbed her slender shoulders and shook her gently. What? What's going on with Ange and Annette? Are they all right? Then suddenly he knew. He heard the screams, the pleading, and with their sound, the memory of his own childhood beatings rushed on him like a tidal wave. Anne's got real mad at Annette, real mad, Anne Marie explained through her tears. I'm afraid for her, Chuck, of what Anne might do. She got a golf club and hit Annette with it all the way to her bedroom. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't watch. It was awful. Chuck's breath caught in his chest. He felt just as he had when he'd gotten the wind knocked out of him as a kid, jumping off stoops. A golf club? He repeated her words. A golf club? He was incredulous. Ange had never done anything like this before. It went beyond the boundaries of discipline. Anne Marie nodded her head. Uh huh. She got mad at Annette and said she was going to teach her a lesson. Then she went and got one of Mooney's golf clubs. I'm afraid, Chuck. I've never seen Ange like this. She went. Well, she went. She lowered her voice. Crazy. Chuck walked past the girl and toward the hallway calling back softly, go to bed, everything will be fine, just go to bed. She turned and left, relieved perhaps that someone older and wiser was there. But Chuck felt neither. The closer he got to the doorway of the bedroom, the smaller and more vulnerable he felt. He talked to himself, tried to convince himself that he was an adult now, that he was in control. But Annette's cries took him back to a time and place he thought he'd left years ago, Looking into the room, he saw Ange standing over Annette, holding the club head as the shaft blurred through the air with a silver whoosh. A golf club could be lethal. Ange could kill Annette. Obviously, his sister-in-law was out of control and needed to be stopped. But for some reason, he stood in the hallway, frozen in place, immobilized as much by the rage that reigned beyond Annette's bedroom door as by the thought of his brother's reaction if he were to intervene. He could almost hear Mooney shouting, Keep your eyes and ears open and your fucking mouth shut. Chuck took a step back. He didn't know whom he was kidding. He wouldn't go in and stop Ange. He wouldn't do anything except turn around and leave. He wasn't sure exactly why, either. Was it fear of his brother, or a desire to please him, hoping to be rewarded with his favor, 
or both? He stood there in shock at the truth, and then, before Ange and Annette knew he'd been witness to their madness, he silently moved down the hallway and out the door into the night. In his car, he thought he might be sick, and he rolled down the window. He didn't know whether he felt more sorry for them or himself. And why did he feel sorry for himself? If anything, he should feel ashamed at having turned his back on Annette. But he wasn't sure he did. In the days and weeks that followed, not a word was said about Annette's or Angie's behavior. Miraculously, Annette showed no signs of abuse, but then she never did. The headstrong girl simply nursed the bruises hidden beneath her expensive frocks and went on living in her own obstinate way. Chuck salved his conscience with that knowledge. His niece was a problem, no question about it. There wasn't a person in the family who wouldn't agree, including Mooney. No, there was no sympathy for Annette, and Chuck sure as hell wouldn't be the one to blow the whistle on his sister-in-law's treatment of the girl. Besides, the truth was, there was nothing more important than pleasing Mooney. Nothing. He couldn't bring himself to risk his brother's disfavor. He couldn't sacrifice his own dream of being in the syndicate for some meaningless principle or ethic or moral. Or person. He thought that was understandable. After all, he didn't know anyone who, faced with the same choice, wouldn't do the same thing. But what he didn't understand was why he felt so angry for weeks after the incident. And so sad. Chapter 10 Man, oh man, you got so much class you could cut it with a knife, Chuck exclaimed. Yeah, I think you're right. Mooney said, laughing. But shit, for five hundred bucks, I better look good. He turned in the full-length mirror, carefully examining every detail of the double-breasted suit, the gentle drape of the soft navy wool across his chest, the wide lapels, the broad, padded shoulders. Peeking out from beneath the trousers' full cuffs were a pair of six-hundred-dollar handmade black leather wingtips. Jimmy Chilano, the shop's plump owner, stood nearby, he pursed his rubbery lips together and softly whistled. Mooney, you can really wear a suit, he complimented. You're a walking billboard from my place here, I tell you. You got a lot of style. Throughout 1945, his brother had been spending money like water. $500 suits, $50 ties, $75 shirts, jewelry, handmade silk underwear, and handkerchiefs. And though at only 23, he realized he couldn't match Mooney's image of wealth, Chuck couldn't resist gazing into the mirror and studying his own reflection. Twinkling, almost mischievous, dark eyes looked back at him. Atop the thick, curly black hair that framed his smooth olive face was a gray fedora. His lean, muscular frame lent nice lines to his pinstriped charcoal suit. He was head to toe a man now. He'd proven he could handle himself around his brother's late-night haunts, the lounges, whorehouses, and strip joints, and he knew what being a man was all about, too. Like Mooney, he'd made plenty of women beg for more. At the thought, a feeling of pride and pleasure came over him. He shifted his gaze to study Mooney's image. His brother wasn't just another scrawny punk anymore. He'd filled out over the past few years, and his face, tanned from a recent stay in Miami, bore the tiny signs of age well, and with a new sense of dignity. There was remote coldness behind Mooney's deep-set eyes, a slight curl to his lips, which encircled a smoldering cigar, a staggering self-confidence, or was it arrogance, in his posture. But trying to analyze what it was exactly that made Mooney so goddamned magnetic, well, it was just about impossible. In 1946, Mooney was made underboss to Tony Accardo. The advancement in status was based as much on the success of his gambling rackets as on the ominous power base of men and muscle he'd managed to build. Times were good for Mooney and getting better. He and Ange were wintering in Florida, and had placed Bonnie and Annette in boarding school in, as Mooney explained to Chuck, a last-ditch effort to get the two rebellious girls in line. Christ, Annette's impossible to control. Can you believe she still wets the bed? He complained. Anne Marie Torciello still tutored the girls occasionally, but Chuck rarely saw her and assumed she'd gone back to her life in the patch. Throughout the year, Mooney traveled more frequently to Florida, California, Cuba, and New York. He'd been routinely visiting Manhattan since Lucky Luciano had entered prison ten years previously. 
Luciano had appealed unsuccessfully for parole in 1938 and 1943. Even his assistance at the prodding of U.S. intelligence in contacting the Italian Mafia kingpin Don Vizzini to request the Don's aid during the U.S. invasion in World War II did nothing to convince authorities he should be released. However, Moody confided that Luciano's $90,000 campaign contribution to Thomas Dewey, the very man responsible for putting him behind bars in the first place, coupled with Meyer Lansky's promise of part interest in a future Tampa, Florida gambling deal in the Bahamas, was all it took to win Dewey's friendship and Luciano's subsequent release. That's the name of the game, Mooney said, smirking. Now we own Dewey. He just doesn't know it yet. Thus, in 1945, the New York State Parole Board freed Luciano on the condition he be deported to Italy. For his part in Luciano's release, Dewey came under fire, but the crime fighter turned presidential candidate quickly pointed to Luciano's service to the United States government during World War II as reason enough for release. After his release, Luciano maintained his authority from outside the United States, living comfortably in Italy, while using Frank Costello as his overseer in New York. Costello was one of the few men Mooney obviously admired. Costello's my kind of guy, smooth and smart. Indeed, the two had much in common, and Costello, eleven years Mooney's senior, stood as an example of everything Mooney was striving to achieve. Costello had the muscle, but he relied on finesse. According to Mooney, he had practically every politician on the pad, even had J. Edgar Hoover in his pocket. Costello dined with senators, was friends with George Wood of the William Morris Agency and producer Harry Cohn of Columbia, and partied with celebrities. Frank Costello, Mooney maintained, knew how to live. Like Mooney, Costello had grown up in a teeming slum, East Harlem, and held a lifelong and deep-seated hatred for his father. He'd gotten his boost into the rackets, thanks to his elder brother, Eddie, and during Prohibition, he had become fast friends with Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano. Collaborating with the two younger men, Costello helped develop what would become the National Syndicate. Early on, Mooney said, his path had crossed Costello's when he'd run rum and sugar shipments for Diamond Joe Esposito to Joe Kennedy's bootlegging operation. He'd like Costello from the start. But it wasn't until Mooney returned from Terre Haute in 1943 and made his move on gambling and Chicago's black policy wheels that their relationship blossomed. A few drinks and we were tight, Mooney informed Chuck. We realized we had a lot in common, our likes, dislikes, but mostly I thought he was the smartest man I'd ever met. He could tell I admired the way he could get things done, and he liked that. Mooney said Costello had style like nobody else. He knew how to handle himself among the rich and famous, the politicians and kings. He called the judges his boys. Man, oh man, I wanted to be as powerful as he was. I watched his every move. If there was ever a guy I wanted to be like, it was Frank Costello. Mooney's friendship with Costello had continued. They'd started working a few rackets together the year before, in 1945, when Costello needed a distribution point for his gem smuggling operation in the Midwest. Pretty soon, Mooney was taking gems stolen in Midwest heists up to one of Costello's fences, George Unger, and returning with Costello's smuggled treasures, which Mooney turned over to his soldiers for distribution throughout the Midwest and West. The operation was worth millions to Chicago's syndicate, but the formation of such lucrative ties was worth far more to Mooney. He now had a powerful friend and ally in New York, something that didn't go unnoticed in his own hometown. His stature in Chicago seemed to skyrocket. Wherever he went, he got the red carpet treatment and became a recipient of not only incredible art objects, jewelry, and other such fine luxuries, but the smaller things in life as well. In Chicago, while average citizens waited months for a car after the war, Mooney only had to visit Emil Denemark, the area's largest Cadillac dealer, to ensure that those around him were driving in style. For such treatment, he paid the dealer at cost, plus cash under the table. Chevys and Fords were 300 extra, Buicks were 500, and Cadillacs 1,000. With hundreds of men to supply with automobiles, Mooney became Denmark's biggest customer, and their relationship blossomed. In return, Mooney was given anything his heart desired. When he walked into the showroom, Denmark greeted him like a long-lost friend and ushered him to his private office, where Mooney, feet up on the dealer's desk, lounged, and Denmark himself sat in a chair reserved for customers. 
He instructed Denmark, pen and paper in hand, as to who among its lieutenants and soldiers could purchase a car as well as what make, model, and year. Mooney rewarded Chuck's loyalty by giving him permission to purchase an aqua blue 1946 Buick convertible, which sported the very first white wall tires in the country. For Ange, he bought a dark blue Fleetwood Cadillac, and for himself, a 1946 Mercury. Mooney clearly had a love affair with cars. Although he was unimpressed by the ostentatious luxury models, he hadn't lost his appreciation for the low-profile getaway vehicles of the old days. These he treated as prized possessions. They were meticulously waxed and polished weekly at the dealership under Chuck's watchful eye, and outfitted in a manner that harked back to Mooney's days as a wheelman with bulletproof steel plates and high-speed heads and cams, which allowed the cars to reach speeds of 120 miles an hour. Mooney traveled in his souped-up cars at the speed of an ambulance, from one end of the city to the other, working deals wherever he went. But always he kept his eye on the South Side Colored District and its policy wheels, making what progress he could among the colored as a white Italian, until at last Eddie Jones made good his promise of partnership and financial backing. Jones, who in 1946 still awaited parole from prison, instructed his brother George to proceed, bankrolling Mooney to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars that year, and, under the auspices of a partnership with the Jones brothers, Mooney began pushing his way into colored policy wheels while simultaneously purchasing the necessary equipment for an immense jukebox, pinball, and vending machine venture. He enlisted Chucky English, a friend from the old 42 days, to oversee the day-to-day -day operation. With the exception of the pinball machines— illegal devices intended for the purpose of gambling, the operation was totally legitimate, until the skimming, hijacking, and shakedowns began, which was what had attracted Mooney in the first place. Skimming, the practice of taking a percentage of income off the top before reporting it to the IRS, was especially lucrative in an all-cash business where an exact accounting of income was impossible to establish. And though jukeboxes and vending machines were seemingly only a nickel-and-dime business, they lived up to Mooney's adage, nickels make dimes, dimes make dollars, and dollars make you a rich son of a bitch. With Mooney's blessing, English recruited union guy Joey Glimco, Willie Potatoes Dodano, Joe Gags Gagliano, Dave Yaris, and Lenny Patrick as his territorial frontmen for the machines. In turn, these men brought in their own soldiers as distributors, in all over 500 men, to blanket Chicago and the surrounding suburbs with what Mooney ultimately claimed were more than 12,000 jukeboxes, cigarette, and pinball machines. The distributors went 50-50 with tavern and restaurant owners on the illegal pinball machines, a small flat weekly amount on the others. An owner unwilling to allow syndicate machines in his place of business might experience vandalism, firebombings, or worse. Once a business was infiltrated, the underworld could monitor operations, make high-interest loans to a struggling owner, or even better, take over the business completely. Monopolizing the city's jukeboxes also gave the syndicate enormous clout with the entertainment industry. A new song wouldn't be a hit if it didn't receive exposure. Mooney and his associates could flood the city with a favorite entertainer's record or demand payola from a studio merely to assure placement of an aspiring new hopeful in syndicate machines. With an average weekly take off in dollars per machine, the money piled up fast. Mooney and the Jones brothers split the income from the venture 50-50, skimming off the lion's share of the $6 million in yearly earnings and reporting to the IRS little, if any, of the profits. Stolen cigarettes, hijacked by syndicate soldiers up and down the nation's highways, offered another income opportunity. Placed in Mooney's vending machines, each pack of cigarettes sold represented a clear 100% profit. This is just the tip of the iceberg, Mooney confided to Chuck. Shit, we're going worldwide. We're setting up a guy right now with cigarettes to move in on the Philippines. The son of a bitch has practically got the fucking government on his payroll. Chuck would later learn that the guy Mooney spoke of was a shadowy figure and ex-G.I. from Chicago named Harry Stonehill, whose political connections included everybody from a Philippine senator named Ferdinand Marcos and the Philippine Catholic Diocese to Philippine proconsul Edward Lansdale and General Douglas MacArthur. The alliance would ultimately be worth billions, providing Chicago with an entree into areas New York had not yet entered 
Asian gambling ventures, smuggling, black markets, and narcotics. Although Chuck's fortunes hadn't soared in 1946, Mooney's had. By spring, his personal income from the Jones deal, his book joints and gambling partnerships, as well as stolen war bonds and the numerous stolen goods from other burglaries and heists, exceeded several million dollars. And, taking Jones's lead, Mooney began to invest in legitimate enterprises, paying what was a fortune in post-war America, $65,000, for a liquor store, the R&S. Additionally, he bought an old storefront in the West Side Colored District on Roosevelt near Paulina, which he planned to call the Boogie Woogie, in which he promised Chuck would soon be Chicago's version of the Cotton Club. He also laid out $32,000 cash as down payment for a stately yellow brick home on Winona in the suburb of Oak Park for his growing family, which now included a new baby, Francine, and gave Chuck the responsibility of supervising its renovation and delivering the monthly mortgage payment. Chuck, who desperately wanted out of the book join on Cicero, got his ticket with a boogie-woogie. Mooney made him manager of the club and put him in charge of its design and remodeling, proof to Chuck that Mooney did indeed have bigger plans for his future. Determined to gain his brother's approval, Chuck dove into the Boogie Woogie project with the tenacity of a bulldog, and, once completed, it was everything Mooney had envisioned and more. With nightfall, the surrounding poverty-stricken neighborhood of winos and dope peddlers faded from view, and the Boogie Woogie came to life its blue and orange neon sign flashing boogie and woogie in alternate rhythm to the wail of jazz trumpets and saxophones playing inside. The doors of shiny black sedans and limousines lining the street in front of the club opened, exposing the long, dark legs of beautiful Negro women dressed in slinky, sequined gowns of satin and silk. Their pinstriped escorts, hair slicked back in pompadours under brimmed fedoras, were mostly Chicago's policy men or up-and-coming Negro racketeers. They lined up out front, laughing and swaggering and strutting their stuff, waiting to get inside. And once there, it all became a blur of sound and sweat and swing. Chuck booked popular colored musicians and entertainers from all over. Some were big names, like Nat King Cole, but most were local talent who packed sidearms and were just looking for a chance to make it big. Celebrities or not, as far as the throngs of boogie-woogie patrons were concerned, this was a high-tone place. The money rolled in, and Mooney was pleased. That was all that mattered to Chuck. After Eddie Jones was released from prison in 1946, he and his dazzling wife Lydia frequented the club, as did one of Jones's lieutenants, Teddy Rowe. Chuck had been warned about Rowe. He was distrustful and suspicious of the Italians, particularly Mooney Giancana, and despite the money to be made from penetrating the Italian community, he'd vehemently disagreed with Jones's joint venture with Giancana, as had virtually all the other small-time colored wheel operators. Chuck stood behind the bar of the club each night and listened to the policy men. He got to know how their operations worked and how the Negroes thought. More than once he had to jump up on the bar, revolver in hand, and clear the place out amid ladies' squeals and gunfire— but that was the exception. More often than not, he discovered that the policymen settled disputes and power struggles through discussion, however heated, and he admired them for that. Their genteel cooperation was something foreign to what he'd witnessed with Mooney's gang. Mooney took care of problems in a more straightforward fashion. He killed them. Closing the boogie-woogie each night, Chuck couldn't help but wonder what Mooney had in mind for the policy kings. He didn't have to wait long to find out. On a warm night in late April, Mooney stopped by the club after midnight to see how things were going. Chuck poured them both a scotch, and they sat at a table, watching through a cloud of smoke as glistening couples went through their bumps and grinds. Mooney lit his cigar and leaned forward, frowning. "'You might get a little trouble in here over the next few weeks,' he said. "'I'm going to take them over. Roe, Jones, the whole goddamn bunch.' Chuck wasn't surprised. Mooney had just been waiting for the right time. He guessed now was as good as any, and he nodded. I've had it with Roe. He's a no-good son of a bitch. And Eddie? Chuck asked. Yeah, well, he's seen his day, too. Shit, I kind of like the guy. I don't want to take him out, but he won't move over and let us in. I gotta do something about him. Chuck lit a cigarette and inhaled. Like what? He exhaled with the words. Mooney smiled and pushed his chair back from the table to get up. 
Don't even fucking worry about it, Chuck. You just run this joint like you've been doing. You've done a great job here, and let me take care of the rest. Okay? Capiche? Mooney motioned around the room, the light catching on his diamond cufflinks, and then stood up. Just keep up the good work, and he put his face up close to Chuck's, dropping his voice. Watch out for some pissed-off shines. As Mooney strolled across the room toward the door, Teddy Rowe walked in with an entourage of muscle and a woman on his arm. Seeing Mooney, he bristled and stood his ground. The dancers on the floor had reached a fury of movement, and the noise, the music, and the crowd made it impossible to tell what was going to happen. Chuck shot a look behind the bar at his manager, Jimmy New York, and his black bartender, Willie, and nodded in Mooney's direction. Seeing Rowe, they reached under the counter for their guns. Chuck searched the pocket of his suit coat for the reassuring coldness of his own revolver, and, rising quickly from the table, walked over through the dancers to his brother's side. Well, what the fuck is Mooney Giancana doing in a nigger joint, trying to steal more of our money? Or you think he's just here for a little taste of one of our women? Rose said, sneering, to the two men flanking his side. They grinned arrogantly and laughed. Mooney expressionlessly surveyed the mulatto. Chuck felt his heart skip a bead. I own the joint, Mooney smiled coldly, just like I'm gonna fucking own you and everything else you goddamn shines got. He stared into the eyes of the sequin woman on Rose's arm. Including her if I want. Chuck saw her red lips part. His brother was right. If he wanted her, she was his. Rose saw it, too. Why, oh, you dirty motherfucker, I'll fucking kill you. Rowe reached for Mooney's lapels, but before he could lay a hand on him, Chuck and Jimmy New York stepped up and stuck their guns in his ribs. Forget about it, Teddy, Mooney said, never taking his eyes from the woman. He laughed. You're over your head and without even looking back, he swaggered out the door into the night. On a Saturday night in May of 1946, Mooney put his plan in action by kidnapping Eddie Jones. He and Fat Leonard, along with Needles, Fifi, and Vincent Ioli, abducted the policy king, put him in the basement of Mooney's still-vacant house in Oak Park, and gave him a choice similar to the one Mooney had given Guzik three years before, cooperate or die. Jones didn't have to be convinced. Before his release the following Friday, he came up with $250,000 in unmarked ransom money and agreed to turn over his entire operation. Two weeks later, Jones and his family boarded a train to Mexico, and that was the last Mooney saw of the Jones brothers. The colored papers called Mooney a double-crosser, a convict with a record as long as your arm, and small-time colored policymen, among them Teddy Rowe, braced themselves for an assault. Rowe brazenly suggested to his friends and anyone else who'd listen that before the Italians took over his wheels, he'd die first. Mooney's only response to that was, that's not such a bad idea. No attempt was made to kill Rowe that summer. Instead, Mooney used his political ties and police connections to turn the heat up on Rowe's operation, forcing him to shut down his wheels. With Rowe effectively out of the way, Mooney then turned his attention an onslaught of intimidations, bombings, and murder toward the less vocal policy operators. And one by one, the wheels fell under his control. By August, with the exception of Rose Wheels, Mooney owned the policy rackets lock, stock, and barrel, as he put it. Following the takeover, Mooney put five soldiers from the old neighborhood, the Mono Brothers and Sam Party, in charge of policy operations— Although white Italians still refer to it as numbers, it remained a game restricted to the colored community. The few whites wishing to play did so through one of the hundreds of bookies scattered throughout Chicago, who in turn called one of the colored policy frontmen with the bet. Chuck watched the unfolding of this new enterprise with rapid interest, curious to find out whether policy, as Mooney had said, could really generate the legendary bushel baskets full of money. He began hearing tales, tall ones, he thought at first, of bundles of cash stacked waist-deep in the Mono's basement. When Mooney invited him to go for a drive in late November of 1946 to Tom Mono's to see for himself, he eagerly went along. There he found money stacked from one end of the basement to the other, not waist-deep, but to the ceiling. Six years later, in 1952, three of the Mono brothers and party would plead guilty and be jailed for evading over two million dollars in taxes levied against their policy profits. Still awestruck by the sight of so much money, 
Chuck listened during the drive home as Mooney outlined his plans for the future. Mooney said that while he'd been getting local operations in line, Tony Accardo had instructed Jake Guzik and Murray Humphreys to work on another angle, the national gambling scene. Chicago was moving into Iowa, Kansas, Indiana, and Michigan. Additionally, they were trying to set up a gambling operation in Dallas, Texas, and put the finishing touches on a takeover of Continental Press, a wire service out of Cleveland that provided national sporting event results to bookies throughout the country. Mooney said Guzik and Humphreys had used Pat Mono along with small-time fixers Paul Jones and Jack Nappy as their emissaries to Texas. They offered the Dallas Sheriff, Steve Guthrie, $150,000 for his cooperation during their invasion of the city. We promised the guy we'd make sure the city stays clean. No trouble, no drugs. Just good, clean fun. Floating crap games, bookmaking, and slot machines. But in early November, just when Mono and Jones thought they had a deal, they discovered the sheriff had bugged their meetings. Guthrie refused the payoff and blew the whistle, resulting in Jones being charged with bribery. It put a crimp on all their plans. But we got another card to play, Mooney told Chuck. I'm sending a Jew friend of Dave Yaris's and Lenny Patrick's, Jack Ruby. Chuck learned that Jack Ruby was expected to move slowly at first, opening a seedy night spot that the Chicago syndicate would slowly transform into a jumping strip joint, offering clientele everything from bookmaking to prostitutes. Over time, if all proceeded according to plan, Ruby would bypass the sheriff, find the weak link in the area's law enforcement, there always was one, Mooney said, and begin the long process of bribery and payoffs. According to Mooney, the other opportunity, Continental, and its distributor, Midwest News Service, had fared better. Continental's predecessor, Nationwide, was originally owned by Mo Annenberg, but was forced out of business when the publishing mogul was found guilty of tax evasion and sent to prison. Prior to his downfall, with the backing of both the Chicago and New York crime syndicates, Annenberg had made a fortune from the gambling industry, providing racing forms and wire services to bookies throughout the country. An established wire service with its thousands of customers could be extremely profitable. Changing odds, results, and payoff amounts from dozens of horse tracks around the nation were continually reported over a special telephone line, or wire, to a subscribing book joint for a $100 a day fee. And without such information, a gambling operation was effectively out of business. After Annenberg's company folded, his longtime employee, Jim Reagan, seized the moment and opened Continental. Mooney told Chuck that he, Guzik, and Humphreys, I believed Reagan's service could give Chicago the opening they needed to move into every gambling operation in the country. With Continental under our belt, he explained, we could own the whole goddamn gambling business. Earlier in the year, Mooney spearheaded a takeover of Reagan's company, and with the approval of Accardo, Humphreys, and Guzik, made the guy, as Mooney put it, an offer he couldn't refuse. But surprisingly, Reagan had refused, and they'd been forced to take other measures measures that would ultimately lead to Reagan's death. Figuring to run Reagan out of business and save themselves a bundle in the bargain, the Chicago syndicate opened up a wire service of its own, Transamerican. The wire service's attorney, John Boyle, would go on to become the Illinois state's attorney and chief judge of criminal court. Next, to drum up customers for their new venture, Mooney and Guzik pooled a few tough guys, Willie Potatoes, Dave Yaris, you know the guys, Mooney said, and sent them out to make sales calls on Reagan's customers. After a rash of threats and bombings, the bookmaking operations quickly moved their business from Continental to Transamerican. The other Continental customers, most notably Bugsy Siegel out west, willingly assisted Mooney's push, moving over to Transamerican in a spirit of cooperation and national brotherhood. But still Reagan controlled Continental until last August, Mooney stated matter-of-factly, the guy should have just taken our offer and gotten the hell out of the wire business. But no, he had to be a big shot. So we sent Dave Yaris, Lenny Patrick, and Willie Block out to take care of things. Gussie Alex and Strongy Ferraro ran back up. Believe it or not, with half an army, they still didn't do the job right the first time. Shot the guy and what the hell, he ended up in the fucking hospital. So we had to wait and see what was going to happen. But those guys had to make it right one way or another. Chuck knew about Reagan's death how the guy had lain in the hospital for weeks, and then suddenly and mysteriously died. 
They finally slip him a few mercury cocktails in the hospital, Mooney explained. Mooney said that thanks to the merger between Continental and Transamerican, the guys from around the country were starting to work together. We're giving Jack Dragna out in California fifty grand for his support and Carlos Marcello from New Orleans a piece of the action. Sort of a thank you for him smoothing our way into Texas. At least now we've got a foothold there. Anyhow, it's only a matter of time before we've got all the gambling everywhere. And when we do, I'll be right there at the top of the heap. Chucky couldn't help thinking how casually Mooney mingled a man's murder with his own plans for success. There were times when Chuck felt sorry for some sap, even though the guy might have stepped out of line and had it coming. But not Mooney. Never. Mooney didn't have a little voice deep inside that whispered judgment on his every action. As Chuck had gotten older, he'd envied that aspect of Mooney all the more, because there was no question in his mind that what stood between him and the big time was that goddamned little voice. The only thing he could say was that he'd gotten better at ignoring it, that most things people thought were wrong, like cheating and stealing and lying to save your skin, didn't bother him any more. He drew the line at taking a guy out, though. He didn't want any part of murder. He knew it went on. Hell, most of the guys he knew were killers, but he sure as hell didn't want to be personally involved himself. Sometimes he wasn't sure whether he was a failure or a saint, or neither. All he was sure of was that being a saint wouldn't get him where he wanted to go. Throughout the remainder of 1946, when Mooney wasn't out of town on business, he sped up and down the side streets of Chicago, putting together one deal after another. He told Chuck that Rika and the guys would be out real soon, but what that meant in terms of Mooney's position in the syndicate hierarchy was uncertain. Mooney, for his part, was highly confident that his record of the past three years, while the old guard had been in prison, was solid enough to ensure a place at the top. Paul knows I can make everybody a lot of money. That's all that matters. I've proven I've got the balls to run things with the numbers in gambling. It's only a matter of time. I'm going to be boss soon, Chuck. You hear me? Boss. According to Mooney, the early release of Chicago's most notorious mobsters could be credited to Murray Humphreys, who'd been traveling back and forth to Washington, D.C., to work out a deal. There he'd talk to Attorney General Tom Clark about getting his assistance. Ricky even promised Clark a seat on the fucking Supreme Court if he helped get him out, Mooney said, and then, noticing the look on Chuck's face, added with a chuckle, Chuck, what did I tell you before? Did you think I was bullshitting you? We always own the president. It doesn't matter what the guy's name is. We own him. We own the White House. Just as Mooney had predicted, Rika and his cronies were indeed released early the next year amid public outcry. Among those in the underworld, it was claimed that Hollywood unions, still under Chicago's control, had created costly work stoppages, vandalism, and other aggravations in an effort to pressure studio moguls into coming to Rika's aid. The tactics proved effective. According to Mooney, a personal gift of $5 million from all the major studios was made to President Truman. In exchange, Attorney General Clark granted the mobsters parole and, as reward, was appointed by Truman to the Supreme Court. Additionally, Truman was promised syndicate financial backing and the efforts of the Chicago political machine for the upcoming 1948 presidential campaign and election. As 1946 wound down, Mooney continued to increase his holdings. He opened two more clubs, the Archer Club and the 430 Club, and a company called Windy City with his longtime associate Congressman Jimmy Aducci. Windy City was supposedly intended to set up softball leagues, but Mooney said it was just another front for book joints and a place for him to report legitimate income on his tax returns. Meanwhile, Mooney's wife and daughters strolled Michigan Avenue in post-war designer dresses, furs and jewels, and planned lavish Christmas parties. In December 1946, Lucky Luciano, still wielding tremendous influence among bosses of the underworld since his release from prison and subsequent deportation to Italy, called a meeting of the Commission, the name given the National Consortium of Syndicates from around the country. Moody's attendance in Havana at this meeting, which brought together the nation's 36 biggest gang leaders, further signaled his acceptance into the fold and was an acknowledgment of his rank in the Chicago hierarchy. He came back from Cuba with a renewed zeal for his upward climb. Damn, that Lansky's a fucking genius. And a suitcase bulging with Havana cigars. 
He insisted Chuck watch the news over the coming months for a surprise out west. A big guy is going to be taken out, he said mysteriously. By June of 1947, Mooney would be crowing, if only privately. What did I tell you? Somebody big? Did you hear about Bugsy Siegel out in Beverly Hills? He screwed up, and it got him two of Chicago's slugs to the head. What the hell did he do? Chuck asked. Shit, he could have had it made. Lansky sent him out to Vegas five years ago to set up clubs. He started the Flamingo, and right away started skimming. And not penny any shit, either. Millions. Not only that, but he refused to give back his part of Trans-American. Siegel was a fucking cowboy, who got too big for his own good. We voted to get him out of the way down in Havana, after he had the balls to defy Lansky and the whole goddamn commission on top of it. Jesus, you're really on the inside now, Chuck complimented. Well, let's just say I had inside information, Mooney said, smiling, and then added, and the contract to do the job on Siegel. Chuck was particularly intrigued by Mooney's inside information on the California scene and the celebrity inroads made by his brother on behalf of Rika and Roselli. Hollywood is just full of guys waiting to be used, Chuck. All anybody out there cares about is whether they're going to be a star or not. We help them along and we own them. That's how simple it is. And the broads, Chuck, beautiful and dumb. Shit, don't ever be starstruck by all that movie baloney. They're all worthless bums and whores. Hollywood is the only place I've ever been, besides Washington, D.C., where everybody, men and women, are just begging for you to use them. After the first of the new year, Mooney and Ange again made their winter home in Miami. Mooney often left Ange in the company of her women, friends, and relatives, while he chartered boats to Cuba for a few days fishing with the boys, or flew off to Chicago and other parts unknown. To Chuck, their marriage seemed happier, more settled, than it had been in years. Mooney continued to travel that spring, but back at home in Chicago, while he busied himself opening another wire service, the Montrose Association, he relied on Chuck to escort his wife and daughters from their Oak Park home, now freshly decorated with expensive antiques and art, to posh restaurants and shops or such faraway places as New York City for a shopping spree at Saks. Out with Ange, Chuck saw the world open up before them. The John Connor name was magical. Stars and nightclubs nodded and smiled in their direction. Clerks in the finest department stores swooned with delight at the privilege of waiting on them. And on his own, it seemed anything his heart desired, from front-row seats at the Graziano Zale title boxing match to curvaceous showgirls could be his, all because he was Mooney's brother. But for the rest of the Giancanas, things were hardly so rosy. Mooney was still firmly convinced that what his family possessed was only thanks to him, and they were equally convinced. In 1947, he continued to wield an iron grip over the lives of his father, brothers, and sisters, and sternly dictated their futures. And yet with Chuck, he privately scorned their emotional and financial dependence. They always have their hands out, he remarked with disgust. But Chuck thought theirs was a condition Mooney had nurtured, had virtually demanded, as proof of their devotion and respect. They continued to grovel on Mooney's doorstep, waiting for him to toss them a bone. And they were thankful for that. Chuck found it a pitiful sight to watch his father scurry across town to get an envelope from Mooney. Antonio now sat before his eldest son each month, and waited obediently while Mooney counted out a few hundred dollars from a drawer containing tens of thousands. Antonio's children had gotten on with their own lives, albeit in Mooney's shadow. Vicky had married a factory worker in 1945, Pepe had taken a neighborhood girl as his bride, and now hustled at a book joint with the rest of Mooney's soldiers. Antoinette, still unmarried and living at home at 35, made belts in Paris garters at a factory. Josie, also at home and unmarried, worked at Ange's brother's company, Central Envelope. Catherine's children, the cousins, effectively had dropped out of sight. If any of the family members resented Mooney's success, it wasn't evident. Rather, they each in their own way basked in the celebrity of the Giancana name. It gave them stature in the neighborhood. For Pepe, who, unlike Chuck, never achieved the role of confidant with his infamous brother, being a Giancana nevertheless meant the security of a good job. The sisters found it open doors, if only briefly, to better treatment from their peers. The butcher, knowing their infamous relative, gave them the better cuts of meat, the baker the freshest loaves. 
However, other people, remotely connected to the John Connor name, also tried to cash in on its benefits, or attempted to gain entry, using whatever means necessary, into what they saw as the lucrative and intriguing underworld. Shortly before Christmas of 1947, a naive yet ambitious punk somewhat rashly placed a phone call to Mooney's home with just such a scheme. He told Ange that, as the son of one of John Connor's godparents, he believed Mooney should set him up in a book joint on Grand Avenue. Upon learning that Mooney was out, the punk said he'd wait at the Walgreen on Austin and Roosevelt for Mooney's call and reply. There were some things an outsider, and in Mooney's way of thinking most people were outsiders, never ever did. One was call Mooney's home. Another was discuss business with Mooney's wife. Both were considered insults and demonstrated a gross lack of respect for Mooney's position. If a guy wanted to talk to Mooney, he asked another guy, such as Fat Leonard or Rocky Potenza, for a meeting. They would go to Mooney for permission, and then, and only then, would the guy get to see Mooney. As Ange relayed the phone message to Mooney, Chuck concluded the guy didn't know the first thing about the syndicate. He even started to laugh, until he looked over at Mooney, purple with rage. Do you know this guy? Mooney glanced at Ange and decided to temper his words. This Mendolia SOB? Well, do you, Chuck? Chuck nodded. His mirth transformed to somber acquiescence in the face of his brother's outrage. Yeah, sure, I know the family, he said. His brother, well, he's a thief. Fences his stuff through a guy in the north side. But Johnny? Jesus, Mooney, the guy doesn't know his you-know-what from a hole in the ground. He's one square John. Tell you the truth, I can't believe it was Johnny who called. He's a real greenhorn. Mooney motioned with a cigar for Chuck to follow and turned to walk into the living room. Once alone, he whirled around and hissed through clenched teeth, I don't fucking care if a little bastard is green as grass, and I sure as hell don't care if he's related to... Nobody fucking calls my home. Nobody. Ever. This little prick needs to be taught a goddamn lesson. After you're done with him, I expect he'll know a thing or two about respect. Capiche? Chuck stared into Mooney's eyes. They were as cold and dead as fish eyes. He wasn't sure exactly what Mooney was asking him to do, but he was certain when he found out he wouldn't want to do it. A flush of panic came over him. He hoped Mooney didn't see it. His thoughts raced. Was this his moment of truth? The moment he'd been dreading for years, hoping against hope the day would never come when Mooney demanded proof of his loyalty? Could this be it? and would have come down to something so meaningless as a guy who just plain didn't know better, making a stupid phone call he shouldn't have. Chuck drew out a cigar and lit it. Slowly, purposefully, he walked across the room. Trying to act nonchalant, he looked back into Mooney's eyes. So what exactly do you want me to do to the guy? He searched Mooney's face impassively. Beat his fucking brains in, that's what. Mooney clenched his fist. God damn it, give the guy something to remember. Chuck stood there motionless, speechless. You got a problem with that? He avoided Mooney's stare and looked down at the ash on his cigar. Picking up the ashtray, he flicked it and took a long, deep breath. Before he could reply, his brother spoke. Forget about it, Mooney snapped. We'll both go see the son of a bitch. I'd like to see what the guy is up to anyhow. Go call him at the Walgreen and tell him we'll be right over. A mixture of relief and guilt swept over Chuck as he dialed the number. He felt as if he'd let Mooney down, but he was thankful he hadn't been forced to tell Mooney yes or no. Maybe to Mooney it was the same thing. His hesitation probably said volumes. And Chuck knew there were plenty of other guys who'd have jumped at the chance to do his brother a favor, no matter what it was. He'd heard them before. The guy who shined Mooney's shoes once offered to take out anybody Mooney wanted— and Mooney had thought it was a swell thing that the guy would offer something like that. People would do just about anything to be on the inside. And here he was, a John Connor, Mooney's own brother, and he'd hesitated. They didn't talk much on the way to the Walgreen. Mooney coughed a couple of times and asked whether Chuck knew what the punk looked like. That was the extent of their conversation. Chuck still didn't know what Mooney was going to do to the guy, or ask Chuck to do to him. His winter coat felt heavy and too warm, he rolled the window down. Hot? Mooney asked sarcastically. No, just thought I'd let some of my cigar smoke out, Chuck replied, and rolled the window back up. Finally, they were there. The Walgreen was crowded, 
and Chuck spotted the man in a booth near the soda fountain. With his wide-brimmed fedora pulled over one eye and a trench coat with an upturned collar, he looked like a guy who'd seen one too many gangster movies. Chuck felt sure the guy had no idea how silly he looked. They went through stilted greetings and sat down. Mooney crossed his arms and leaned back. So, I understand, Johnny, you want to talk to me about opening a joint in your neighborhood, he said, smiling. That's right, Mooney. Chuck saw his brother bristle. No one in Mendolia's position called him Mooney. No, it was Mr. Giancana. Mr. Giancana, Chuck corrected. Oh, sorry, I thought us being practically related and all. Well, I thought we was like family. Chuck wished he could talk for the guy himself, because the more Johnny said, the worse it got. He was waiting for Mooney to explode, or worse, throw Chuck that look he'd seen him give needles countless times before. Well, Johnny, we're not family. That was your first mistake, Mooney said evenly. And we're not related in any way I know about, now are we? Well, no, not really. So you see you're off base here. In fact, Mooney leaned forward, you're way over your head. You could get yourself hurt real bad messing around, shooting off your mouth. Some guys might go pretty hard on a punk trying to muscle a place in the gang. Hear what I'm saying? Johnny nodded and nervously gulped his coffee. So let's just get a few things straight before you go home today, all right? Again, Johnny nodded. When he spoke, Mooney's voice was soft and low, not at all the way Chuck had expected. Don't ever call my home again, and don't ever talk to my wife. You aren't going to have a fucking joint on Grand Avenue or anywhere else. You're going to go back to your nice little family and get a nice fucking job cutting meat at a market or loading fruit on a truck somewhere. And you're going to forget about things that aren't any of your business. But you know what the best thing is? Mooney reached across the table and patted Johnny's hand before he could reply. The best thing is, you're going to fucking stay alive. He rose from the table. Nice seeing you, Johnny, he said, and with Chuck right behind him, left the punk to his coffee and dreams. Figuring Mooney out, Chuck thought, was going to take a lifetime. Sometimes he'd coil up and strike on a dime, or lie back real nice and let a guy off the hook. It was hard to tell what Mooney might do. After their conversation about Johnny in the living room, Chuck had expected the worst, and the opposite had happened. Mooney hadn't even raised his voice to the guy. He had been in perfect control. There was something about the way Mooney just automatically took the reins. He didn't wait to see what the other guy would do. He just took control. And oddly, nobody ever questioned his domination. Chuck couldn't imagine it being any other way. And he thought it probably had never entered Mooney's mind, either, that he might play second fiddle to another guy's tune. In the latter part of 1947... Mooney gave Chuck a job working the pinball machine rackets in the Marquette District. It was an area where Mooney said police captain Andy Akins would turn his head to the syndicate goings-on, allowing Chuck to have a field day. And indeed, by the following year, Chuck had managed to place over 200 of the illegal gambling devices without the merest hint of difficulty from the police. From this one operation, he grossed $120,000 a year, money he dutifully delivered to Mooney. Sitting in Mooney's Oak Park basement in January of 1948, Chuck watched as Mooney counted out a thousand for him and then bundled another six thousand for himself, depositing it neatly alongside bundle after bundle of cash in his heavy desk drawer. He handed Chuck a cigar and sat back in his chair. So how'd you like to go to Cuba, see some shows, win a few bucks, screw a couple of Latin broads? Hey, I'd probably love it, Mooney. I mean, what guy wouldn't? right? Chuck smiled, savoring the smooth Havana cigar. He didn't really take Mooney seriously. He thought they were just shooting the breeze and killing time. Well, I think you will. No point freezing your ass off here when it's warm and sunny in Cuba, right? Chuck cleared his throat. Mooney was getting at something. Right, he replied. He leaned forward in the leather Viking chair. So what do you want me to do? Mooney opened the lower right-hand drawer in the massive carved oak desk. He lifted out a small manila envelope and pushed it toward Chuck. Take this to the Hotel Nacionale in Havana and deliver it to Mr. Meyer. No problem, Chuck said, smiling. He picked up the envelope. From its shape and feel, he could tell it contained money. 
Want to know what's in there? Mooney asked, grinning. Not if you don't want to tell me. A half a million bucks, Chuck, he nodded. In these, Mooney held up a bill. At first, Chuck couldn't make out the numerals or the face. He'd never seen a greenback like it. He squinted across the desk. Mooney started to laugh. It's a fifty, Chuck. A fifty? He'd never seen a fifty like it before. Yeah, a fifty thousand dollar bill. Oh, yeah, I see that now, Chuck said, trying to sound unimpressed. He hoped his face hadn't registered shock or amazement. Mr. Glass here, Mooney tapped the face on the bill with the back of his hand, is a world traveler. He's come in real handy in Cuba, he laughed again. Chuck joined in the laughter, and then, pausing, asked in earnest, When do I leave? Right away. Drive down to Florida, and then take a plane from Miami over to Havana. Hey, take a friend if you want. What the hell? Have a good time. All right. I'll leave tomorrow morning. Anything else? Yeah, Chuck. There's more. Lots more action in the future. You just come along for the ride, okay? He leaned over the desk. Listen, we're moving fast now. I got two points, two percent of the skim, in the Flamingo in Vegas already. Shit, at thirty-five G's apiece, those points were a hell of a buy. And after we're done locking up Cuba, we're going to look at the Arabs, the Dominican Republic. When we're done with the dictator down there in the Dominican Republic, he'll give us the whole fucking island. And if he doesn't, we'll find somebody who will. He stood up and walked around the desk. On cue, Chuck also rose from his chair. Mooney smiled a strange, secret smile, and put his arm around Chuck's shoulder. And you know what? he asked. What? You'd be fucking perfect to run our end down there when it opens up. Chuck was speechless. This was the moment he'd been waiting for, his dream come true. He wanted to say something, but everything he thought of, he quickly rejected as inappropriate or trite. Mooney walked him to the basement's heavy steel door. You have some fun in Cuba. Take care of this for me, and we'll see what happens. Chuck's face became deadly serious as he turned to go. You know it's going to be handled right with me, Mooney. You can always count on me, he promised. I know, Mooney said softly. And with that, he closed the door. Chapter 11 Chuck and his friend Sam Marcello everybody called him Googie Eyes, landed in Havana, Cuba, on January 18, 1948. The door of the small prop opened, revealing a cloudless azure sky, so blue it could make you cry, Chuck would tell his friends back home. The steamy blasts of humid tropical air swept his hair around like dry seaweed as he walked down the steps to the tarmac. He sniffed the air. Salt he said to his friend, and he smiled at the warmth of the Caribbean sun caressing his face. He thought he might like this place. But his opinion soon changed. Actually, he hadn't had one, hadn't really known what to expect. A Sodom and Gomorrah? A rush street with palm trees? A Miami with gambling? Probably the latter, he thought to himself, as their cab with its oily, torn cloth seats, stained and smelling like stale urine and cheap wine, honked and shoved its way through the crowded, dusty streets, narrowed by throngs of hollow-eyed people and menacing police officers. The poverty shocked him. It was worse than the patch, and he'd always thought that was as bad as it could get. But no, Cuba had that beat all to hell. Here, raw sewage ran in rivulets down the twisting alleyways, and blind and one-armed beggars lined each corner, hands outstretched. Hungry children, mostly boys, rushed to the cab to hawk their wares in broken English. "'Want the screw, mister? My sister is very pretty!' one runny-nosed kid yelled in perfect English. "'Mine is prettier, mister!' cried another. They pushed and elbowed their way to the cab window, pitching both shoe shines and their sisters with equal salesmanship. As one scene melded into the next, Marcella could only shake his head and say, Jesus, can you believe this? Chuck patted the pocket of his linen sport coat and was relieved to find the envelope's reassuring bulge. All he cared about was making this delivery. He'd do that and then they'd get the hell out of here. It began to feel as if they'd been driving around for hours, and Chuck started to consider the fact that he had no idea where they were going. The cabbie, gabbling in Spanish, could take them anywhere he wanted, and Chuck wouldn't know the difference. As the heat of the city closed in around them, 
He suddenly realized how dangerous this job actually was. The people here were so poor and life so cheap that two gringo touristas could disappear in an instant, especially two gringos with 500,000 American dollars. The presence of the police, their guns bristling, did nothing to reassure him. A clammy sweat began to creep over his hands and soon spread to his clothes. Beads of perspiration gleamed on his forehead. He patted the tiny bulge in his pocket more than once and silently chastised himself for being so nervous. The last thing he wanted to do was look that way, he told himself, as he struggled to maintain his composure. He lit a Cuban cigar and tried to relax and take in the scenery. At last, rising out of the stench of the streets, was the Hotel Nacionale. Like an island within an island, its white walls stood in green-shuttered elegance. When their driver parked the cab, Chuck threw open the door and walked hurriedly through the hotel lobby and up to the desk. More collected now, he calmly requested the manager. Dressed in a dapper white Panama suit, the small, mustached man quickly appeared. As instructed, Chuck asked for Mr. Meyer. Shortly thereafter, a slender Jewish man in a white short-sleeved shirt appeared. For Mr. Meyer? he asked. He smiled as his eyes caught sight of the envelope. Yes, sir, Chuck said, handing the envelope to the enigmatic man before him. Thank you. He tucked the envelope under one arm and then added, Tell Mooney hello. Chuck nodded and Mr. Meyer faded into the crowd. That was all there was to it, and his job for Mooney safely accomplished... Chuck loosened his tie and sighed with relief. That night, he and Googie Eyes ventured down the shadowy streets to drink and laugh and cuddle their share of voluptuous Cuban girls. Boy, this is living, Googie Eyes said more times than Chuck could count. But as the night grew long, it all reminded him of a too rich meal. The glitter was reduced to decadence and gluttony in the face of the island's poverty. And like a man who'd had more than enough, he pushed it all away and excused himself for the night. With some relief and more guilt, he crawled into bed. It seemed almost criminal to sleep in such affluence. Somewhere outside his window, there were row upon row of tiny, propped-up, tin-roofed shanties with dirty floors and dirty children. If the millions Mooney and the syndicate were pouring into Cuba was making a difference in the lives of Cubans, he hadn't seen it, unless it was to magnify their poverty. He had to believe that these people wouldn't beg in the shadow of the syndicate's opulence forever, not without some day wanting their share. And frankly, he'd tell Mooney later, he couldn't blame them. The next morning, Chuck awakened with one thought, and that was to get out of Cuba. But you must see the Almora Castle before you leave, insisted the disappointed desk clerk as they paid their bill. Googie Eyes wholeheartedly agreed. We have to see something besides shacks and broads, he complained. Not in the mood to argue, Chuck acquiesced, and they visited the historic site, mingling with the floral-shirted tourists in the hot midday sun. Later, as he boarded the plane, Chuck looked up at the Cuban sky one last time and thanked God he was leaving. A beautiful hell, he called Cuba after that. Just one more beautiful hell. Mooney was pleased with Chuck's performance in Cuba, and dangled the Dominican Republic carrot repeatedly by commenting, twinkle in his eye, a guy can live like a king down there. The possibility of such a plum being bestowed on him, coupled with his renewed appreciation for the United States as a land of opportunity, spurred him on. Chuck threw himself into his pinball machine operation with new zeal. He held on to what Mooney had said about running Chicago's end in the Dominican Republic, although he secretly hoped it wasn't anything like Cuba. Whatever it would be like, it would signal his move up, and he wanted to be ready. He was willing to work for it, to prove himself, to earn Mooney's favor. For now, he was making good money. He always had ten or twenty C-notes in his pocket, sometimes he had as much as three thousand dollars, and he drove a shiny new 1948 baby blue Super Buick with a trunk chock full of pinball machine parts and punch boards for the book joints. He was, for the first time in his life, on top of the world— the only thing he didn't have was a wife, which was the one thing Mooney, with increasing frequency, was quick to mention. You're twenty-five, Chuck. You got money in your pocket. What you need now is a good Italian girl, a house in the suburbs, and some screaming kids, he'd say, laughing. 
Given Mooney's comments, Chuck might have anticipated some traditional Italian matchmaking, but he suspected nothing that April of 1948, when Ange and Mooney suggested he invite Anne-Marie Torsiello to join Bonnie and Annette for an afternoon of horseback riding. Instead, he smiled at the recollection of a little thirteen-year-old girl whose common sense, resolute manner, and studious ways had once earned his respect. It didn't occur to him that Anne-Marie was now seventeen, or that she'd take his breath away. When he drove by to pick her up, he found the Torsiellos living in much the same condition as they had four years before. Carl still worked at the rail yards, and Tilly still cooked big bubbling pots of sauces, and smiled and laughed as though life couldn't be better. Sicilians probably would have been embittered by the turn their life had taken, he thought to himself. But the Torsiellos were Neapolitans, Italians originating from Naples, and Neapolitans were a happy people, no matter what. That was something Mooney had always liked about the Torsiellos. But as unchanged as Carl and Tilly were, Chark hardly recognized Anne-Marie. Gone was the shy little girl he remembered, and in her place was the most beautiful young woman he thought he'd ever seen. Showgirls, dancers, celebrities, thousand-dollar whores, thanks to Mooney he'd had a share of women, none of them could hold a candle to this fresh-faced brunette with sparkling eyes who greeted him now. He took one look at her and fell head over heels crazy in love. From that moment on, nothing was the same. He could think of nothing else but the diminutive dark-eyed girl, her ruby lips, her soft, dark hair that smelled of the perfume he began to lavish on her. That spring he gave her a strand of real pearls and took her to the type of dazzling places she'd only dreamed about. The Chaperie became their favorite night spot with its celebrity crooners and clientele. Dave Helper, the club's smooth-talking manager, who'd later be sent by Mooney to work at the Riviera in Las Vegas, always made sure they had the best seats in the house. Hey, liven up! Mooney's brother's here! Helper whispered to the waiters, after Chuck slipped him a C-note. Take care of him. Give him whatever he wants, and for Christ's sake, make sure he's happy, Helper commanded. And for the first time in his life, Chuck was. He found himself intoxicated more by the woman at his side than by the champagne that the white-coated waiters brought to their front-row table with such flourish. In the candlelight, everything paled next to his beautiful Anne-Marie. In July, Ange, flush with enthusiasm, told Chuck, I hear Anne Marie's having the time of her life, and the Torsiellos are ecstatic to have their daughter courted by Mooney Giancana's brother. Everybody in the family, including me and Mooney, thinks it's a match made in heaven. Chuck was glad there was such an incredible network of gossip and support within the families, but he was disappointed nevertheless. Knowing he had Mooney's stamp of approval in this relationship was important, even critical to his future, but more than that, he wanted to know that Anne-Marie had fallen in love with him. And he made up his mind to ask her to marry him when he did. On a breezy Saturday night in July, as they walked from the car to the Chaperie, he pulled her close and looked into her eyes. He wanted to make love to her more than he'd ever wanted anything in his life. I love you, Anne-Marie, he said, and kissed her with a tenderness that surprised even him. I love you, too she said breathlessly, and stifled a girlish giggle. I always have. Perplexed, he held her at arm's length. You always have? Since when? Since I was just a little girl. When I brought the note from my father to Mooney's house, I took one look at you and, well, I fell in love. But you just thought I was a little kid. Her lower lip formed a tiny, mocking pout. Well, you were just a thirteen-year-old kid, and I was twenty-one. He smiled impishly. So you've been madly in love with me all along. I knew it. I just knew it. He laughed. Feeling foolish, she retorted, And you're crazy about me, too. Everybody says so. Ange, my Aunt Rose, my Aunt Betty, everybody. They say even Mooney says so. Is that right? He challenged. He adored her childlike fieriness, enjoyed watching it bubble to the surface. Yes, that's right. That's what they say. They said Chuck Giancana is crazy in love with Anne-Marie Torsiello. Her eyes brimmed with tears. Suddenly he was afraid he'd hurt her feelings, and he didn't think he could bear that. He pulled her close again. Well, he ran his fingers along her cheek until they reached her lips, and then dropped his voice to a whisper. They're all right. I do love you. 
He took her upturned chin in his hand and kissed her. Will you marry me? he whispered. Oh, yes, Chuck, she cried, throwing her arms around his neck. A thousand times, yes. They laughed and hugged. Every time he touched her, he wanted her so badly it made his heart ache. So this is what love feels like, he thought to himself, when at last they stepped into the smoky darkness of the shaperie. Slipping Dave Helper his customary tip, Chuck heard Helper's familiar whispered refrain, Hey, liven up, Mooney's brother's here. Mooney. All the talks they'd had over the years about what a good wife should be, and he'd never even realized that the one thing they'd never talked about was love. He thought he understood why now, too, because he was certain Mooney had never really loved anyone in his entire life. If Mooney, in his ever-expanding circle of associates, loved anything, it was power. And it seemed like the dope addicts, loathed by the common folks of the patch, Mooney was addicted in his own way. Certainly a desire for power didn't, in Chuck's way of thinking, qualify as a form of love. Instead, it was a need. Mooney would get a piece of gambling in one state, and before Chuck knew it, he'd be plotting to take over another one. His brother's hunger was an insatiable ambition that was eating him from the inside out. Oddly, people didn't seem to find much wrong with addictions to power and wealth. Those qualities were lauded as admirable. The neighborhood saw Mooney as some kind of new hero. And politicians such as Mayor Kennelly and President Truman were esteemed as public servants, when in truth they were, if what Mooney had said was accurate, in servitude to a much higher order— their own need for power. As autumn of 1948 approached, the lines between the so-called good guys and bad guys slowly began to blur. Chuck watched Chicago's well-oiled political machine spring into action in readiness for the presidential election. Mooney was unusually vocal in decrying the politicians who held out their hands for favors, and he also railed against the coppers, who made more from the syndicate than they did from the taxpayers, this, Chuck rationalized, was just fine with him. He never knew when Mooney's clout might come in handy. The only copper Chuck always tried to avoid was Frank Pape. In fifteen years, the guy had built up quite a reputation. Chucky Nicoletti, one of Mooney's enforcers, was always getting a shakedown from Pape, and it cost him hundreds in payoffs to Pape's higher-ups. Needles had even remarked that the motherfucker has taken out more men than all of the guys in the syndicate put together since he joined the force in 33. Of course, the difference was that Pape was applauded for his aggressiveness against the underworld for being impossible to bribe. But Mooney found that laughable. Did you ever notice how Pape goes after the same guys that are giving us trouble and gets them for good? Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Just think about it. You'll get the idea. Despite Mooney's insinuations, Chuck still made a concerted effort to stay out of the copper's way. As luck would have it, though, his path did cross Papes one September evening. Driving along Cicero and Roosevelt on his way to pick up Anne-Marie, Chuck caught sight of the copper's headlights in his rearview mirror. God damn it, he said aloud. Within moments, the squad car's red light began flashing ominously. I'm gonna get fucking pinched, he said in exasperation. Shit. This is going to really cost me. He wasn't so worried about paying them off. He had over $2,000 in his pocket. But the pinball machine parts and punch boards in his trunk were another matter. He rolled down the window and came face to face with the one copper he'd hoped he'd never meet. Frank Pape. Get out, Giancana, the copper snarled. Let's check you out. Chuck readily obliged. So what's the problem? I wasn't speeding. Pape turned to the other copper and said simply, Frisk him. All I found was this, Frank. The officer held up a tight wad of bills. Give me that, Pape snapped. The other officer shrugged his shoulders and readily complied. Pape began counting. Twenty-two hundred bucks here, he said, smirking. Mind telling me where it came from, Greaseball? No, I don't, Chuck said, glaring. He had to think fast, and he added, I'm a roofer, and I got paid for a big job today. Nothing to it. So now, can we all go on about our business? A roofer? Pape laughed and craned his wiry neck from his starch collar like a turtle about to snap. Well, I don't believe a word of it. Bristling, he handed Chuck the money. Leave your car here. You're going downtown with me. 
In the squad car, Chuck remembered everything Mooney had told him about shakedowns. If the cops couldn't be bought on the spot, the price went up. And once at the station house, when the coppers emptied his pockets and saw all that cash, he found out what Mooney had meant. Word got out and the coppers started coming round like vultures to a kill. They smiled and politely offered him coffee. With cream and sugar? they asked. He could have had a dozen cups of coffee if he'd wanted. It was amazing. He was allowed to use the phone before they took him to the lockup. He called Tony Champagne, Mooney's attorney and old friend from the patch, and magically the cell door had scarcely closed before the turnkey announced Chuck was being taken back upstairs to the police commissioner's office. A friendly face awaited him. Clearly irritated, Andy Akins sat behind his desk while Frank Pape leaned against the wall, sulking. Good to see you, Andy, Chuck said, smiling, and couldn't resist a triumphant glance in Pape's direction. Aiken sat down. Have a seat and let's talk a minute. Pape here thinks there was some problem tonight. So what I'm asking you is, what's the problem? What was going on tonight? I have no idea, Andy. I wasn't speeding or doing anything else illegal. Pape here, he just pulled me over and brought me down here for no good reason. None at all. Well, where were you going then? Akins asked. I was on my way to pick up my girlfriend for a night in the town. Chuck brushed his hand across his elegantly tailored suit. I was all dressed up and ready to have a nice dinner, that's all. And then Officer Pape decided to go and ruin my evening. Akins shot a hard look at Pape. See, Frank, this man is clean. I strongly suggest you leave him alone, he reprimanded. Pape nodded, clenching his jaw in silent anger. Yes, sir, he said. Aiken smiled. Well, then, we'll just forget about this little mix-up, and Mr. Giancana here can go home, with our sincerest apologies. Thank you, Chuck replied, finding it difficult to conceal a grin. Aikens rose from his desk and walked around to the door, calling out to the men gathered in the hallway. Hey, one of you guys give Mr. Giancana here a ride back to his car. That's the way it was being Mooney's brother, and according to Mooney, that's the way it was with cops in Chicago. The graft and corruption had been going on for years. It had started way before Mooney was ever born. But he'd certainly seized on the existing machinery and used it to his best advantage. From the lowliest beat cop to the highest captain or commissioner, Mooney said they were all part of the syndicate stable. Even Mayor Kennelly, like his predecessor Kelly, was, as Mooney put it, our man. For Chuck... It was like walking under a constant umbrella of protection. As the election drew closer that autumn, politics were hard to ignore. The presidential race was all Mooney talked about. Throughout October, he made his obligatory rounds of meetings and hopped from city to city, but the election was what got his blood running. Chuck didn't understand what the attraction was for his brother until he and Mooney went out to the Chez Paris one night. Mooney didn't want to sit up front at a table, so Helper placed him in a cozy nook and left them with a bottle of the house's best wine. I'd rather have scotch, Mooney told the waiter, who wasted no time scurrying to retrieve his regular doers. So you're going to get married, Mooney said while lighting his cigar. Finally going to settle down. About time, too. He laughed a low, kidding kind of laugh and winked. Chuck didn't want to talk about women or running around or any of Mooney's other philosophies of matrimony. Sure, he was in love, but he didn't want Mooney to think he was a square John. In self-defense, he changed the subject. Yeah, married, but I'd rather talk about politics than women, he said. Mooney's eyes narrowed. Oh, you would? Chuck poured a glass of wine and nodded. Yeah, I would. Politics? Politics. What about politics? Do I know something you don't? Mooney's face was expressionless. Chuck wasn't sure whether Mooney was kidding or not. This wasn't a card game, yet his brother was certainly wearing his best poker face. Maybe he was venturing into territory that was off limits. He thought about that for a moment, and then decided to call Mooney's bluff. He grinned. You might know something I don't. Like who the hell is going to win? Mooney chuckled. Yeah, you're right. I just might. He dragged on his cigar and looked at Chuck out of the corner of his eye. Mooney would tell him. Chuck could tell he was just playing with him, wanting him to coax it out of him. He decided to play along. So what is it? Man, oh man, you don't give up, do you? Chuck laughed. Shit, I'm your brother, right? Yeah, I guess you are. 
tell you the truth, Chuck, I'm proud of you, too. You're doing a good job over in the Marquette District, keeping everybody on their goddamn toes. The other districts, well, I wish I had a hundred men like you. We'd win the election for sure. Isn't it sure that Truman will get in? Well, let's put it this way. Dewey won't win, even if he does. Get my point? Yeah, Chuck hesitated. But really, what difference does it make? Like you said before, they're all alike. Well, not this time. Luciano still hates Dewey for putting him in jail in the first place. Costello's worried that the self-righteous son of a bitch has a short memory, probably doesn't even know how to conduct business. We'd have to give Dewey a few lessons, and I got a feeling he's a slow learner, Mooney said, smiling. But Truman, well, he can bullshit all he wants about being a common man. People eat that up, but the truth is, he grew up with our boys in Kansas City. Really? I didn't know that. How come nobody talks about it? Christ, because it's just like Chicago out there. They had a Mick Mayor Pendergast on the take big time, loved to bet on the ponies, and they got the Italians for muscle and to make money with the rackets. So fact is, Truman owes everything he's got to us. Pendergast made him a judge, and then, with the Italian muscle behind him, got him to the Senate. When the 44 election came up, Kelly here in Chicago got him on the ticket with Roosevelt. Shit, Chicago got Roosevelt and Truman nominated and elected. We were good to Roosevelt. He was good to us. He died, and Truman's been our man in the White House ever since. It's smooth sailing with him there. I thought he was a schoolteacher or something. He always seemed clean. I know what you said before, but I guess I didn't know he was really connected. Mooney sighed. Jesus, I guess you think General MacArthur was a choir boy out there fighting for America, too. Like I always told you, give me a guy who steals a little and I'll make money. He shook his head. Well, there's connected, Chuck. And then there's connected. We pulled the strings, so shit, yeah. If they can be bought, they're connected. Chuck took a drink and thought for a moment. So Dewey would just fuck things up, or at least make things more... He searched for the right word. More uncertain? Exactly. So now, think you'd like to place a bet? Truman or Dewey? Take my advice and put your money on Truman. Soon after, the November 3, 1948 Chicago Daily Tribune, lying on Mooney's desk, read, Dewey defeats Truman. Mooney sat beaming from behind his desk, smoking a cigar triumphantly. What did I tell you? he said. We even made the Tribune look like a bunch of fucking idiots. Next time they'll wait before they publish the wrong headline. I bet they learned their lesson. It ain't over till the bell rings, right? Hey, what can I say? Chuck said, grinning. You were right on the money. Boy, does Truman owe Chicago, Mooney said, smiling. Thirty thousand votes. That's all he won by. Jesus, we had to beg, borrow, and steal to swing the son of a bitch. No way the man doesn't know who got him elected. You can be sure of that, Chuck agreed. This means the door is wide open. Mooney leaned back against the soft leather chair and smiled. Damn, it's all going our way. There's going to be trouble out in the Pacific. You can bank on that. Guys found out during the war that there's money to be made if you stir up a little trouble. Government contracts, black market shit, you name it. Truman will play ball. And Chicago, New York, we got some big plans. We're going to open up new places, like I told you. The Dominican Republic, for one. Remember I said we're working on the Philippines? We already got millions in Cuba. We're getting in with Egypt and the Arabs. The votes we bring in are worth a lot more than getting off on a parking ticket or beating the fucking IRS. Mooney leaned forward. You see, these foreign countries are funny, Chuck. They can turn in a minute. But if a president owes us, he'll make sure it's under control. He'll ship every fucking soldier in America out to some godforsaken hellhole if he has to, just to protect our interests. Because our interests are his and his buddy's interests. Mooney sat back and started to laugh. What? Chuck was perplexed. What's a goddamn funny about that? Shit, Mooney replied. I just realized it. Can you believe we're paying the president for protection? He's got a bigger army, Chuck said, joining in Mooney's laughter. Suddenly Mooney turned serious. That's right, he does. But I never met a politician yet with bigger balls than an Italian. And you know what that means? He raised one eyebrow. What? He leaned across the table and looked Chuck square in the eye. It means we give the order to fire. Chapter 12 The pale cheeks of his bride deepened as he sealed their future with a kiss. 
Afterward, she joyfully clasped a bouquet of snow-white orchids to her pearl-encrusted bodice and smiled. Anne-Marie Torciella was at last a Giancana. For months, every last detail of the lavish affair had been planned by Chuck and Ange, while Mooney had watched on the sidelines, nodding his approval. Strangely, now that his wedding day was actually here, it had taken on a dreamlike quality, and Chuck felt as if he stood outside it all, moving through the motions he'd rehearsed in his mind over and over again. The May afternoon sun cast long shadows across the wedding party standing in the doorway of Notre Dame Church. On the stairs, women dressed in stoles and crepe with veiled hats perched stylishly atop chignons shouted and laughed as they pelted the bride and groom with rice, nickels, dimes, and a hail of Jordan almonds. In response, the children scrambled up and down the steps, gathering as much candy and change as they could carry. Below on the sidewalk, the dark-suited men lit cigars and choked among themselves. Chuck's brother Pepe and his sisters Vicky, Antoinette, Mary, and Josie flanked Graying Antonio, now nearly seventy, while beside them stood a handsome and beaming Carl Torciello. "'Is this the happiest or saddest day of my life?' he asked Tilly, whose tear-streaked face he dabbed with a handkerchief. "'The happiest,' she replied. Ange had served as Anne-Marie's maid of honor, and now her organza dress rustled as she gathered her daughters, Annette, Bonnie, and Francine, around her like a mother hen. Amid all the hubbub, Chuck caught sight of Mooney, standing silent and apart from the pressing crowd. In the sun he became a silhouette of fleeting loneliness against the sleek black limousine. The reception would be twice as large. Four hundred of the city's leaders, both gang members and politicians, would attend the celebration. And all were Mooney's men, in one way or another. But first there would be a private party for the family at Mooney's home. Petty fours and canapes catered by gafers, dashing red-coated men to serve the bubbling champagne and hors d'oeuvres on sterling silver trays, and of course Alva, Mooney's black cook, to oversee it all. At seven o'clock that evening, they left Mooney's home and made their way to the downtown Sheraton Hotel ballroom. Forty elegantly dressed waiters stood at attention along the wall. Forty candlelit tables, seating ten guests each, surrounded a stage and dance floor. The strains of an eighteen-piece orchestra led by Lou Breeze from the Chicago Theater drifted out into the hotel lobby. Surveying the ballroom, Chuck felt a surge of pride. This was going to be the wedding reception to beat all wedding receptions. Anne-Marie gasped in stunned amazement. It's beautiful, Chuck she exclaimed, like a fairy tale. You like it? Speechless, she could only nod. Once they were seated at the head table, he had a chance to drink it all in, to savor the luxurious drape of the crisp linen tablecloths, the lavish floral arrangements that graced each table, the monumental number of distinguished guests who, tuxedoed and bejeweled, poured through the doors. The big guy strolled in with their wives, Paul Rika, since his release, relegated to media figurehead, Jake Guzik, meek and mild-mannered thanks to his kidnapping, Louis Campania, an old Capone crony who was fast becoming aligned with Mooney, Joe Fusco, the bootlegger-turned-liquor distributor, Tony Accardo, the current head of Chicago Syndicate, Murray Humphreys, Mooney's political fixer, Charlie Joe, the old nitty crony and Hollywood extortionist, gotta watch him, Mooney had said, Ross Prio, police fixer and north side gambling head, Sam Golfbag Hunt, an old Capone hitman, Eddie Vogel, king of the slot machines, Phil DeAndrea, a Guzik money man and Hollywood extortionist, Gus Alex, the Greek lieutenant and political fixer, the Fischetti brothers, the syndicate celebrity frontmen and party goers, all for show was how Mooney described them. And then, as if on cue, the up and comers filed in, mostly members of Mooney's old gang. Fat Leonard, Needles Gianola, a smart head from way back who would do anything Mooney asked, his sidekick James Muggsy Tortorella, Rocky Potenza, the gambling lieutenant, Tietz Battaglia, Mooney's loan shark whiz and enforcer, Frank Caruso, the South Side gambling soldier, Joey DeVarco, Mooney's sometime assassin and extortionist, Willie Potatoes Dodano, the Marquis de Sod of the gang, who also handled vice rackets, cigarette, and pinball machines, Fifi Bukeri, 
labor union muscle and assassin, and the brothers Butch and Chuck English, both involved in political fixes, machines, and jukeboxes. Notably absent was the crazy Mad Dog De Stefano, whom Mooney said would just show up in his fucking pajamas with an ice pick in his pocket and scare the women. Police Commissioner Andy Akins was in attendance, as well as politicians, attorneys, and union guys such as Roland Libanati, Pat Marcy, Jimmy Aducci, Joey Glimko, and John Darko. They were hardly through the door before they were sipping wine and slapping backs. And there were even a few representatives from the Catholic Church among the guests, notably a priest Mooney used as a courier and bagman, Father Cash. It was a telling occasion. Needles was right when, at one point in the festivities, he said all a person had to do was watch the interaction between the men to know who was in control. Chuck noticed how the guys he thought of as the powerhouses fawned over Mooney. Needles described Chicago's rising star more bluntly. They shit themselves when Mooney walks in the room. Standing quietly by, Mooney accepted his authority with self-assurance and what Chuck thought was less than veiled pride. But Mooney had good reason to be proud. The truth was he'd made it, and he was bringing everybody along for the ride. He'd spun the wheel and hit the jackpot, and there would be no stopping him now. The whole world was Mooney's apple. After a sumptuous meal, the entertainment began, and the place took on the atmosphere of a posh nightclub. Chuck, never one to sit still for long, grew restless and excused himself. He kissed his pretty bride and whispered into her ear, I'll be right back. He wanted to find Mooney, to see what he thought of it all. He edged through the tables to the back of the ballroom, where he was sure his brother would have staked out a place for whispered business discussions. Mooney leaned casually against the wall, cigar in hand. Surprisingly, he was alone. He saw Chuck coming toward him and smiled. Hey, what do you think of all this? Chuck motioned with a sweeping gesture around the room. Beautiful, Chuck, beautiful. You and Ange, I gotta hand it to you. You sure put on a class act today. How much money you think you got? Everybody brought envelopes, Kansas City, Detroit, Tampa, New Orleans, Cleveland, New York, Boston. They all sent theirs. His eyes narrowed. I think you made a killing. Chuck nodded, lighting a cigar. Yeah, I think you're right. He paused and added, Listen, the entertainment's great, Mooney, thanks to you. You made it all come together. When Joey Lewis gets up there in a minute, everybody's gonna go crazy. Yeah, he'll break him up all right. Mooney's face suddenly turned somber. Just then Lewis took the microphone and began to sing Rosie's Little Nosy. Mooney looked at the stage and began to chuckle. Shit, Chuck, me and Lewis, we go way back. You do? Chuck said, surprised. Yeah, remember Jack McGurn? Yeah, Machine Gun McGurn. Shit, that's a name out of the past. Well, McGurn got pissed off at Lewis back in 27. You know how entertainers are. Always think of their big shots after you help get them there. If you don't watch it, they get amnesia. Forget your fucking name. And then they get too big for their britches. Well, Lewis was going to leave McGurn's club and go to another one because they offered him a grand a week. McGurn had a fit, told Lewis if he did, he'd never fucking live to spend it. But Lewis, the dumb jackass, went on and did it anyway. I guess he forgot who he was fucking with. Mooney shook his head in disbelief. So, always a man of his word, Jack sent me, Needles, and another punk over to pay him a visit. We beat him to a pulp and pistol whipped him real good. He paused and smiled. Shit, we cut his fucking throat from stem to stern. His goddamn tongue was hanging out by a string out of his mouth when we got done with him. It's a fucking wonder the guy lived, let alone can sing. When he got well, let me tell you, he was as nice as pie. Mooney grinned triumphantly and then continued. One thing we didn't con on was how other entertainers would react. The story spread like wildfire. He laughed. Like wildfire. There isn't a star alive now who'd turn us down, especially Joey Lewis. He wouldn't turn me down for nothing. He'll fucking croon his heart out all night if I tell him to. He looked at Chuck. Hey, forget about it. That's a long time ago. The guy's happy to be here tonight. Capone treated him real good, and so have the rest of us. Now he knows his place. Nothing personal, just business. It never was personal. Chuck turned to look up at Lewis basking in the spotlight on the stage. He had to admit it was totally insane, totally fucking crazy. Lewis and Mooney always acted like the best of friends. He would never have imagined such a thing, and he wished Mooney hadn't told him tonight. 
Here Lewis was entertaining the man who dealt a nearly fatal blow to his career. Chuck looked on as the crowd cheered, and Lewis smiled and began a string of one-liners. He wondered how a person could want their name in lights so much. How could anyone let bygones be bygones after practically having their tongue cut out? He had to admit Mooney sure had figured out all the angles. He knew weakness when he saw it, knew who could be manipulated, sucked clean dry, as long as he made them a star. Lewis and the rest of Hollywood might even hate Mooney, but it didn't matter, because they feared and respected him more. It was just midnight when Chuck and Anne Marie finally left for their honeymoon in Los Angeles, as he put his arm around his new wife, whom he'd recently and affectionately nicknamed Babe, and escorted her to the car, he turned, taking one last look at the hotel looming behind him, and silently vowed never to forget May 7, 1949. Today he'd come of age. It wasn't just that once a guy got married, he had certain responsibilities to fulfill— Certainly he wanted to give Anne-Marie a beautiful home, wanted to drape her in furs and diamonds, but the day had been more than that. It wasn't often all the guys came together, unless somebody had died or gotten married, and today he'd finally seen with his own eyes the amount of control and power Mooney wielded. What Mooney had been telling him for years was true. Get to the top and don't get caught along the way, and you'll not only be a good husband and provider, you'll be a hero, too. California was ritzy enough, but in no time at all, Chuck tired of tropical drinks and sunshine. He was eager to get back to Chicago, and even more eager to get on with his life. Now wasn't the time to be lounging around, he explained to Anne Marie, and they checked out of their hotel. Mooney had told him to come over when he got back into town, and after depositing his new bride in a spacious apartment he'd rented from Mooney's friend, tough Tony Capizio, Chuck drove right over to Oak Park. He envisioned Mooney announcing that he and Anne-Marie would be moving to the Dominican Republic, or that he had a new, more important and lucrative job, or was being given more territory as reward for his loyal service. Instead, Mooney had some bad news. You gotta pull in your machines, Chuck. Shit, put them in storage or something. But pull them out. There's gonna be trouble over in the district. In the meantime, go over to the Union and get a job as a motion picture operator, okay? Chuck surveyed Mooney's face. He could tell Mooney was only mildly disturbed by the momentary glitch in business. To his brother, the ten grand a month was a drop in the bucket. To Chuck, a lifeline. He found himself resenting Mooney's apparent lack of concern. Shit, Chuck thought to himself. Mooney probably orchestrated the trouble he was talking about with Commissioner Andy Akins. As his heart sank, he realized the last time he'd been this disappointed was when Mooney brought him that fucking clarinet when he was a kid. He guessed he was just supposed to lie down and play dead for who knew how long. So what's happened with the Dominican Republic? I was kind of hoping that maybe that was going to come through, Chuck said. He felt as though he sounded desperate, as if he was grasping at straws. Mooney studied him from across his desk before replying, Shit, right now the fucking dictator down there is causing problems. We can't move in till something breaks. But Humphreys tells me the government's working on it. He shrugged his shoulders. These things take time. I understand that, but, Mooney, I just got married. I got a wife who likes nice things and a new place now. Bills, you know. Mooney cut him off. Yeah, you like the place? Pretty nice, huh? See how I take care of you? Pretty good. Yeah, it's nice. We appreciate everything you've done for us. He checked himself. He didn't want to raise Mooney's ire, or make him think he was ungrateful, or worse, make him think he was just like all the rest of the family, with his hand always out. Really nice. My wife loves it. He tried to sound appreciative. I guess she'll be coming over to play cards with Ange and the other women now. She'll get to know the rest of the family. Chuck knew Mooney meant family in its larger sense. The syndicate guy's wives all played cards together each week. He kept the wives busy and gave them friends who understood the business. Having his wife join them was a big step. It signified his own acceptance as one of the men who belonged. He tried to salve his discouragement with that knowledge. And although he had no idea how they would make it on a motion picture operator's salary, he brightened at the thought of being included in the inner circle. On later reflection, he realized that was precisely why Mooney had mentioned it in the first place. But, comforted for now, he changed the subject. So what else has been going on since we left for California? Mooney frowned. 
The usual shit. Ange has been spending money like water. The girls, what can I fucking say? He raised his hands in mock despair. And that is driving me nuts. Jesus, all she talks about is Hollywood and boys. Bonnie's doing all right. And Francine, now she's a sweetheart. But kids, well, all I can say is you need a few to know what I'm talking about. He paused and lit a cigar before adding, Besides that, it's always the fucking same. Everybody's always got their hands out. Pa, he always wants something. And his folks, boy, their stripe sure changed when the money started rolling in. Now I'm their precious fucking son-in-law. Fat Leonard and the rest of the guys, they all got their hands in my pocket. Don't forget the church, Chuck added. If it wasn't a raffle or some piece of real estate, it was a car or contribution for some camp the diocese was building, and Cardinal Stretch always went to Mooney. Chuck suspected there was more to Mooney's religious affiliations and philanthropy than met the eye. None of the John Connors had been good Catholics. Growing up in Antonio's household, salvation meant making it through the week. Forgot about heaven. Ange, like his own wife, was deeply religious, and he knew much of Mooney's generosity had been thanks to her constant prodding. But aside from a few raffles, if Mooney was more deeply involved with Cardinal Stritch, there had to be something in it for Mooney. Yeah, the church, Mooney growled. Ange is coming in here practically every goddamn day for some fucking charity. He softened momentarily and added, But it makes her happy. He shrugged his shoulders and leaned back in his chair, curling his lip around his cigar. You know, Chuck, these priests remind me of the old neighborhood. They got some Chicago guys working in the diocese who Stritch says will make it to the top, all the way to the Vatican. Let me tell you, Stritch is one ambitious bastard, and the church is just like any other political game. There's a racket behind every altar when you got a guy like Stritch running the show. Mooney chuckled. Or as Stritch says, doing God's work. At the time, it all went over Chuck's head. Years later, Mooney would confide that Father Cash, the young priest Mooney used as a courier around Chicago, also served in that capacity for an enormous international money laundering venture that funneled money all the way to the Vatican. But it was another ambitious young priest, Paul Marcinkus, a big ape of a man born and raised in Capone's Cicero, whom Mooney had referred to when he spoke of Chicago guys working in the diocese. In 1952, Stritch would recommend that Marcinkus be sent to the Vatican, where he would eventually rise to bishop and secretary of the Vatican Bank, reaching the highest position of any American in the Church's history. At that pinnacle, Marcinkus would be accused of international money laundering and subsequently associated with the death of at least one uncooperative man, Pope John Paul I. Chuck stood up to leave. Like everyone else surrounding Mooney, he would do exactly as he was told, and he wouldn't complain or ask too many questions. He left Mooney's office that day, unhappy with Mooney's order to go to work as a projectionist, but if that's what Mooney wanted, he'd close down his machines. He had to believe that he'd get his chance sooner or later. For the remainder of 1949 and throughout 1950, Chuck went to work like most normal people. He missed the action, the hustle of the streets and it perpetually worried him that the job of motion picture operator was known to be the final resting place for syndicate guy's relatives. Once a guy gets in the booth, it's like a fucking coffin. He never gets out, Chucky Nicoletti teased. Fortunately, Mooney gave him a job now and then. The phone would ring, and Mooney would deliver a cryptic message. Go by the fat boy's place and pick up six loaves. Take a short one to the guy out west, a long one to the guy downtown, and bring the other four to me. Such coded messages were second nature to a kid from the patch like Chuck. Anybody who'd grown up on the streets knew that all the gang members talked that way. It wasn't so much that they were paranoid about phone conversations. Often they talked in riddles face to face. If you didn't belong, you didn't understand. There were rules, too. You never mentioned a guy's real name. Instead, you said, that guy out west, or used a nickname. Tony Ocardos was J.B., Murray Humphreys was Curly, or the Camel. Mooney's was everything from Mo to the Cigar and the Hoop, identifying him as the syndicate's big wheel. Every place or thing of any importance at all had some sort of code name. Amused by his young wife's naivete, Chuck would repeat it all to her. She had no idea what it meant. Loaves are money, babe, he teased. Short ones are light, you know, less. Long ones are nice and fat, stacks of cash. 
The fat boy is Fat Leonard, and he'll have it all divided out for me when I get there. So now all I have to do is deliver. He'd pick up a few C notes from Mooney when he made the delivery, and it kept them going. But it was penny ante stuff. Chuck lay awake nights, thinking about how he could possibly provide all the things he wanted for his family. Mooney seemed unconcerned, as if he thought Chuck had a gold mine stashed away somewhere. But the truth was Chuck had no idea what the hell to do. All he knew was the street, the syndicate, Mooney's world. He hated himself for being so dependent on Mooney. It made him just like any other common greaseball soldier. When Chuck learned they were expecting their first child in the spring, he nearly panicked. His life had become tedious, no longer filled with nightly soirees and ritzy clubs, and when Christmas rolled around, it nearly killed him to tell Anne-Marie that they would have to tighten their belts. From Chuck's perspective, the gin rummy parties at Angie's that meant their acceptance into the inner circle were a two-edged sword. The women Anne-Marie now associated with sported full-length furs and five-carat diamonds. His little babe probably had expected she'd have the same, which made their financial situation all the more demoralizing. Anne-Marie, too, saw her relationship with the inner circle of outfit wives as a mixed blessing. She was young enough to be any of their daughters. Her aunts regularly played cards with Ange, which meant she always had to demonstrate respect for their stature and experience. Because of that, she knew she would never be accepted as one of the girls. And she couldn't turn to the younger Bonnie and Annette for friendship. It had become clear shortly after her marriage to Chuck that Mooney's daughters would always think of her as the family servant of their childhood. They would always hold her in disdain. Interestingly, the other John Connor women were not a part of Ange's exclusive club. Ange was polite, but avoided socializing with Josie, Mary, Vicky, Antoinette, and Pepe's wife, Marie. Accordingly, Anne-Marie had felt an initial surge of pride at being singled out by Ange. However, pride soon turned to nagging guilt whenever she found herself faced with Chuck's sisters. Ange had placed a wall between them that would always serve to separate. Ironically, even as Anne-Marie recognized that her relationship with Ange was the alienating factor in her relationship with Chuck's sisters, she realized that Ange regularly condescended to her. The condescension made its presence felt in typical female fashion, in a haughty downward glance at Anne-Marie's less expensive dress, in a tiny sniff of amusement at Anne-Marie's youthful faux pas, in the slightly raised eyebrow women used to demonstrate their superiority. Chuck and Anne-Marie were staggeringly well-off compared with other American couples in 1949. Still, they both knew that what they had was paltry, next to the luxuries enjoyed by other gang members and their wives. As the holidays drew near, Chuck's heart sank as he listened to Anne-Marie recount stories of her shopping trips with Ange, how Ange was having this dress or that coat specially designed by Georgiana Jordan, Chicago's reigning fashion maven. He saw her youthful desire for life's finer things kindled, and he couldn't falter for thinking she should have the same. After all, he was Mooney's brother. The clock was ticking on his life. He forgot the illusion of ever equaling Mooney's stature in the syndicate. Now he only wanted to bask in it, share in the opportunity his brother's contacts provided. I think I'll go into business for myself, he told Anne-Marie. Maybe Mooney can open a few doors, Maybe I'll build some six-flat apartments. It was his secret dream to be a builder and run his own show. Anne could tell he was discouraged. Well, then ask Mooney. He'll help. Your chance will come, Chuck, I'm sure of it, she'd say cheerfully, still exuberant with the possibilities the future held. Determined to change his situation, he paid his brother a visit. Mooney's house was adorned in all its finery for Christmas, a lush, elegantly decorated tree twinkled invitingly in the living room. Wreaths of fresh-scented pine sprinkled with sprigs of mistletoe and holly graced the doorways. Mooney greeted him. He was in an unusually festive mood and led him down to the basement, glass of eggnog in hand. So how's it going? Theater job doing all right? he asked as he sat down behind his desk. Well, Chuck began almost haltingly. That's why I came over. I'd like to take a shot at starting my own business, go into construction, build a few apartments, some stores, something like that, he smiled. Besides, you always said I did a hell of a job remodeling this house. Yeah, I did say that. 
You know how to get a job done right. No question about that. Moody gazed past him in momentary thought. I think you're onto something. It's a damn good idea for you to be in business. He rose from his chair. I'll keep my eyes and ears open. If something comes up, he rounded the desk and put his arm around Chuck, now standing. I'll let you know. For now, keep up the good work at the theater. Within moments, Chuck found himself driving back home. He didn't know what he'd expected, but keep up the good work wasn't it. Mooney obviously wanted him right where he was for now, and had no intention of making a change. If he struck out on his own, without his brother's permission, he was afraid it would be all over between them. He'd be on his own, all right, totally on his own. He guessed nobody in the family or the gang had ever done that. If one of the guys had, he was now safely buried out in the county. As Mooney's brother, it was unthinkable. It would be a sign of blatant disrespect. But now the thought fleetingly crossed his mind. He pushed it away. Being Mooney's brother gave him an added responsibility. Maybe it was an honor. But whatever it was, it left him with no choice other than to bide his time. During the winter of 1950, Chuck tried to be patient. He made a point of dropping by to see Mooney two and three times a week. Occasionally he made some extra money making deliveries for him. And he stopped by the syndicate bars for a drink every day, knowing it was important to stay on the grapevine. Besides, he didn't know where else to go, or what else to do. His world revolved around Mooney. In February, while Chuck was wasting away at the Cosmo Theater in a darkened booth, the world continued to turn. People were talking about a commie-chasing senator named McCarthy, who had put together a list of subversives. Chuck almost gleefully announced to Mooney one day, Well, I bet McCarthy's a guy who can't be bought. Mooney snorted and replied, he sure as hell can be used, though. Used? Chuck was incredulous. How can a hard-ass like McCarthy be used by anybody but commie haters? Chuck, nothing's ever what it seems. Chiang Kai-shek, he's mob. Chinese mob. Goes back to General MacArthur. See, these guys up top know that, in the name of patriotism, Americans will do anything, go anywhere. They just gotta have an enemy. Shit, the guys up top will make one up if they have to. So now the enemy is communism. This McCarthy guy gets people riled up while our country's secret agents stir up a supposed commie threat. People read about it in the newspapers, and boom! They'll back a war 100%. Murray Humphreys tells me things you wouldn't believe. Mooney was adamant. Chuck, don't be a fucking patsy. The politicians know what's going on, mostly because half of them have some investment, just like we do, in countries with names you've never even heard of. You watch. This commie crap will get people up in arms. If anything threatens business as usual over there, well, our great and powerful president will do something about it. All he's got to do is yell commie, and every red-blooded American will lay down their lives. And for what? So a few fat cop politicians and businessmen, and a few guys like me, can make a killing. We all have too big an investment to let some rum-dumb slant-eyed bastard overthrow the government and screw it up. And it's gotten to the point that if the guy is already in power, and we want him out, we'll take care of him one way or another. There's too big an investment. What kind of investment? Chuck had lost his initial bravado and was now captivated by Mooney's story. Well, it isn't fucking steel mills, I'll tell you that. For some investors, it's the cheap... He hesitated. Well, I call it slave labor. For other guys, it's real estate. He opened his desk drawer. See this? Chuck nodded. It was the most beautiful square-cut emerald pinky ring he'd ever seen. The stone was huge. Twenty-two carats. This could buy a house. Forty G's. Jesus Christ, Chuck whistled. Forty thousand dollars. Now, this is what I call a fucking present. A real beauty. And you know who gave it to me? No. King Farouk, that's who. I'm working with him. Chuck, all these foreign bastards that are our fucking U.S. allies, all they care about is lying in their own pockets. They get paid off, and they make sure things stay nice and quiet. All over the world it's like that. What about communism? They gotta care about that. I mean, about their people, right? Mooney broke out laughing. You're reading too many newspapers, he taunted. That's what you're supposed to think. Nobody in the syndicate or the government cares what the guy in charge really believes or how oppressed the people there are. 
Nobody cares about whether or not the people are living in some democracy. The bottom line is money and power, just like it is here in this country. Chuck shook his head. Hey, this is business, Chuck. With Farouk, it's business. There's oil in the Middle East. I got a piece myself. There are gambling opportunities in Iran, in Beirut. We keep Farouk happy, and he'll make sure his friends around the desert do the same. Remember the guy I told you about with cigarettes in the Philippines? Well, he's got a string of contacts lined up for all kinds of shit. Opium, for one. New York is probably going to go in on it. Hell, they got more dope using shines up there than we do in Chicago. Opium? I thought all the guys were against narcotics. In our neighborhood, sure. But shines want it, and somebody's got to supply it. So it might as well be us. But that's nothing. There's shit they do over in Asia that would make your hair stand on end. Our guy in the Philippines was telling me that in Manila, a dollar buys you a blowjob from a two-year-old. Christ almighty, there are even babies you can screw. Can you believe it? Orientals are fucking animals. Shit, you can buy a girl there and do anything you want with her. Kill her if you want. Nobody cares in those fucking hell holes. Life is cheap. And where life is cheap, politicians are cheap. The image of Cuba flashed through Chuck's mind. It sounds worse than Cuba. Cuba? Mooney cackled. Things are straight down there. Cuba is heaven compared to some of these other places. You got people eating raw monkey brains and drinking snake blood in Asia. They screw dogs and babies over there. They got a mob mostly out of Japan, the Yakuza, that are some of the meanest motherfuckers I've ever seen. They'll do anything for a buck, and they control the governments. Mooney sighed. He was obviously tiring of the conversation, but he brightened suddenly and decided to continue. We've got some pretty high hopes for those slant-eyed bastards. If the governments there play ball with our government, and why shouldn't they, then we're in. From that point forward, Chuck noticed when Mooney went out of town to Europe or the Middle East. Over the coming years, his sojourns would become more frequent and, Mooney would boast, more profitable than he'd ever dreamed. The spring and summer of 1950 would prove eventful for Chuck and Anne-Marie, as well as the rest of the world. In April, Chuck's first son was born. They named the frail four-pound premature infant Charles Joseph. In May, a government committee was formed by a Tennessee upstart senator named Kefauver to investigate organized crime. But Mooney insisted that no matter what the rest of America believed, the guy was still crooked. And sure enough, a little over a year later, it turned out the senator had accepted campaign contributions from a numbers racketeer back in his own hometown. That same May, when the Secretary of State announced the United States would back the French in Indochina, Mooney gloated, and Chuck was hardly surprised. When President Truman announced in June that the United States would provide military aid to assist South Korea in their bid for democracy to defeat North Korean communists, Mooney commented matter-of-factly, the guy running the show in South Korea is part of the Oriental mob. Thus, Chuck wasn't amazed when Truman placed the nation's most esteemed military hero, General MacArthur, in charge of the whole mess, and it was reported that MacArthur was conferring with Mooney's Chinese mobster associate, Chiang Kai-shek. Instead, Chuck started to believe Mooney knew what he was talking about. But the war in Southeast Asia was eclipsed in Chuck's world by the Kefauver hearings that fall. No matter where he went, the guys were talking about them. And somewhere about this time, they all stopped calling the syndicate the syndicate and started calling it the outfit. It had a nice ring to it. Mooney told him that Meyer Lansky had suggested everybody give their organization a name, that it would improve cooperation and boost morale. The National Alliance was called the Combination, or Commission. In New York, it was the Mob. In Chicago, the Outfit. New Orleans liked the sound of the Combine, or the Mafia. No wonder Kefauver was so damned confused. Chuck laughed to himself as he watched the hearings on their new RCA television each night before going to work at the theater. The Kefauver hearings were no laughing matter to New York's mobsters. Labeled the Prime Minister of Organized Crime, Mooney's friend Frank Costello was particularly displeased. His lifestyle, filled with prominent businessmen and political leaders, was laid bare before the American public. And although he gave the committee members no information, the publicity provided his enemies with an opening. The scheming Vito Genovese had especially coveted Luciano's power, and while Costello's hands fidgeted on camera during his testimony, the world and Vito Genovese watched. The word in New York was direct and to the point, 
Costello's term as boss would soon be over. Like Costello, Mooney had his share of headaches in 1951. In March, the IRS started nosing around, questioning his income. Additionally, he was indicted on 67 counts of gambling. Shortly thereafter, he had a run-in with his old nemesis, Teddy Rowe, who continued running his wheels on the south side in spite of Mooney's constant threats. Meanwhile, rumors began to fly about his love life. People said he'd gotten a secretary at the envelope factory pregnant, which did nothing to help temper Angie's simmering jealousies. But through it all, Mooney remained undaunted. He never faced trial on the indictments, was never served with so much as a subpoena. He explained that twist of fate thus. I may not be able to control a jig policy king, yet, but I have most of the cops and politicians around the country in my pocket. He also managed to prove in May of 1951 that he had a number of big-name celebrities in his pocket as well, with an event called Night of Stars. This extravaganza was sponsored by the Italian Welfare Council, one of Ange and Mooney's only real charities, and was an effort to raise money for poor Italian children. Years later, Chuck would hear people claim that Night of Stars had been Ange's brainchild, that she'd manipulated Mooney using her feminine guile into participating, and that she'd personally worked long hours promoting the event. On the contrary, Night of Stars hadn't been Ange's idea, nor did she exert herself promoting the community charity. Not because she was ill or frail, as she was so often portrayed, but because as Mooney's wife she was above all that. Indeed, Mooney had been more than willing, without his wife's prodding, to provide the underworld leverage necessary to assure the success of Night of Stars. Whether it was a charity or a union outfit guys wished to promote, they always used the same tactics, muscle and men. And in this case, Mooney put his men to work promoting Night of Stars, directing them to encourage customers to purchase tickets to the event. As Chuck quickly found out, if a guy didn't manage to unload his share of tickets, well, he was stuck buying them all himself, which was good incentive to turn to muscling other guys into taking them off your hands. Chuck would never be able to say whether all the effort had paid off for the poor children of the Italian neighborhood. He never saw the final tally for Night of Stars. But three years later, Mooney would confide he'd grown tired of carrying the neighborhood, growling, Hey, why the hell should my men pick up the tab and buy all the goddamn tickets? If the Italians in the neighborhood don't give a damn about their own people, then fuck them. Mooney stopped supporting the event after that, and that was the end of Night of Stars. Each spring, Chuck couldn't help missing the lineup of celebrities his brother always managed to assemble, entertainers such as Bob Hope, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, Jimmy Durante, and Frank Sinatra. Such a public demonstration of his brother's power made Chuck proud to be a John Connor, which was the real reason why, he guessed, he'd always miss Night of Stars. Like his role model, Mooney, Chuck spent more time away from home than not. He insisted that dinner be served at 5.30 each night, and after eating one of Anne Marie's painstakingly prepared dinners, he either made his way to the Cosmos Theater for work or dropped by an outfit bar to talk to the guys. Late one night in June, he was shooting the breeze with Needles and Fat Leonard, and they started reminiscing about the good old days at the Boogie Woogie. Man, oh man, the shine broads in there were class, real class, Leonard remarked. And what about the music? added Needles. That joint was really hopping. I never seen so many hot colored packed together. Hey, remember when Mooney and Teddy Rowe ran into each other? Leonard said. Boy, was that shine burned up. He began to snicker. He could have killed Mooney for sure. I bet he would still now if he could, Chuck remarked. Yeah, well, the guy's number's up. I can promise you that. Mooney's had it with a little fuck. He'll be gone with the wind, Leonard said, chuckling. Needles laughed. Hey, I like that one. Gone with the wind, just like the movie. Send Roe back to a plantation somewhere and let him fertilize some fucking cotton. Or back to hell, where the nigger bastard came from to begin with, Leonard added, picking up his drink in a gesture of mock toast. Here's to Teddy Roe. May the sorry motherfucker soon rest in peace. Leonard shot a look at Needles, who couldn't contain a smirk. About that time, Milwaukee Phil walked in with Chucky Nicoletti. They pulled up chairs and ordered drinks. Hey, where's Mad Dog? I thought he was coming over, Needles said. They groaned collectively. He'll be here. He stopped who the fuck knows where. But if he said he was dropping by, he'll be here, Phil said, taking a sip of his drink. So I hear Teddy Rose's ship has come in, he added, 
and raised one eyebrow. The group began laughing. Yeah, that's what we were just talking about. That's one shine Mooney's gonna give a one-way ticket, Needles said. Hey, life shit, Leonard said, and then burst out laughing. They all joined in, and Chuck noticed Mad Dog come in the door. The guy was a lunatic. They didn't call him Mad Dog for nothing. Mad Dog De Stefano was crazy, totally nuts. He'd be in a rage one minute, and the next, laughing like a loony. He usually wore pajamas, fly open, wherever he went, and looked as if he'd just crawled out of bed. He got off on killing. It was almost funny the way everybody gave Mad Dog wide berth. Cold-blooded killers didn't want to cross him. Chuck always tried to avoid him. De Stefano spotted their table and made his way along the bar. He sat down and, amid roars of laughter, immediately launched into a graphic description of his latest torture technique. He loved ice picks, but he loved to talk about them more. Chuck scanned the faces of the men seated alongside him. There wasn't a man sitting at the table who hadn't taken a guy out, except him. And with the exception of De Stefano, they were really nice guys. They didn't act like people might think killers would act. They acted like normal guys. The wives would never have guessed that any one of them could slit a man's throat without blinking an eye. But they'd all done that and a lot worse, all for Mooney. Which made it okay, Chuck guessed. Whether it was gambling, burglary, or murder, it was all the same. Everybody had a job to do in the organization, and they did it for Mooney. Although sometimes he wondered whether Mooney was just an excuse, like fear. How many times had he heard somebody say they were afraid of Mooney, afraid they would be killed if they didn't do exactly what Mooney wanted, from buying the right model car to making an appearance at a family wedding? To hear people associated with the outfit talk, they were always afraid. But looking around the table now, he didn't think any of the guys looked afraid of anything. Actually, they all looked as if they thought they had it made. The question of whether something was right or wrong never entered a guy's mind. That question got buried early on. And out of a desire to get ahead, it stayed buried. Should it surface by some strange chance, it was fear that pushed it down again into the backwaters of the guy's conscience. Chuck tried not to think about those kinds of things, never discussed them with anybody, not even Anne-Marie, most of all not with her. But sometimes he thought the honest-to-God truth was that it was all just an excuse. It wasn't because of Mooney or fear that he and the rest of the guys worked for the outfit. Anybody who worked for the outfit did it because they liked the money. It didn't matter whether it was stolen. It didn't matter whether a guy had to kill for the privilege of being in the outfit. What did matter was that you had 500 a week when other saps had 50, and you were respected, treated as if you were special. People knew your name. You got the best seat in a restaurant, the best cut at the butcher's. He and the rest of the guys who worked for the outfit might tell themselves they did it for Mooney or that they didn't have a choice, but that was all just bullshit. You did it for yourself. Later, Chuck would chide himself for not realizing what Fat Leonard and Needles had been getting at with all the talk about Teddy Rowe. But that night, he didn't take it too seriously. He always knew Mooney would go after the guy sooner or later, which made Chuck no different from any other person familiar with the law of the street. He just didn't know how soon. Truth or damage to the victory.